The Garden of the Holy Spirit, St. Yakovos of Evia, published by Orthodox Witness, 2018. My heart feels like a garden, St. Yakovos. Introduction. On Sunday, November 15th, 2015, at the conclusion of the memorial service for Elder Yakovos, 24 years after his repose, standing in front of his tomb at the Monastery of St. David, Metropolitan Chrysostomos of Halki made an announcement that expressed the conscience of the local church. He had submitted to the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece a request that the name of Elder Yakovos be added among the saints. It was unanimously approved by the Holy Synod of Greece and forwarded, according to canonical order, to the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Two years later, on November 27, 2017, what was in the hearts and minds of the Orthodox faithful everywhere was finally made official. He was declared a saint. Those who knew the elder personally and those who came to know him rejoiced at the announcement. He is now recognized along other holy persons revealed to us in these last times, including elders Paisios and Porfirios, now standing before the triune God, we ask St. Yaakovos to intercede for us that he may strengthen the faith of his elect. The blessed elders' gifts of clairvoyance and healing were well known before his repose. He continues to work miraculous healings and makes appearances, attesting to his continuous presence among us. From the miracles recorded since his repose, we include three of them here as an introduction to his life story. You must try to find a good confessor. A young man narrates how Elder Yakovos appeared to him and three of his peers, who had stopped at the monastery of St. John the Russian. As they had reached the entrance of the church, an elder approached them and very politely asked them if they would like to listen to him. So all four of them gathered around him and he talked to them for a while. After they left, they discussed how he didn't try to steer them to the church or to live a good life or anything like the things young people usually hear. His only subject was confession. He wanted to teach them how they should go to confession, to whom and to what kind of person, and that confession is something beautiful and helps you to cleanse your soul. The young man said that he wanted to breathe the Yerondas' breath. He enjoyed that feeling. Also, at some point, he felt somewhat uneasy and held his hands uncomfortably. The elder held his hands as if he had understood how he felt and he wanted him to feel better. On their way back from their outing, having a good time, going swimming, eating out and so forth, the narrator at some point, he felt uncomfortable. So they stopped at a village before Halkida to get something like a Tylenol. He was headed for the kiosk, but one of the girls, Peneyota, told him to go to a pharmacy. So they both walked into a pharmacy and told the lady what he wanted. He then noticed a book on the counter. On the cover, it said Father Yakovos with his picture. He told the girl who was with him that he was the elder who talked to them in the morning. She agreed that he was the elder. The pharmacist, Miss Fotini, told us who he was and showed us many other pictures of him that she had. I told her, yes, it was him. Both I and Peneyoti agreed. Well, the pharmacist was in shock. She told us that the elder had fallen asleep, had died years ago. We too were in shock. We also called the guys who stayed behind in the car. We got in touch with the Holy Monastery and figured that it was just us who had experienced this event and that no one else around us had. We were all impressed because of his love and how he wanted to lead us all to confession. Nothing else. In particular, I remember him telling us, quote, Just as you try to find a good doctor when you have a problem, so you must try to find a good confessor to tell him what's in your mind, what problems you have, what you would like to confide to a person that you trust. End quote. The prayer rope is for you. Mr. Giorgio Anidis, a physician from Volos, Greece, personal doctor of the Archbishop Christodoulos, mentioned, among other things, the following. As I was leaving the monastery of Osios David, where I went with my family on a pilgrimage on September of 1997, and while I was at the gate, 
I felt a strong desire to go back to the grave of Elder Yakovos. I felt as feels someone who forgot something behind that's precious and wants to go back and get it. I actually went back with my son. One meter before the tomb of the elder, I saw a prayer rope on the ground. I picked it up and held it high in my hand so that if any of the pilgrims around had lost, lost it, they could see it and come and get it. But at precisely that moment, I hear a voice from behind me say, What are you looking for? The prayer rope is for you. I turned around and at a distance of just a meter away, I see Elder Yakovos, vividly alive and smiling at me. I saw him clearly. I saw distinctly the dampness of his eyes, the tiny veins of his face, of his beard as he used to have it. I felt something special. I was shook up. This literally live presence of Elder Yakovos in front of me was decisive and put me in the seal about the certainty of the divine presence. You will get well and you will return home. At the time I was writing these lines, namely on October 10th, 2001, Mr. Yonulis, a sailor from Andros, came to the monastery, tears in his eyes and almost unable to speak from emotion. He relayed to me the following. Sometime back I was traveling in India and one day I had a serious problem with my heart. I was taken to a hospital and the doctors told my fellow sailors that my life was over. Even though I was comatose, I felt that some invisible divine power was helping me. When I opened my eyes sometime later, the first thing I saw in front of me was Elder Yakovos, who I knew about from reading a book about him several times. He said to me, Do not be afraid, Mr. Gianulis. I will help you. You will get well and you will return home. From that moment, I became perfectly well. From the existing oral and written testimonies of the faithful, it is evident that Elder Yaakovos has great boldness before God. Therefore, we pray to him to intercede to God, the giver of every good thing for the health of us all. We close this introduction to this edition by asking the omnipotent Lord to repose the soul of the author, the pious Professor Stylianos G. Papadopoulos, Orthodox Patrologist who rested in the Lord on January 15th of 2012. May his memory be eternal. Signed Orthodox Witness Publishers, November 21st, 2017. From the author. Dear reader, the lines that follow belong to you and me. They come out of deep reverence, gratitude, and love for the blessed elder Yaakovos Salikis, abbot of the holy monastery of St. David, the elder in Evia, Greece. He passed away while performing the sacrament of confession on November 21st, 1991, completing that month 71 years of life. These lines belong to all of us because I did not just write what I thought or what I liked but rather I wrote down the words we all heard from his holy mouth, the deeds we observed in his saintly life, and the miracles we saw him working through prayer. Moreover, these lines belong to all of us because they are the feelings of us all that I have put down on paper. Some of the things I know about the Blessed Elder I learned directly from him. Whenever he spoke to me in private in the sanctuary of the monastery church, Whenever he mentioned something from his life in front of many pilgrims or related a miracle of St. David, I listened attentively. My knowledge of many other things comes from a number of people who knew Blessed Elder Yakovos in the years of his youth and throughout his monastic life. These people are neither few, nor do they know little about the Elder. This present work concerning a contemporary man, an ascetic of great standards, a God-seer, here a monk, gifted with many virtues, and a worker of innumerable miracles, entailed many dangers which we tried to tackle with a researcher's conscience and experience. Primarily exaggeration and the tendency to praise had to be avoided. We took so much care for the latter that in order to prevent any suspicion, we left out many divine and wondrous signs from the elder's life. The things we caught with our feeble antenna 
and put down with our modest capabilities are but a sample. Nevertheless, we think that they reveal, however deficiently, the kind of person Elder Yaakovos has been before God, the saints, himself, and the people. It is only fitting to repeat here what the elder himself used to say about St. David. The miracles of the saint are innumerable. Many books have to be written. There's neither enough paper nor enough ink. Signed, Stylianos Papadopoulos. Part 1. The Early Years the town of Levisi was built by the Greek forefathers on the western branch of Mount Antikragos near the ancient Greek city in Lycia, Asia Minor. This branch terminates on the western coast of Asia Minor opposite the island of Rhodes. One had to climb up the mountain from the coast to see the small town of Levisi below, spread over two hillsides. The town did not face toward the sea, it faced mainly eastward, but also toward the south and the north. It was 1921, end of spring, beginning of summer. A Levisian apprentice boy was approaching from the northeast, running with his shoes in hand. He went up the long, neat cobblestone street leading to the church of the archangels and the marketplace. Everyone who saw him running knew immediately that he was bringing bad news. The boy stopped at the marketplace with its various shops. He couldn't make it to the church. He fell on a stone bench and whispered, they were taken, many guilds, many Levisians. A crowd of shop owners and passerby quickly gathered round. It was a pleasant summer evening, and people were out and about around the shops. The first to learn the news were those who had relatives in the guilds. The guilds were small groups of builders, tinkers, shoemakers, and other craftsmen who worked in and around the Turkish villages and towns. Sometimes they worked in the town of Makri, the vice-governor's seat in the province of Mugla, and sometimes in the distant parts of the prefectures of Adendion and Smyrna. Evlogison, the pronunciations of the Greek terms are difficult to continue. Many Levisian craftsmen reached as far as Iconium, Iregli, Nigris, Caesarea, Sebastian, even further up to Pontus. They were good craftsmen, were well paid. Their village, built as it was upon the rocks, offered no land for them to cultivate. The few good fields in the valley were owned mostly by Turks. The small family enterprises could not provide a living for everyone, so they became craftsmen. And in small groups of two, three, or more men, they traveled all over present-day Turkey. Most of them left sometime between March and April and returned in November or December, only to spend three to four months of the year with their families. The Levisian apprentice recovered. After catching his breath, he told them everything he knew. The elders also arrived. They took the boy to the archangel's church and rang the bell. A large crowd gathered. Of the five or six thousand souls living in Levisi, all of them were Greek, not even one Turkish resident. Mrs. Despina Kremiras, Blessed Elder Yakovos's grandmother, lived close to the shops. As soon as she heard the commotion, she was startled and ran outside. She quickly went up the street and fell on her knees in front of the apprentice boy. She was among the first to question him. Yorgos, Kremidas, my dear, my husband, Yorgos. Her heart was pounding. She couldn't go on. She wanted to say, have you seen him? Did they catch him? Have you heard anything about Yorgos? Krimadas. Unfortunately, the apprentice boy had both seen and heard. Yes, Yorgos had also been taken. Mrs. Despina was drowning in sorrow. There were a thousand people around her, mostly women, but she did not see anyone. She wailed and lamented as though she were all alone. She went into the church and fell on her knees before the icon of the archangel Michael. She entreated, complained, asked for strength, appointed him protector over her grown-up daughters and two little boys, and went back home. The world turned black for her. Picturesque, Levisi, with its spectacular views of the mountains in the valley, its two large imposing churches, 
one dedicated to the holy archangels and the other to the, the most holy mother of God, its spotlessly clean cobblestone streets and its numerous little chapels scattered here and there, everything turned dark. She came home terribly upset and fell into deep lament. Her daughters went out to meet her on the street. From the upper house, Theodora, her only married daughter and blessed elder Jacobus' mother, also went out. She was holding in her arms her second surviving baby, Jacobus, and was shaking all over. She rushed to embrace her mother and cried with her without being able to ask whether she had heard anything about Stavros. Stavros, her husband, had also gone with the guilds. He and his two apprentices worked as tinkers and builders in the Turkish villagers. When her mother saw the baby, she came around and consoled her daughter. No, they had not heard anything about those working afar. They rounded up Greeks, mainly working in the coastal region. Yorgos Krimadas was one of them. Theodora gave the baby to her older sister and hurried to the marketplace and to the church. Perhaps she could find out something more. All the elders, the priests of the three parishes, the teachers, as well as the lady teacher of the girls' school, were now gathered in the church's courtyard. In a great flurry, everyone tried to gather information and calm each other down. In the great church of the archangels, the upper church, they had already started the supplicatory canon to the Theotokos, women mostly, as the majority of men were away. They were walking in and out, lighting candles, kneeling, and entreating the saints on the glowing marble iconostasis. Sometime later, they found the Mutir, the only Turk of the village who was, so to say, the police authority, a representative of the Turkish vice-governor in Makri. He did not know specifically who had been arrested by the Turkish authorities. He did know for many days and confessed that the army were gradually rounding up Greeks for the labor squads, beginning from the coast. Everyone had heard terrible things about the labor squads. They all knew more or less about the concentrations, displacements, and exiles that had been taking place from 1915 to 1920. The Turkish militia were rounding up the men and putting them to hard labor, mines, quarries, railroads, and so on. They forced them to work many hours and beat them relentlessly, offering them little and dirty food and forcing them to sleep outside in the cold or in shacks and huts without heating, of course. After all, the goal of the labor squads was twofold, to obtain a free workforce and to slowly exterminate the Greek population without provoking the European powers. After the Armenian genocide in 1915, when several Europeans protested and accused the Turks internationally, they initiated a different tactic to achieve their goal, gradual extermination. Indeed, of those in the labor squads, only a few Greeks came back. The majority got lost in the depths of Turkey, always away from areas with Greek population. Only those who were able to escape made it back, along with the few who managed to bribe the guards and officers. Others who survived the hardships of hunger, cold, and tortures, and were fortunate to be spotted by the Red Cross and the International Committee, were protected and sent over to Greece. Theodora was left with the impression that her husband was rather well, though no one could be certain in those days about anything. The young Turks held all Asia Minor in turmoil. General Mustafa Kemal, later dubbed the father of Turkey, plied Central and Eastern Turkey. He occasionally appeared with an army on the western coast, but his main and fiercest fight was against the Greeks of Pontus, who had been seeking some autonomy and had organized small groups of armed rebels. Upon returning home, Theodora found many neighbors consoling her mother and her sisters. Everyone lamented that the good man Kramidas as if he were dead. The same was happening in every home where it was certain that one of their men had been arrested. The priests, the elders, the teachers tried to give some courage to the Visian women, but despondency was taking hold of them. They had also demanded autonomy like Smyrna. 
The Italians betrayed them, and the Turks arrested those who signed the autonomy paper and knocked them off. There was no sign that the evil was going to stop, and Mustafa Kemal looked like a black cloud over the heads of the Greeks. Would the storm break out upon them, or was it going to blow over somewhere else? The Greeks were kept in the dark. What a horrible thing not to be able to see a ray of light in your own country, in a land that has been your motherland for 3,000 years. In addition, the notorious Nuridin Pasa had thrown himself on the Greek communities. Brutal and bloodthirsty, he became the dread of the Greeks from Smyrna up to Makri and Levisi. The first day of lamentation passed. Mrs. Despina took some time to collect herself. She had to think how to proceed, how to find out details about her husband, and what to do with her still unmarried daughters, except for Theodora, who had been married young and was already death-stricken. Death had snatched six babies from her by 1922. Mrs. Despina had also two sons, Kiriakos and Vasilis, but they were still little and they needed protection. She thought of relatives on her husband's side. The closest ones were Costas, Kiriakos, Kramadas of Macri. They were rich men, benefactors of the Greek schools in Macri, known also to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Most of the relatives from her side of the family lived far away. Their family was large and had an important ecclesiastical lineage. Seven generations had offered priests to the church, both married priests and priest monks. Mrs. Desmina even had relatives in Jerusalem, the hero monks Elias and Demetrius. The latter, in particular, served in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with great de devotion. But now, who could help her and how? Times were rough. The Turks were angry. As for their basic needs, they had no problem, of course. The men left the house filled with provisions before they went off to their work. If things were to become more difficult later, her unmarried daughters could always find some work somewhere. The only thing that Mrs. Despina asked of friends and relatives was their intervention to find out about her husband and plead for the impossible, his release. In about a month, news arrived, though it would have been better if it hadn't. Her husband was dead. He just could not endure. The Turks, the report goes, had arrested many Greeks. They rounded them all up and headed towards Anatolia, into the depths of Turkey. The Greek captives were escorted by fierce riders, day after day marching on foot. They were only given some bread, and not even that every day. The sad procession grew shorter day by day. Hunger, fatigue, and the whip filled the paths of the, with the Greek bodies. Krimadas, they said, who was not quite a young man, suffered a lot. Weakened as he was, he was spotted by the escorts. They came up to his side and, without any warning, beat him relentlessly. The poor one could not stand on his feet, but what courage! If he happened to see a despondent Greek, he went up to his side and encouraged him with a smile, a kind word, some consolation. All the captives loved him. He even composed and recited short verses to make them forget their suffering. He had a kind and sweet face, and everyone knew him to be a pious man. He fasted regularly and took great care to love God and all people. He was so good, they added, that God had given him remarkable gifts. One time when he was working in the Turkish villages, where there is no church, on the day of Pentecost, at the time of the Vespers of Kneeling, he saw... As he prayed, the trees were also kneeling down. Moreover, a calf that tried to eat the tops of a tree was lifted high and fell back down, but was not harmed. Indeed, Grandpa Krimadas was a good and saintly person, but the whip and the hunger finished him off. They had been taken through the regions of Mugla and Sparta, Bordur, Adinion, and they passed off Iconium through Iregli and came to Nigdi. Before arriving there, however, the good Greek man, Yorgos, succumbed. 
When the wild men saw him exhausted, they tortured him even more. He fell down, he could not get up. They hit him more because, as they say, they were in a hurry to continue on with the march. It was there that his soul departed, the grandfather and at the same time godfather of Elder Yakovos. Grandpa Yorgis was also his grandson's godfather because he loved him very much. A few days later, Mrs. Despina received a personal note from her nephew. He was a doctor who had also been arrested and thrown into the same labor squad as his uncle Yorgos. He said that after the great evil had happened to his uncle, he only found five liras in his pockets, two of which he gave to some Turkish villagers for his burial. Who knows whether they buried him or threw him into a ditch as food for vultures. The nephew wrote to his aunt to say that he had been given these two liras and asked what he should do with the rest. Poor Mrs. Despina told him through a man who was going to that area to keep them for himself. That nephew also got lost in the same or similar manner. Stavros Stalikis from Rhodes Stavros Stalikis, the husband of Theodora, worked as a craftsman in the depths of Turkey. The simple Turks treated him well. He did good work for them, and they paid him what they had agreed. He had heard nothing about his father-in-law, Yorgos Krimidas, until November when he came back to Levisi. He had made some money and was bringing home foods and other items. He came to Makri and stopped by the house of the Krimidas brothers to take a break from the long trip. It was there he learned the news. It wrenched his heart. He did not know what to say or what to hope for anymore. If the powerful, notable Krimadides family were not able to rescue their man, what hope, he wondered, was there for the simple, weak folks? In fact, only a few months later, another member of the Krimadis family got lost in the same squads near Tarsus, a young man from Levisi, Vasili. Stavros did not stay long at the Krimadis house. He only had a demitasse of coffee, loaded the mules, and took off quickly could not stay put. His mind was troubled. His heart was set upon his dear Theodora. Dorula and Doritza, he had called her endearingly, and their two babies. They were his only concern. What fright, he thought, what distress his delicate Dorula must have gone through, and what a surprise it was going to be to see the baby walking, tiny Yakovaki. A smile began to form on his lips. As he walked uphill on northern Antikragos, his mind flew with a thousand wings and passed through time in one leap. He traveled back to his childhood, to the poor neighborhood where he was born in 1883, outside the walls of the old town of Rhodes. It was a difficult time for the beautiful island. Under Turkish rule, the Greek inhabitants suffered from poverty. His father, Yakovo Salikis, took him when he was about 15 or 17 years old and went across to Marmari on the coast of Asia Minor in search of better fortune. Many people who were well off in general lived on this blessed coast and could use the services of more craftsmen. Here they worked thoroughly and honestly to make some money so that when they returned to their beloved island, they could build a decent house and live a happy life. In the past, many members of the Salikis family went to work in Asia Minor from as early as 1756. In fact, the inhabitants of Rhodes have settled on the coast of Lycia since antiquity. Yakovos Saliki Sr. was a builder and tinker. He worked with his son Stavros as an assistant and everything went well. Greeks and Turks preferred them for their job. From the very start, they made Levisi their base. There in Levisi, young Stavros worked for some time as a builder in the house of Yorgos Kremiras. Yorgos Kremadas, who was the father of many daughters, thought of marrying Stavros with his oldest one. But the young man was taken by the youngest. Thanks, Master Yorgos, but I think only of Darula. But she's not of age yet, replied the father. I'll wait for her to grow up, insisted Stavros. 
In this gracious and uh, simplistic manner, Blessed Elder Yaakovos used to relate the story himself as his father related it to him. Everything turned out well. Stavros and Theodora became a couple with the blessing of the church. And with a big three-day-long marriage feast, not so long given the fact that in the old days, these feasts lasted for a week. Grimatis' house was nice and big, but through their work, Stavros and his father made it better. The young couple lived in the upper house, while the old parents lived in the lower with their other daughters and two boys. Stavros' wife, Dorula, was a very good and kind woman, brimming over with love and devotion. However, the figure of her mother, Mrs. Despina, dominated the entire household. Mrs. Despina was the one who was there to resolve the difficult and big issues affecting the family, not only because she was a mother of many daughters and the father was away for more than half the year, but also because of her composure, her determination, and most of all, because she consciously continued the long ecclesiastical tradition of her family. She had deep faith and was devoted to the church. Every so often she was found in church attending the services, lighting the oil lamps in the little chapels, making prostrations, and teaching the children how to pray. In addition, she gave encouragement to everyone and showed them how to get over their afflictions. She was also the first to show up for work, always and everywhere in the forefront. Nothing could be done without Grandma Despina. All of these thoughts passed through Stavros's mind, and it pierced his heart. Nearing the top of Mount Antinkragos, the renowned Pirnari, he turned right and looked westward over the rocky mountainside toward Lavisi. For the first time, it didn't look beautiful to him. Though not horrible either, his mind was clouded. He could not discern what tomorrow would bring for Lavisi. Everything had been messed up. While it was more or less clear that everything, or at least many things, were about to change in the Greek Asia Minor, the Greeks who had been well-rooted there did not want to believe it. The final terrible destructive earth-shaking event had to come in 1922 for them to see things as they really are. Even then, they could not make the decision to leave their pre-eternal land, their sacred home. The latest events had deadened their hearts. No longer did they dream as in the past. Stavros Stalikis also stopped dreaming about his children, about their becoming teachers, priests, or perhaps even higher. His mother-in-law spoke time and again about the hero monks of her family. May God grant it, my good Stavros, for one of your children to become a priest, that he may read prayers for our children, give communion to the others, give us Andideron from his own hand. Stavros desired the same. He worked all the more to make money so that he could provide for his children, but also so that he and Theodora might have enough for difficult times, such as those in the past when they lost several babies and the twins a few months after their birth. They had spent a lot of money but still lost the children. Thinking about this and that, he finally arrived. He did not stop anywhere, not even at Skiftos' coffee house. As soon as the village children saw him, they ran to bring the good news to Mrs. Despina and to his wife, Theodora. The latter came out on the nearest cobblestone street and fell into his arms. He took her by the hand went up the street a short distance, and entered the darkened house. They all cried and tried to support each other with a consoling word. Stavros went to the upper house, which was his wife's dowry, together with a store among the shops, and took the infants in his arms. He could not have enough of playing with them. His first child, Yorgaki, was three years old. The other one, his Yakovaki had just been born the previous year. On November 5th, 1920, he was baptized with his grandfather, Yorgos Krimadas, as the godfather and was given the name of, of his paternal grandfather, Yakovos Salikis, from Rhodes. In captivity, the Greek-Turkish affairs went from bad to worse. Mustafa Kemal, after finding rest from the guerrilla war with the Greeks in Pontus, threw his army to the west of Asia Minor, in places 
where there was Greek army, that is, in Smyrna and vicinity, the Greeks did live in safety. Everywhere else, however, the situation became hopeless. The Chets, with the permission and instigation of Kamal and Nuruddin Pasha, fell upon the Greek villages like ravenous wolves, killing, robbing, and terrorizing. Even before the final destruction in 1922, entire villages and towns like Edinion had been wiped out by massive slaughters. In Levisi, things seemed more calm. Even though fear and anxiety for the future weighed heavy on their minds and petrified their hearts, the villagers continued to live and work. This was also the case with Stavros Salikis. He now worked more than before without having the support from his father-in-law. The kids were growing up, seeing the women constantly in tears. Every afternoon, the grandmother took the censer down from the edge of the fireplace to sense the house. They all crossed themselves, bowed their heads, and prayed. They also lit the oil lamps, all the candeles, and all the little churches, mainly the unmarried sisters of Theodora. Theodora visited the church of the archangels often, holding one child in her arm and the other by the hand, entreating Archangel Michael to protect her husband, Stavros, who was away working in the Turkish villages. But the evil did not take long to arrive. At the beginning of 1922, the Turks arrested Stavros as well, a new misfortune that renewed the daily lamentation of the women in the family. It was winter, and the large group of captive Greeks were forced to march along a snowy road by Turkish guards, heading north through Cappadocia. Anyone who could not endure the march received the last lashing and died on the snowy path. There was hardly a need for the guards to waste bullets. Other groups of Greek captives had previously passed down on the same road. Many times they saw arms and legs of dead Greek bodies jutting out of the snow. Stavros Stalikis, the blessed elder Yakovos' father, was in the squad that headed to the Caucasus. Before getting there, they put them to work in some mines. One day while Stavros was working, he heard three knocks in the tunnel. It seemed like a signal to him. He got out of the mine and the tunnel immediately collapsed. As St. Harlambos had saved him, he had a small icon of him suspended from his neck. They slept as Stavros later related to his son Yakovos in huts. To get warm, they dug one or two meters down into the snow in order to try and find a log or any piece of wood to make a fire with. One day as he was digging in the snow for wood, Stavros, he found a log that drew his attention. It looked suitable to him for making a paglama. His father had taught him how to play paglama, and he enjoyed playing folk couplets and other short songs. In the good old days in Levisi, he played almost every day for his wife, Drula, sometimes for the whole neighborhood as well. So he hewed it out, and after gathering some money, he had strings brought to him from the nearby town. Thus, in the midst of the wretched exile and the hard labor, he began to play some tunes in the evening so that the Greek captives might forget their suffering for just a little. Opposite the huts was the house of the officer who guarded the Greeks. Turkish women dancers who were there heard the music and asked the officer for music as well. The officer called for Stavros and had him play Turkish tunes at his house in the evenings instead of having him work in the dangerous mine. But this did not go on for long. An order arrived asking for the craftsmen from among the Greeks. Stavros was registered as a builder, so they took him and assigned him to the construction of a hospital in the area of Trabizond. They also gave him some money so that he would do the job well. Regarding news about his beloved Theodora and the children, however, he could not find out anything. The Uprooting On the Aegean coast in Western Asia Minor, 3,000-year-old Hellenism was being raised down. The Greek army withdrew irregularly on all fronts. The Turks burned, raped, killed, and plundered the properties of the defenseless Greeks. 
In August of 1922, the terrible destruction of Smyrna came. In the remaining places, the Greeks were dying from agony. In Levisi, only a few men were left. The women and children shut themselves in their houses early, terrorized from hearing the Turkish soldiers, for the first time ever in Levisian history, walking on the cobblestone streets. The Mutur, the only Turk living in Levisi, and the representative of the authorities, turned from a kindly and gourmet Turk into a tough and menacing one. One night at the end of September, he ordered the town criers to go around shouting, Everyone, get ready. In a few days you go. Where to, how, and by what means, no one knew. They were only allowed to carry a bundle of clothes in their arms. Moreover, the Turks spread the idea among the Christian Greeks that they did not need to take much with them, that they would supposedly soon return after the Greek-Turkish tensions had calmed. Many Greeks believed this, but the smarter ones knew very well that since the young Turks had prevailed, they would not let the Greeks or any other dynamic minority live in Asia Minor. The command for the uprooting resounded in Levisi like the galloping of death. Elders, priests, and teachers, as many men as were left, held several councils to find a way to protect the women and the children. It was futile. For the Greeks, the Turks had turned into thugs, plunderers, and rapists. It didn't matter whether the authorities gave their word or not, it continued. They broke their word the next hour or by the next day at the latest. In every home, the Levisian women lamented and sought consolation in front of their holy icons. All men from 12 to 65 years old had been exiled in squads deep within Turkey's hinterland for extermination. One morning, some riders came to poor Levisi from Makri, directing all of the women, children, and elderly to go to Makri before noon to the new pier at Cordoni. At first, the news made everyone very sorrowful. The women wept and lamented not only for their dead, but also for the living, even for themselves. Mrs. Despina gathered her daughters around her. She gave them her last instructions, what each one should take in her bundle, and so on. Of course, they were all to hide their money and jewelry in their clothes. Then each daughter was to bring out her dowry. Most girls of Levisi carried their expensive dowries to the church of the archangels. They left everything to Archangel Michael and trusted that he would do what he could. It was heart tendering to see the girls going up the road loaded with their dowries and depositing them inside the church. Following her daughters, Mrs. Despina went to the archangels with little Yakovaki in her arms. She wanted to leave something valuable, but she also wanted to light a last candle before Archangel Michael's icon and to pray. However, the poor woman was not able to do this from the anger at what she saw. There in the sanctuary was the Turkish Mutur, sitting on top of the holy altar. Mrs. Despina went closer and stared at him angrily. He told her with contempt and vengeance, your Christ used to sit here in the past. Now I sit here, as he continued smoking on top of the Holy Gospel book. The poor woman went out, not having the power even to cry. She could only utter a curse upon him in Turkish, which we do not know whether it came true or not. Returning by way of the main road, she saw that their store was closed. It had been given to Theodora as a dowry, and it had been run by someone else. Everyone was ready. They were weeping. They venerated their icons and kissed the outside of the house door. Mrs. Despina took aside their little dog and pointed to the lower shed. She had put 12 packs of dried figs there for the dogs to eat. They all slowly gathered at the church of the Theotokos, the second largest church in Levisi. With frightened eyes, shaking legs, darkened and hopeless hearts, the sad procession of about 2,000 women, children, and elderly began. They carried only a bundle in their arms and whatever their pockets could hold. Theodora carried mostly food, something for the children to eat at least, 
dried figs from their own fig tree, chickpeas, some sesame, as well as some strong wine in place of medicine. Little Yakovaki was 22 months old at that time, still carried about in the arms. His brother George was four years old and his sister Anastasia only 40 days old. They passed through the valley with its autumn melancholy and went up over northern Anticragos, then downhill to Macri. By evening, they were all at the new pier at Cordoni. The soldiers kept away the Turks who were threatened to lynch and rob the Greeks. They were rounded up very close to the sea, and it looked like they were going to be executed in mass. Somebody gave a signal, and immediately all the children began to cry and scream. The evil did not happen. The women and the children slept out in the countryside. In the morning, the great plundering took place. They were lined up, searched, and stripped of everything, not even leaving them a penny. They gathered a lot of money, gold, jewelry, English pounds. The poor women protested. Where could they go without money? To this thought, they told themselves, you made it here, you'll leave it here. Well, they stayed at Cordoni another day as no ship arrived. At some point on the third day, an American ship with 16 boats arrived. It was a cargo ship carrying leather. The first group of women and children went aboard. The poor woman asked for the sirens to sound sorrowfully. A heart-rendering lamentation began. Little Yakovaki snuggled in his mother's arms. His angelic little face was sad only because his mother was weeping. They tried to determine where to take them. The foreigners, they suggested France. The Levisian women preferred Greece. The ship passed by roads, then through the Cyclades. The sea was rough and the ship was in danger and it had to be lightened. The captain thought about it. He had been paid for the women and the children, so it would be rather hard for him to throw them into the sea. The leather cargo, on the other hand, was insured. So they threw it overboard and the people were saved. The trip lasted for days, more than a week. The people hungered, thirsted, and were pestered by lice. After some time, they arrived at Piraeus, but they were not allowed to go out. Mrs. Despina and Theodora stood at the edge of the anchored ship and observed the people at the port. There, for the first time, they heard Greeks blaspheme God. Without having to say anything to each other, they looked at each other and thought, if there are such antichrists here, let's go back to the Turks. The people of Levisi, whether from tradition or reaction to the Turks, appeared to be very pious. Everyone went to church regularly. Robberies were rare. Crime was practically unknown. Everyone had an icon stand in the main room of their house, and they prayed. Mrs. Despina, in particular, loved the church and was a very pious woman. She kept the fasts and taught Theodora, who was obedient to her in everything, to keep them as well. Theodora went to school only up to the third grade at the girls' school, but she knew and understood many things about the church. She read the lives of the saints with her children listening. Through the afflictions she experienced, she came to understand the church and her holy mysteries. Little by little, she became almost an ascetic. It was from his grandma, Despina, and his mother that blessed elder Yakovos began to love the sacred things. From them, he learned to revere the priests, to pray, to fast, and to love the people. From Piraeus, the ship sailed to the small port of Atia in the Phokida region on the northern side of the Gulf of Corinth. There, the remaining refugees were let down and were led on foot to the village near Amphisa, called Agios Georgios, St. George. Mrs. Despina, Theodore with the three children and the rest of the sisters with Kiriako and Vasili were put up in the storehouse, but not by themselves. The accommodations were shared by many families, each one separated from the next by a blanket suspended between them. Grandma Despina was in charge of everything. Theodore did not know if she was a widow or if she should still hope for her husband to return. She told the children that daddy was going to be with them soon. 
She wanted to believe it herself. The region was not well off, and the few inhabitants were at first reserved in those difficult beginning days. When they arrived at St. George, it was olive harvest time, and Mrs. Despina's daughters worked in the harvest. Theodora worked in the storehouse for the children and the rest of the family. Being of a delicate constitution, she had already been exhausted by all these hardships, the multiple childbirths and afflictions. In any case, by working here and there, they managed to live for two years in Agios Georgios. Little Yakovaki turned four there. As for the whereabouts of his father, no one knew. Other families had found their men, whoever managed to return in 1923 and 1924. Theodora was withering away in sorrow and anguish. Stavros is recognized. Let us for the moment go back to Trabizond. Stavros Salikis worked there in the construction of a hospital. Being a good builder, he was treated well by the Turks. They hid him every time they heard that the Red Cross, or the International Committee as they called it, was going to pass through the area. They hid him for two days and then put him back to work building the hospital. He perceived that something was going on, that these organizations would help him go to Greece. But he could not do a thing, as he was under close surveillance. It was a very tragic situation for him, as he did not know what was going on with his family and his fellow Levisians. He had only heard about the great destruction of Smyrna, nothing else. He lived in isolation. After some time, he finally made the decision. He was going to escape with God's help. He waited for the appropriate time. One night in 1925, he left for the homeland. He put on Turkish clothes, he spoke the language well, and headed for central Turkey. Some shepherds in Cappadocia found him one night, lying on the snowy road, senseless from the cold and fatigue. They took him into the sheepfold, warmed him up, and made some noodles for him to eat. They knew he was Greek, but they didn't betray him. In fact, they helped him escape by a safe road. All this was good, except for the fact that there was no place where he could find out what happened to the Levisians. Did they go? Did they stay? Had they been saved? Had they been killed? Had they been drowned? He couldn't just ask anyone, as they might suspect he was Greek. Through many difficulties, walking at night and other dangers, he made it back to Makri. There at last, he learned what had happened from an old apprentice of his. The apprentice had seen Theodora with the children at Cordoni. He also knew how they searched the women. Not only was poor Theodora left without a protector, she was also left without money. Stavros almost lost his mind from the distress. He did not at all pass by Levisi. He headed southward, taking many precautions, pretending to be a Turk, and all the while looking for a ship from Rhodes, Simi, or Castellorizio to appear. One night, he was fortunate to find one. He jumped aboard and gave proof that he was not a Turk. He made it to Rhodes and then Piraeus. He searched for his wife and children, but with no success. No one could tell him where the American ship had let down the last group of the Levisian refugees. He was looking for a job, and was also looking for his family. He finally found a job in the town of Am Amphissa as a builder. One day before the end of 1925, Mrs. Despina had to leave the village and go to Amphissa to buy a few things. She gathered some money and went to the town on foot. When she had finished and was on her way out of the town, she saw a workman at a building site. She only saw his back, but something stirred within her. That's like Stavros's pose, she thought. Moved by hope, she stood in the middle of the road and cried out to him, Good young man, Stavros turned his head around and saw his elderly mother-in-law. He jumped down from the scaffolding like a crazy man and ran to her while she only managed to say just before falling into his arms, Our Darula and the children are doing well, my Stavros. Part 2 I will become a monk. 
Little Yakavaki had turned five years old. His favorite toy was the sensor, a small curved roof tile that he'd found. With a coal from the fireplace on it, he carried it around the house, sensing very seriously and saying, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. He also sensed the neighbors that as he lifted up the blanket a little and passed into the next house. Then he lifted up the next blanket to go into the next house. In this way, the little angel with the tile sensor blessed all the families of this storehouse. With his sensor in hand, he welcomed his father, whom he had never known. They lived in that storehouse patiently because it was promised them that they were soon going to be moved to somewhere with fields and houses of their own. The refugee children played there in the dirt and mud all day long with the village children. From them, they learned to say the bad words, to swear and make indecent gestures. He could not tolerate hearing the bad words, they said, even though he did not understand them. And the more Yakovaki saw all of this, the less he went out with the other children. He hardly ever played in the street. However, every sunset, he did go with his grandmother or his mother to light the oil lamps in the chapel. He liked being in the little chapel very much and always found a clever way to prolong his visit there. He asked his grandmother to tell him everything she knew about the saints and about the priest monks of their family. He couldn't hear enough about Elias and Demetrios, who became monks at the Holy Sepulchre. They made great progress in the monastic life, especially Demetrios. That was the reason why the patriarch sent him on a tour together with Elias to collect alms when the patriarchate was in dire need. The Turks did not leave them much money, and the pilgrims were few. Elias, it was said, had a difficult time on the tour because he felt ashamed to ask for money. He became a good monk as well, and after returning, he lived in a monastery in Palestine. At the end of 1925, the Levisian refugees were moved from Agios Georgios to Faralakha, a small village in northern Evia between the towns of Limni and Mantudi. The surrounding region belonged to the English landowner, Philip Noel, and was later given as a dowry to his daughter Irene, who married the English deputy baker. They made a deal. The refugees were to till the fields of Noel and give back 25% of the produce, like the old inhabitants of Faraka. These fields, about 11 acres for each family, were expropriated many years later. In Faraka, the 60 Levisian families found tents instead of the houses that had been promised. The houses were finished two years later in 1927. Every family was given two small, contiguous rooms. At least, it was something. Little Yakovos had turned seven years old by that time, having passed five of them in miserable environments. By the time he was six, Yakovaki had learned everything pertaining to the divine liturgy by heart, even though he did not know yet how to read. He knew everything the priest and the chanter say on Sundays. He chanted them alone, slowly, without making many mistakes. But he recited them so seriously and so precisely that it perplexed everyone around him. However, no one had time to think about what to do with this gracious little child. Everyone then was trying to survive. Only his grandmother and mother dreamt about Yakovaki as they went to sleep, exhausted from a difficult day at work. However, his grandmother soon passed away. The old tents they had been living in for so long let moisture in, and she caught pneumonia. Already suffering as she was, she did not make it through. Yakovaki wept very much for his grandmother because it was she who first taught him the way of the church and who showed him how to be reverent and to love the church. It must be mentioned at this point that whatever his grandmother taught him about the church seemed rather obvious to the little one. He picked it up right away, as though he were simply being reminded of it. It was like opening the lid of a bottle only to find within it what the grandmother wanted to teach the little one. After his grandmother's death, his mother, whose afflictions aged her before her forties, took care of him. 
What an amazing woman. Though her constitution was naturally weak and grew even weaker from her fasting, from her afflictions and illnesses, she did raise her children well. She taught them to be pious and not to take other people's things. Although they were poor little refugees, they did not pick fruit from other people's trees. One time as they passed by a pear grove, the children were hungry. Pears had fallen on the ground and were being eaten by the sheep. The children wanted to have some, but they would not reach out their hand to take fruit from someone else's tree. They were obedient to their mother. Appearances of St. Perescavi In Farakla, Yakovaki went to school for the first time in 1927. There was no special building, of course. Further up from their house, about 500 meters northwest, was the chapel of St. Perescavi. This served as the school building for the little refugees and the local children. A narrow road, a path rather, passed in front of their house and led uphill after many curves, and after passing through a pine forest to the school chapel. He was very good at learning. He became an excellent student without any difficulty. As for his behavior, it goes without saying. He made such an impression that even the school teacher and the village priest grew to respect Yakovaki. The Levisian refugees, as well as the few natives, got used to Yakovaki's behavior, though they could not exactly figure it out. A very poor little child, six or seven years old, barefooted most of the time, with worn out clothes, though always clean, desperately thin, certainly stands out. Spindly, staid, with his little head always upright, his little forehead always clean and bright, he stood apart. He was never seen playing in the streets, and no one ever heard him say anything unbecoming. The children in the school somewhat unwittingly, somewhat ironically, occasionally called him Grandpa. His brother George, as well as some others who knew him better, often called him Monk. Later, from about the time he was ten years old, many people started calling him Father Yakovos, and sometimes they kissed his hand, which he immediately withdrew. In the year they moved from the tent into the lowly little house, they also raised a pig that grew to be very large. Stavros Salikis, always away, working as a builder at the time, but he had instructed his sons, seven-year-old Yakovos and nine-year-old George, to take the pig to a larger nearby village where he had already agreed with the local butcher to have it slaughtered and sold for them. On the way, they met a man from their village who, upon seeing the well-fed pig, said, Hey, where are you going with that so? She's become like a donkey. The animal immediately fell to the ground, foaming at the mouth, and was about to die. The man, he had cast an evil eye upon the animal. The children were frightened. Little Yakovos recovered and looked around. He found a small empty can, filled it with water from the stream, picked some basil from the nearby garden, and went a little further down to where there was a shrine of St. Demetrios. He prayed on his knees, took some oil from the oil lamp, and then returned to the animal. He knelt down, he said a prayer, anointed the animal crosswise with the oil, and sprinkled it with the basil. After a short while, the pig got up, and they continued on their way. Every child went to school once a day, but little Yakovaki went twice a day. He loved it very much because in those first years the school was housed in the little church of St. Perescavi. In the evenings, the boy, he liked to go there by himself. He lit the oil lamps and stayed there until it was dark, praying according to his knowledge and ability. He returned home by way of a downhill path through the pine forest. One evening, while he was praying, he must have been eight or nine years old, St. Perescavi appeared to him alive as she was depicted on her icon. The child was frightened, ran away, and arrived home out of breath. He was so scared that he didn't even turn to look back. Days later, he went back to light the candles, and the saint appeared to him again. Once again, he was frightened and ran away, but this time the saint went out of the church and he, she spoke sweetly to the child to calm him down. 
He stopped running and turned back to see who was talking to him. The saint told him who she was, not to be afraid. Little Yakuvaki shyly went up to the chapel. He sat by her and listened to her attentively. St. Paraskavi appeared to him many times. Yakuvaki got used to it, no longer being afraid. They sat side by side and conversed. That much familiarity and innocent boldness the little one had with the saint. In one of her first appearances to him after the little one was no longer shy, the saint told him, My dear Yakovos, what do you want me to give to you for praying in my house? He did not know what he should ask for. In the evening, however, he asked his mother, Theodora. She advised him ingenuously, Ask her to tell you your future. The next evening, St. Perescavi appeared to the child and said, Listen to me. You will be praised by many people. They will come to visit you. A lot of money will be given to you, but you will not keep any of it. Indeed, all this came true. Elder Yakovos was honored by rich and poor, wise and uneducated rulers and ruled, university professors and high-ranking judges, monks, priests, bishops, and patriarchs. They went to the monastery in his last years to meet him, go to holy confession and receive spiritual direction and a blessing. He was indeed given a lot of money, especially in his last years, and he gave all of it to those in need. Nothing remained in his bag, a small woven bag he used to put the money in. It was never empty, no matter how much he gave away. Father Yakovos himself, who related these things, added, In any case, my brother, did St. Perescavi lie to me? Did she not give me a small fortune? She made me a priest and steward of the mysteries of God. He reads church prayers, prays, and heals. As soon as Yakovos learned to read at school, he started reading the church books with zeal. His mother encouraged him, but he was also helped by Papa Dimitris, Father Dimitrios Theodosiu, who visited the village every other Sunday to serve divine liturgy in the parish church of St. George. Of course, being so young, he did not understand the meaning of what he was reading. Within a few months, that is, when he was eight or nine years old and about to enter the second grade, he was able to read the church books with ease, and when he was reading hymns and prayers, his voice sounded different, solemn, and serious. Even more, a holy sound. It seemed to come from an unusual source, a distant holy spring. His parents and close relatives took notice of Yakovos' good voice. In the evenings, mostly on feast days, his father took up his, his small baglama and played short songs. Yakovaki picked them up and sang them very well. He was accompanied by his mother, and the two of them also danced. With the church hymns, it was different. In those days, he helped the priest as an altar boy. He also began going up to the chanter's stand to read and chant after he first prepared things in the altar with the fear of God and much diligence for which he was rewarded. Many times, there by the holy altar, he encountered angels and heard heavenly songs. The child was bewildered and he trembled, but at the same time he felt a great internal joy, even though he could not explain what he was hearing and seeing. At the chanter's stand, he read from the books and chanted as many hymns as he could. Once the villagers saw and heard Yakovaki at the chanter's stand, they began to view him as a holy person, devoted to God and not concerned with worldly matters. Everyone knew from then on that ya Yakovaki stood well with the saints and had dedicated his life to the church. The village did not have its own priest, so Yakovos kept the keys to the village church even from the time he was a child. In church he walked with reverence and felt at home. No one was surprised to see him in church so often. From the time he was about nine years old, Yakovaki gradually became a protector of the poor, simple, mostly refugee villagers. Doctors were only to be found far away and wanted money, which no one had. 
and Papa Dimitris lived in another village, so they began to call Yakovaki for his prayers. He could do anything except for the divine liturgy. Were the animals sick, they called Yakovaki to read a prayer over them, and they became well. The same for the little children. The villagers even called Yakovaki when women had difficulty giving birth. He went to them with oil from the Lampada of St. Perskevi, St. George, and St. Harlambos, made the sign of the Holy Cross on the door of the house, prayed, and then left. The women then delivered. When he was called to read prayers for the sick, he took a prayer book from the village church and the synopsis with him, the compendium of main prayers and services of the church. He could not always determine exactly which prayer was needed for a given situation, so he read whatever was on the page he happened to open the book to. He also used to say improv improvised prayers. One time when he was nine years old, he was sent with his brother to thresh their field on a July day, and his brother was bitten by a snake. He was in great pain and cried for help. Yakovos he tried to help him. He washed the bite with water. He knelt down. He took off the small wooden cross that always hung down upon his chest, crossed his brother with it, and raised his little hands to the sky, saying, Lord, please make the poison turn to water so that nothing bad happens to my dear brother, and punish the accursed snake. The devil put it there to harm him. In a short while, the pain went away. Not only that, the snake moved a little. It became motionless and died on the spot. The Little Ascetic Apprentice In 1933, Yakovos finished grade school. As for attending high school or continuing his education, it was unthinkable. Poverty and need did not permit such thoughts. His father, Stavros, worked hard as a day laborer, but although he was a very good builder, he made barely enough money for them to survive. He had buried his old dreams. In Levisi and in the Turkish villages, he worked hard day and night to provide what was needed for his children to study and progress. Now, however, they couldn't even afford to buy food. In addition, Theodora was becoming weaker and even more sick. So Yakovaki helped by working as a day laborer in their own few fields and in the other people's fields as well. His father also took him along to help with his building work. One time they had a discussion at home about Yakovaki's future. His father, who had some experience of the world, told him sternly, if you leave me, you'll end up a bum in Piraeus. They took some food in a little woven bag and went together to any village where the poor inhabitants needed work done, such as light construction work or plastering. Wherever they happened to go, people took notice of the little apprentice, and they slowly began to trust him and respect him. Wherever they worked for one or two days, people soon felt that this little apprentice was somehow different, that he had some other destiny, although they could not know exactly what it was or how it would develop. In addition, Yakovaki chanted at the churches and the surrounding villages on their feast days. Just hearing him chant with that beautiful voice of his, which flowed out melodious and strong, as if from a deep spring, was enough for the villagers to take notice of him and respect him. Respect the poor Yakovaki was only then 13 or 14 years old. It couldn't have been any different. The little apprentice, he prayed constantly, continuously, without ceasing. Even while carrying mortar and stones, he recited supplicatory canons and whispered the hymns. Yakovaki also took time to pray at night. Only his mother knew that her weakened little boy was a little ascetic. She knew because she saw him get up or sensed that he got up at night. He made many matanyas, many prostrations, read supplicatory canons in the light of the oil lamp or in the moonlight, knelt for many hours, things that he continued to do until the time of his death. In addition, after he turned 15 or 16, he often kept vigil alone in the chapel of St. Perskevi. After all, even since he was about 10 years old, the little boy had been saying about himself, 
I will become a monk. Yaakov Aki received his kanona, his rule of prayer from Papa Dimitris, who became the little ascetic spiritual father. He progressed by leaps and bounds under his spiritual direction, even though the priest knew very little. All of these things reached the ears of Metropolitan Gregory of Halkidia. The good priest, Papa Dimitris, and others had told him. The bishop did not quite believe it until he came to Strophalia, a large village close to Far Farakala, and heard Yaakovos chant at the Pangria for the Feast of the Holy Trinity. The bishop was impressed, called him into the sanctuary, and became acquainted with him. On that same day, he tonsured him a reader. When he was told that Yaakovos had baptized a baby, he did not order to rebaptize it. Indeed, the baptism did take place, but the priest suddenly felt ill, could not do it. At the priest's insistence, Yaakovos, who was there to assist, performed the baptism in front of him. After all, he knew the service by heart. Healed by St. Harlambos and the Theotokos. In 1935, just before Pascha, he became very sick. The necessary medical care was not available and it looked like he was going to die. His poor mother was inconsolable. She entreated the saints, especially St. Harlambos, whose small icon they had brought from Levisi. The Sunday of St. Thomas came around and everyone expected that the little ascetic wouldn't make it. They all thought the same thing. Why doesn't God heal little Yakovaki? He prays and makes the sign of the cross over everyone who is sick, young people, old people, even animals, and they all get well. That evening, St. Harlambos appeared to him. Yakovos saw the saint's hand with his sleeve, making the sign of the cross over his chest, and he recovered immediately. He told his mother what happened, and she said to him with tears in her eyes, Today, my child, we witnessed a resurrection from the dead. You must always remember this day. Some years later, before 1940, he had another serious problem with his health. Because of his extreme fasting, a lack of good food, and walking barefoot in the cold and in the rain, he used to do this because he was poor and other times for asceticism. His feet became swollen. The soles of his feet were covered with sores and pus oozed from them. He was in great pain. He bound them up but still could not walk. No one who knew about natural medicines in the village could help him. At that time, the icon of the Theotokos of Xenia from Almiros Volos was being taken through the nearby villages for veneration. When Yakovos heard that it was scheduled to pass through the nearby village of Daphne, he said to his mother, despite his condition, Mother, I'll go too. She was surprised and saddened for her son. My child, don't you see your condition? How are you going to walk there? Yakovos, though, insisted, I will go and she will heal me. Papa Dimitri, who happened to be there, put a word of support. Oh, come now, Theodora, let the child go. He set out, but the trip was very painful, the soles of his feet covered in sores and pus. When he arrived in Daphne, he entered the church, venerated the icon of the Theotokos. He became faint, exhausted from the walk, and went outside to sit down to recover. After a while, he went inside again and venerated the icons. When leaving, he felt that his feet had been healed. He took the wrappings off his feet and saw that they were indeed healed. Up until the day the Blessed Elder fell asleep. The scars remained on his feet from that time. He heals children from the mumps. His afflictions of illness and poverty and the necessity for him to work a little here and there did not prevent him from doing his internal work, fasting strictly, keeping nightly vigils, and fighting temptations. In addition, he was truly compassionate, very much so toward everyone. He never refused to lend a helping hand to anyone who asked. He just could not refuse. Everyone in the village regarded him as a holy person, even if they did not know what he was doing at night and the extent of his asceticism. When someone became sick or at any other difficult time, the villagers called him to read prayers and make the sign of the cross over them. 
In 1939, until the beginning of 1940, many of the children in the village contracted mumps at school. The parents gathered them all together and took them to Yaakovos for him to read prayers over them. They all bowed their little heads reverently while Yaakovos read the prayers and made the sign of the cross over them. One child, however, was laughing. On their way home, all of the children became well, except the one who was laughing. When his parents saw that all of the other children were healed, they inquired and found out what had happened. They scolded the child and took him back to Yaakovos. The child cried and was sorry. Yaakovos read a prayer over him, crossed him with his small wooden cross, and he too became well. For all of these good things that he did for his fellow villagers and those in surrounding villages, he was not paid. He loved everyone, young and old, and felt compassion for them as they also were poor. And during this time, that is from 1938 to 1940, he increased his asceticism very much. He ate very little, slept very little, prayed many hours at night and worked hard during the day, as much and even more than the other villagers. His mother and father had begun to break down under the weight of their afflictions. He had become the supporter of his household. He had purified his heart and mind to such an extent from prayer and asceticism that he could foresee the evils that were approaching. While he was seeing the events to come, the Theotokos appeared to him in his sleep as the life-giving spring, the life-giving fountain, and asked him to build her a little chapel at a place where she showed him, saying to him, Here is where my house was. So the young builder, Yakovos, with the help of his father, built her a chapel. Years later, the ruins of an old Christian church were discovered there. War is coming. He received the greatest forewarning of the events when St. Perskevi had been appearing to him repeatedly from the beginning of 1940. One night she appeared to him and said to him very seriously, Come here, my child. I want to tell you something. War is coming. Again, Yaakovos took to prayer and prostrations. Whenever there was a vigil for a feast day, he went on foot. He wore twill clothing, inexpensive, though always clean, and brought a little food in his small woven bag. Many times he chanted throughout the night in the church by himself. Wherever he chanted, he never asked for money. He didn't even ask for food. The great evil came. The Second World War and the Greek-Italian War. The army staff did not have time to enlist 20-year-olds because the war broke out. The occupation and famine followed. The hardships of the poor refugees became greater. Yakovos stood firm. He did not succumb to the circumstances. He was not carried away by the whirlwind of villainy that broke out on a thousand fronts at the same time. He did not lose himself because he prayed unceasingly to Christ and his saints. By the fall of 1941, hunger and utter poverty made life a nightmare for the people. They sold anything for a piece of bread, for a pair of shoes. These things, though, didn't affect Yakovos, now a grown-up man, 21 years old, but with the maturity of a 50-year-old. He always ate little and devised ways to eat even less. This was not just fasting, but advanced asceticism. During this difficult time, he undertook for the first time something he later repeated many times. For a whole week, that is, from Sunday afternoon to Saturday when he went to Divine Liturgy, he ate nothing. On Saturday, he received Holy Communion, had some andiron, and then ate bread and olives or something light. On Sundays, he ate normally. He didn't always keep this rule of his. A few times his fast unintentionally lasted longer than a week. One time after completing his fast, some children showed up and they were hungry. He gave them all of the food he had for the next few days, keeping nothing for himself. Another time, some elderly people who were disabled showed up after the fast and he did the same thing for them. As a result, he suffered greatly and became prone to fainting. Despite his physical suffering, he felt an internal joy beyond description. Whoever was pure could see in his face a deep joy he had from helping others. 
The strange thing is, his fasting did not hinder him from working. Of course, his body suffered great stress from being mortified to the utmost, but he insisted. He had to do what was right, even if his work might suffer. During the first period of the famine of 1941, despite his great exhaustion, he walked to the Holy Monastery of St. Nicholas for their feast day. He put on clean tool clothes, put some bread and the church books he needed into his little woven bag and arrived on foot for Vespers. At the beginning, he chanted with the chanters and after Vespers, the others left. Only a few old women remained for the vigil. Later, they also left. Despite his exhaustion, scrawny but poised Yakovos kept on chanting and reading solemnly in a deep and melodious voice all night long. Not even the nuns remained to keep vigil. One young novice, now the Yorondissa, the abbess there, witnessed everything and informed the abbess. They were ashamed that a visitor kept vigil on their feast day while they slept. Some of the nuns vowed to keep more of the vigil on their feast day in the future, as much as they could from that day on. Hunger and other hardships of the occupation did not break his spirit, but he was almost defeated by contempt. Everyone was poor in those days, but Yakovos was poorer than them all. He had some tool clothes, but no shoes. He chanted at the village church of St. George, but how could he, a mature man, continue to go up to the chanter's stand barefooted for everyone to see his pitiful state? He felt extremely ashamed. He pulled his trousers down over his feet to cover them, but they just couldn't be hidden. He felt like crying. He went back home deeply distressed and thought about quitting chanting altogether, but it would be unbearable for him not to chant to God. When his brother and sister went out, he knelt before the icon of St. Harlambos and prayed. He got up, decided to go chant without shoes. He did this for two Sundays. Well, some ignorant men who were passing through black marketers began putting him down loudly. Where's his shame? Doesn't he see his bare foot? And he wants to chant on top of it. He heard it over and over. He returned home very sad, deeply depressed. Again, his thoughts tempted him to quit chanting, and he almost decided to. Maybe, he thought to himself, people are right to blame me. It's a church, a saint's house, not just any house. That night he went to bed after praying for a long time. After falling asleep, he saw St. George, who told him, My child, I don't want you to leave. I want you to keep chanting in my house as you are. So Yakovos chanted without shoes for one whole year. In 1942, he suffered greatly. His good-natured mother, Theodora, who had suffered so much, could not go on. Afflicted as she was, she had lost six children and struck all the more by the hardships of the occupation. She passed away in 1942. She had just turned 40, but she looked like a 70-year-old woman or older. She fell seriously ill, and on July 5th, she told her children, your uncle Kostas died on July 12th. I will die three days earlier at sunrise. How do you know, mother? Yakovos asked. An angel of the Lord revealed this to me, she replied. Everything turned out exactly as she said. Before delivering up her soul, she called Yakovos and told him, As for the girl, I entrust her to God and to you. Don't go away until you see that she's married. Some time before she fell ill, his mother foretold him something very important. You, my Yakovaki, will become a priest, and the first one to receive Adiron from your hand will be your sister. It happened just as she said. Yakovos lamented over the loss of his mother very much, so much, in fact, that she appeared to him in his sleep and asked him to stop weeping. From the time his mother died, he felt all the more responsible to protect his sister Anastasia, whom he loved very much. So he stayed and worked in the village longer than he had planned until she was married. That is, he wanted to become a monk much earlier, but postponed it until 
he saw that his sister was married first. The years of the occupation passed with great suffering. In the beginning, the family tried to make it through, but they were eventually forced to sell off every valuable item they possessed, among the few things they were able to take with them from Levisi. The only items they did not sell were two icons. Yakovos worked in the fields and at the building sites, wherever he could get hired as a day laborer. He was in danger from the occupation army only once. The high and wooded mountains of Evia provided a hideout for the Greek guerrillas. Even though Yakovos had not been involved with the guerrillas, the Germans arrested him, along with others, in reprisal. The village was in an uproar, but there was nothing they could do. They put them in a large open van and drove them to a larger village of Strophilia. Everything indicated that something very bad was going to happen. The captives prayed to God for their salvation. Those who knew Yakovos, that is everybody, looked at him as if imploring him, Pray, Father Yakovos, do something. Yakovos was, of course, praying intensely for them all. At Styrophilia, they were led into a wide enclosure with guns pointing at them from all directions. There was no longer doubt that they were going to be executed. However, just as all the guns had been loaded, the Germans received a notification that something had happened, so they immediately packed up and released them. Yakovos returned home, safe and sound. He was 23 years old at the time. On the way back, he kept saying to the others, the Holy Trinity saved us. The Holy Trinity saved us. He had been praying to the Holy Trinity for their release. Laboring ascetically and physically. After 1945, when the Greek Civil War began, the Salikis family encountered new difficulties. Yakovos had his own orientation. Day and night, his mind was in prayer while he worked with his hands and feet in the village. He promptly followed all orders for digging, watering, threshing, weeding, everything. He also worked as a day laborer, but the jobs were few and did not pay well, as everyone was very poor. Before the end of the occupation, a door opened for Yakovos, as he was called in the village. His aunts knew how much he liked one of the two rooms they had, and they offered it to him. It faced east and toward a dirt road, which became quite dusty in the summer and muddy in the winter. But these things didn't bother him. He was so happy about it. He turned it into a proper monk's cell, even more into a chapel with an oil lamp, incense, chanter stand with church books from which he read and chanted, old Levisian icons and other icons made out of paper, little wooden crosses which he himself made, even a cheap rasso made of black dyed calico that hung from a nail in the wall. Everyone in the village knew about Yakovos's cell, not just the relatives and neighbors. It's true that the simple people had mixed feelings about him. They acknowledged his deep relationship with God and the saints, but they also thought he was moonstruck, a being from another world. They saw that he was different from the other men in the village. It was also that gait of his. He was somewhat tall and upright, to be sure, but he walked as though his feet did not touch the ground. It was a curious way that he had, even until the time he fell asleep. When he walked in the monastery yard or in the garden, he gave the impression that he was not touching the earth, that he didn't tread on it naturally, not to mention the fact that he was always very, very thin. His bones protruded from the back of his rasso. So Yakovos was to be found either at work in the church or praying in his cell. Only once in a while did he sit with his aunts at sunset on the earthen bench outside the house. Some women neighbors might join them, but they knew very well that it was no place for them to sit and gossip or jest. No time for idle talk. They talked about serious things. Yakovos told them about the lives of the saints, or they discussed how to prepare the church for the Sunday liturgy, a feast day, Holy Week, Holy Friday, Pascha. One year, Papa Dimitri became ill and could not do the Lord's burial service in their village on Holy Friday. So that the service would not be left out, Yakovos prepared the epitaphios with the help of the women. 
In the evening he rang the bell and they chanted the praises solemnly, orderly and with much emotion. However, later that evening, after they'd finished, a priest from a nearby village came by and in front of everyone he scolded Yaakovos, putting him down for what he had done. Yaakovos lowered his head, made a prostration in repentance, and asked for his forgiveness without trying to justify himself. Yaakovos also took care of of all the outdoor icon stands in the area, their oil lamps, well, they needed olive oil, which was very rare and expensive at that time. But there was not a single drop of olive oil in their village, only resin from pines, and he looked hard for it. At sunset, he disappeared from the village and returned late after lighting as many oil lamps as he could. Upon seeing him return, his fellow villagers teased him to no end the men loudly, the women and girls in whispers. Some of the villagers, a few women in particular, were, were very annoyed that the others made fun of Yakovos and despised him. Those few saw him many times kneeling for a long time in the chapel of St. Paraskevi. They also saw him making countless prostrations in his little room. There was a crevasse in the wall and they could see through it. Of course, even those few did not understand much about Yaakovos' life, but they felt that this young man was something completely different, something holy from another world. They were very fond of him, these few. One time a neighbor girl his age shouted in his defense, You'll see, one day we'll all bow, bow down before Yaakovos. Both she and his old neighbors remember this event to the day. We met repeatedly with many of his old neighbors in Farakala in order to document the memories and impressions of his fellow villagers who respected him very much, by now everyone. In the years following the occupation until 1947, the time in which he joined the army, Yakovos reached the point of exhaustion. It wasn't so much from laboring in the fields every day and the construction work, not even from the insufficient poor food in those difficult times, but from making many prostrations and strict fasting. For many hours at night, both in summer and winter, a tiny light burned in Yakovos's cell. He prayed and made hundreds of prostrations even in those days. He always exceeded 1,000. He even reached 2,000. Yes, 2,000 and sometimes even more. In this way, he battled the temptations of the youth to subdue the passions, the passionate movements of the soul. He was transformed completely into a, a fine silk, a spotless mirror on which the divine energy reached and reflected. In his pure internal life, he received revelations and experienced moments of infinite bliss, blessedness that he wouldn't trade for anything. All this was divine and holy, in the morning, however, he had to go to work along with his relatives and fellow villagers who didn't know how much he had labored during the night and how little he had slept. He did get up in the morning along with the others and worked with them without ever trying to explain or make excuses for his great weariness. As a result, many thought that Yakovos was not among the best workers. They regarded him as somewhat inferior to the rest, but what really lowered him in the eyes of the others was that he followed all the rules. Whenever they spoke ironically to him, he didn't reply. Whenever they insulted him, he didn't answer back. One night in the middle of the summer, he went to water their field as it was their field's turn to be watered, but he found that a middle-aged villager, Yorgos, had moved the hose into his own field. Knowing well whose turn it was, Yakovos put the hose back in his field. After a short while, Yorgos arrived very angry and threatening. Yakovos explained to him calmly and humbly that it was their field's turn and that it was going to dry up if he didn't water it. Then the man got mad and started insulting Yakovos, while Yakovos responded to every insult with, Thanks, thank you, Uncle Yorgos, thanks, Uncle Yorgos. The incident became known in the village in the phrase, Thanks, Uncle Yorgos, became kind of proverbial. This was how they often behaved toward him, but it was he 
who they ran to in difficult times. For his part, Yaakovos never refused to help. He read many church prayers and prayed for many by name, among whom was uncle Yorgos, who became very sick but got well through Yaakovos' prayers. During these years until 1947, Yaakovos worked hard and anxiously, but not for himself. He had made up his mind to become a monk. Nothing could talk him out of it. However, he had to take care of his sister Anastasia, who was 20 months younger than him. Of course, his father Stavros, whose kindness Yaakovos had inherited, was still around, but he was broken down. It was obvious that he was not going to make it much longer. And so it happened. He passed away in 1949. Actually, he died from shock. Some scoundrels came to him one night and threatened to kill him. Exhausted as he was, the poor man couldn't take it. So Yaakovos had to do whatever he could to provide a dowry for Anastasia. She was somewhat frail and very sensitive. She clung to Yaakovos and depended on his protection. It is also true that Yaakovos loved his sister very much. Proof of this is the fact that it was for her sake that he deferred becoming a monk for so long. The blessed Yeronda Elder himself used to say this. At this point, we must mention two other factors that delayed him. First, the conditions of the times. War, enemy occupation, civil war, and the absence of any noteworthy monasticism in the area. It was God's will. He judged that his future saint had to live many years, 32 whole ones, out of the monastery in order for him to get to know the world and for the world to get to know him. Thus, the unsuspecting world was enabled to get to know the future saint, while he was enabled to experience all of its afflictions and temptations. Private Father Yakovos. Normally, he would have served in the army in 1941, but with the anomalies of World War II, the occupation, the Greek Civil War, he wasn't called up until 1947 when he was 27 years old. He reported to Volos. After basic training, the soldiers were assigned to different units determined by examinations. Although he had only finished grade school, he excelled in the exams and was assigned to the Supplies and Transportation Center in Piraeus. Thus, without asking for it, he avoided the deadly Civil War battles on the Gramos and Vitsi Mountains. However, he fought another kind of battle where he was, the teasing and mocking of the soldiers. It was not that they hated him, but in the squad room, soldiers hold nothing back. They called him Father Yakovos all the time, to say the least. The first month was the most difficult. As soon as he entered the squad room, the soldiers took it out on him, calling him Father Yakovos was the easiest way. Well, Yakovos didn't answer back. He just smiled a bit and went directly to his bed. It is also true that the latter, he, he returned to this, the later he returned to the squad room, the less teasing he heard. By the end of the first month, things had changed a bit. The first soldier who got sick found Yakovos at his side, bringing him a glass of water, some aspirin, his medication at the appropriate time, or buying something for him from the outside, and so on and so forth. Same thing happened with the next soldier who got sick. He nursed them patiently like a mother. This help became more prominent on weekends when everyone disappeared and the few patients at the center were left with no help or company. Yakovos needed to have some money. It was absolutely necessary for him. When he was free on Sunday, he went to church early in the morning he handed the priest a small piece of paper with the names of the living and the departed to be commemorated at the Poscomedie. But he also had to offer a drachma or two to the church. However, where could he find the money? Who could give him some? Moreover, on Wednesdays and Fridays, what could he eat? The meals in the unit contained olive oil at the least. He could not violate the fast on those days. He did not even allow himself oil. His mother never ate oil on Wednesdays and Fridays. He had the same and even more difficult problem with the Nativity Fast and the Great Lent. 
He did not know what to do, where to find just enough money to give a little to the priest and also to buy some halva for the fast days. God enlightened the poor soldier ascetic to go to the marketplace and sell his army bread. Someone showed up each time to buy it, half the price. In this way, he was able to gather a few drachmas twice a week. He gave some to the priest and had enough left for a tiny piece of halva. Of course, he did not have enough bread, but he felt wonderful to have kept the fast. The soldiers more or less saw all these things and were certainly influenced in one way or another. They still teased him, of course, but to a lesser degree as time went on. One could say that they actually began to like him, even to love him. Indeed, it was difficult for anyone who knew this man not to like him. Perhaps one could not follow him or do the things he did that was anyway very difficult, but they would always still turn to like him. Only if possessed by the devil could anyone hate Yakovos, that weak and tall man with the bright face and pure heart. The purity of his heart was manifest on his bright, angelic face. One incident in particular with an educated man, a philologist, shows his character. The man, he said in front of Yakovos, Yakovos is a nice fellow, but the church has driven him crazy. However, he immediately received the proper reply. The church illumines people. She doesn't drive them crazy. The officers and non-commissioned officers knew about Yakovos more or less, but they had no time to occupy themselves with him. However, this was not the case with the unit commander, Lieutenant Major Polycarp Zoe. As soon as he learned about Yakovos, he summoned him to his office. He met with him and listened to him attentively. It was a Friday. The menu in the unit that day was beef with eggplant. Go on, soldier, eat the officer commanded. Yakovos firmly refused. But aren't you afraid? I'm not afraid of those who are not able to kill my soul. My Lord doesn't want this. Pretending to be angry, Zoïs asked him, Where did you learn these things? He received the reply. The Holy Spirit has just illumined me. After that, Zoïs took him out somewhere to have a Lenten meal. From the next day on, he assigned him to his personal service. He sent him on errands, mostly to his own house, in order to keep him away from the teasing of the soldiers. One day, in fact, he summoned all the soldiers and spoke to them sternly, telling them to stop making fun of Yakovos Salikis by calling him father. Because Yakovos, with all the things he does, is indeed a father, and one day he will become a father. This lieutenant major was perhaps the first man who seriously and consciously called Yakovos father. Yakovos listened to all this with his head bent down and his face red with shame that such an important person, the lieutenant major, took an interest in the poor refugee, that such an official person, as he was always used to say, had honored him. Moreover, to Yakovos' great joy, Zoïs' wife and her mother happened to be very pious women. They went to church regularly, made offerings, and so on. So Yakovos became their co-worker. They made incense together, took care of the little chapels, attended vigil services on the feast days of small churches, and kept vigils themselves, always together with Yakovos. He'd leave Piraeus with the lieutenant major's permission to go to the Zoïs house up in Athens. It was in the area of the Fix beer factory. He went to Athens by bus. Fortunately, the fare for soldiers was free at that time. He didn't know the area or the route. During the trip, he noticed quite a few large churches as well as some little chapels by the roadside or close to it. There were also some shrines. He became perplexed and dismayed. It's a shame to pass in front of all these churches and not venerate the saints. The next day, he got off at the first church he had spotted from the bus window. He venerated the icons in the church and then got on the next bus. A little further, he got off again. Little by little, however, he discovered so many churches, little chapels and shrines in the area that he just couldn't both venerate them and use the bus. So he decided to set off very early in the morning 
from Piraeus on foot in order to be able to visit all the churches. He arrived at Zoe's house very tired, but in the meantime he had venerated all the male and female saints. Well, that was enough for him. Fatigue would go away. Of course, so much daily walking left its marks on him. This was to become evident later when, as a monk, he took up even more difficult bodily and spiritual exercises. There, at Zoe's house, he also found the opportunity to read ecclesiastical and religious books a little. On rare occasions, he also had to read church prayers. At that time, his aunt, Savasti, his mother's sister, worked as a housekeeper for a judge. He was a good man, but he had been seduced by another woman, and his family was very troubled. The demon had turned them upside down. Yakovos's aunt called up her nephew one day and told him, Come over, my Yakovos, read a prayer for those good people. I'm very sad for the lady of the house. Yakovos went to the judge's house with his prayer book, or rather, pages thereof, read some prayers, adding also some impromptu prayers of his own, and departed. In the afternoon, when the judge's wife laid down for a while, she saw, while half asleep, a horrible-looking black dog going out of her house, frustrated, and saying, that puny one chased me away. The family got rid of the demon, and the judge returned to his wife. Such things happened to other people as well. The Zoe's couple were sure about the spiritual gifts of soldier Father Yakovos. They loved him and appreciated him so much that they made several proposals to him to stay with them. A few months before Yakovos was discharged from the army. In the beginning of 1949, the Zoe's couple had no children of their own. They offered him a place with them if he was agreeable. Zoe's promised to build a chapel for him on his estate in the Athens suburb of Neon Herklion. He also promised to arrange for him to be ordained a priest in the nearby church of St. Pentelaemon. Yakovos expressed his gratitude in every way he could for these offers of Zoe's, but his reply was always, I have a different destiny, Sir Lieutenant Major. Of course, he did not lie. Since the time he was a little child, he desired to join a monastery from the depths of his soul, and sometimes he openly said, I'll become a monk. Working for his sister Anastasia. In 1949, the year he was discharged from the army, his father, the good and kindly Stavros Stalikis, passed away. He had migrated to Levisi from Rhodes at a young age to work there temporarily with his father for a better life. Indeed, they succeeded, but the young Turks tore down everything. Now he passed away disappointed with the world, but full of faith in God. He died in a squalid hospital in Athens. He was unaware that he had a heart problem. One night, some scoundrels scared him, and he died from shock. He was taken to Athens, where he died on February 9, 1949, before Yakovos and his other son, George, were discharged from the army. His daughter, Anastasia, was left alone in the village, but she had Yakovos as her protector. Yakovos returned to the village. Poverty and the Civil War disasters were still patently evident. He had to help his sister get married. He had promised this to his mother on the day she fell asleep. Of course, there was also the elder brother, George, but he had his own obligations by that time having made a family in Athens. So Yakovos put himself to work with his whole heart. He worked anywhere as long as he could make some money. He worked in the fields, in a factory, in Manturi Evia, at a brick factory in Athens, and in some magnesite mines in the area. For the latter, he got up very early in the morning together with the other villagers. In winter, it was still very dark, and they carried a lamp to help them see their way. On the way, he did not talk much, but some opportunities arose for him to tell others about something of the church, the saints, and the faith. They did not pay much attention, but considered it very natural anyway for Yakovos to talk to them like that. One day on their way back, Yakovos found a human skull in a ditch, the good things of the Civil War. He picked up the skull 
washed it, and made everyone stay there while he chanted the funeral service for the unfortunate man. Only after they buried it did they continue on their way back to the village. Father Yakovos was at peace, having fulfilled his duty toward his fellow man. Protector of the Churches and the People When Yakovos returned to the village after his discharge from the army, he had one more job to do. He had to take care of the village church, the chapels, and the icon stands that had been neglected for two and a half years while he was away. No matter where he worked, he always found time to do something for the homes of the saints, the holy churches. Papa Dimitris had grown very old by then, and Yakovos had to help him more and more. The people were aware of this, so they asked Yakovos for everything. Once in 1950, they asked him to read a prayer for a possessed woman. He refused, saying that he was not a priest. The relatives of the sick person insisted, and he was forced to go to the church, read a prayer, and pray his own prayers. While he was reading, he saw the demon saying to the sick person, Just come out, and I'll fix you well. I can't go in there now because of him. As soon as the woman went out of the church, she fell on the ground and the demon came out of her in the form of a goat. The moment Yakovos caught sight of Papa Dimitri approaching on horseback from the nearby village, he ran to help him dismount, kissed his rasso, reverently bringing his stole up to touch his forehead. He then said with longing, Ah, Father, will God ever make me worthy? He didn't dare complete the phrase, not even in thought, because it was about becoming a priest. He had a very deep respect for priests, even until the time he fell asleep. Indeed, his respect was so great that he devised a thousand and one ways to kiss the hand of the priests and deacons who went to him for confession. After he later became a priest himself, he considered it as a special blessing. The blessed elder even got to the point when going to confession himself of kissing the shoes and feet of his confessor priest. During confession, he knelt, and when the forgiveness prayer was read to him, he fell prostrate. His confessors felt very awkward with his extreme humility. By the time Papa Dimitris arrived, Yakovos always had the church ready for service. He also chanted for many hours. His voice had matured very much, and it resounded with much depth and devout solemnity. He didn't know music, but his simple delivery and the unmatched tone of his voice was a pure delight. When I asked some villagers about Father Yakovos' voice at that time, I was impressed when they said, Oh, very good, like ten people chanting together, it fills the whole church. Indeed, his voice without being thunderous, filled a church with sublime devoutness, even to the very day of his falling asleep. He was chanting in the morning and in the afternoon on that day, November 21st, 1991. On great feast days, and especially during Holy Week, he stayed in the church continuously. He kept vigils, chanted or read alone, standing at the lectern or sitting down cross-legged, with a small candle burning in front of him. He remained like that until morning when he rang the bell for the people to come to church. He rarely gave in to sleep during his vigils. Even since that time, Yakovos had become a formidable man of violence. This man who was compassionate toward the weaknesses of the people, who even said thanks to little children when they made fun of him, who did not complain when women took his turn at the fountain, this moonstruck one, as considered by many, fought like a lion against the flesh and its passions, against ungodly thoughts and the demons. He hid within himself an intense fighting spirit capable of smashing rocks and bending iron bars. This is why the people around him, priests, chanters, simple faithful, could not understand him. He was striving far beyond any measure. His jump was very high. His pole, made of strong will and divine power, vaulted him to great heights. People could not see him up there. This is also why many could not tolerate him. They could only accept the good he did for them. 
Whenever something bad happened to them, they forgot they had a priest and ran to Father Jacobus, who read a church prayer over them or prayed his own prayers. After all, Papa Dimitris had grown old, had Parkinson's disease, and other health problems. His condition became so bad that it became dangerous for him to distribute Holy Communion to the people. His hands, they trembled so much. One time he called for Jacobus to hold the divine cup, who, shuddering from divine fear, gave Holy Communion to the people himself. Everyone, they considered it natural for Jacobus to do this, since he alone had fear of God in everything he did. Around this same time, he was all almost forced to perform the sacrament of holy baptism. A family had called Papa Dimitri and another priest, Papa Kostas, to baptize their baby boy. The former priest could not see and trembled a lot, while the latter was deaf, could hardly see. They forced Yaakovos to read the exorcisms, conduct the baptismal service, recite the prayers, and baptize the child in the holy font. The two priests occasionally repeated some words. Everything else was done by Yaakovos. End of part two. Part three. At the monastery of St. David, God finally granted that his afflictions outside the monastery come to an end. His sister, Anastasia, got married. So in November of 1951, he set out for the monastery of St. David the Elder in Evia. This monastery, founded in the 16th century by St. David the Elder, is situated much higher than the seaside village of Roviz, high up on the massive wooden mountain of Zeros. It is situated at an altitude of 500 meters with the mountain peak of Cavallaris to the south and a big ravine to the north, above which is the small village of Drimonas. Since he was a child, Yakovos had been hearing about this monastery and St. David. The whole region from Mantudi to Epidos had St. David as its patron saint. On his feast day, November 1st, everyone came on foot to visit the monastery, light a candle and pray. The Levisian refugees learned from the locals to do the same. Of course, from time to time, Yakovos also thought of the Holy Sepulchre and Jerusalem. This was, however, something distant and infeasible for him. Being poor, he couldn't afford to visit the Holy Land. He always remembered the things his mother used to relate to him about his ancestors, Demetrios and Elias, who had become monks there, guards, moreover, of the Holy Sepulchre. But for more than ten years now, he only had St. David in his mind. He set out from Farakla early in the morning, up to Lemni, the condition of the road was bearable. From then on, it was only scraggy paths. He arrived before noon. As he was approaching, he was filled with hopelessness and grief. Sheep and goats were scattered in front of the gate and around the monastery. Utter abandonment and indifference. Shepherds ruled the place inside and out. Some of them even slept with their families inside the monastery in some squalid cells. Everything was in disarray. The cells had been used in the past by the guerrillas as a hospital, but had been neglected ever since. The three monks who lived there seemed to have accepted the wretched decline of the monastery. They lived idiorhythmically. Each one cared for himself, for his own food, cared for his own clothing. As for the services, the situation was hopeless. Only old Euthymios was aware of his profession. The other two monks, Anthemos and Makarios didn't care at all. In fact, the latter two monks, along with the shepherds and some others, tried to intimidate Yakovos. Everyone was rude to him and mistreated him. Certainly, Yakovos was not after luxuries, but he was put up in a miserable cell with holes in the roof, a broken door, and bedsheets that were torn to pieces. They spoke to him rudely, did not give him any food, and were blunt. Go away! The new abbot, Nicodemus, who had just taken over governing, couldn't do much as he resided permanently in Lemni, where he served as a parish priest. So one winter day, when his sister had come to see him, he was almost persuaded by her to return to their village. She wanted, of course, to have her brother nearby, and suggested that he live as a monk in their home or somewhere in the vicinity. 
Yaakovos listened to all this and considered everything, but it did not sit well with him. The house in the village made him squirm. It stifled him. On the other hand, the monastery had been turned into a den of unscrupulous men who were driving him away, only so that they wouldn't kill him. There was no solution for Yaakovos, but he had to find one. He returned to his village for a few days, knowing well that he had to find a solution. Otherwise, what was the meaning of the calling that God had planted in his heart? That calling to become a monk was so certain and so deep that he had to do it no matter what. He had to choose between the cell in the house which stifled him or the squalid monastery where he might be killed. He prayed for many nights and endless hours, making thousands of prostrations. He fasted beyond human measure. For a whole week he didn't even eat a piece of bread. He slept on the ground as he used to do in the past. Many times he also kept vigil in the chapel of St. Perskevi. At last he made the heroic decision that defied all reason. It didn't matter if the monastery was a den of unscrupulous men. It didn't matter if it was a hellish place. I have to go there, he thought. This is where God wants me to be. By his patience, he defeats Satan. Before dawn and without telling anyone, he set out on foot for St. David's Monastery, arriving before noon. He knocked on the gate and an unknown monk opened it to him. He went into the church, venerated the icons, and stayed there for a while. He lifted up his eyes to the icon of St. David, and for a moment he was taken aback. Looking more carefully, he became almost certain. The unknown man who had opened the gate for him about an hour ago was exactly the same face as that of St. David, as depicted on his icon. It was a sign that St. David himself was calling him to become a monk in his monastery and to serve him there. Yaakovos recognized the sign and promised the saint that he would remain in the monastery no matter what might happen, no matter what he might have to suffer. To be sure, many things did happen and he suffered. He had patience, however, and God rewarded him abundantly. Assigned to a run-down cell above where the monastery fountain is today, Yaakovo suffered from the cold, heat, and the lack of basic necessities. Yet he could bear it all. There was something, however, that this very poor but always immaculate man could not bear. The filth, the fleas, the lice. The whole place was infested due to overall neglect and the fact that shepherds used the ground floor rooms as a stable for their sheep and goats at night. Yaakovos worked hard to clean his cell and the surrounding cells. Difficult as it was, he succeeded. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for his relations with the monk Antimos and the shepherds. They declared war on him. With Yaakovos present, yet under Nicodemus, could finally show a monastery that functioned, that services were being held. In the past, there was rarely even a Sunday divine liturgy, and that there was someone chanting. Since services were now being held, at least with Yaakovos and Euthymios, the shepherds had to go. Nicodemus was finally able to insist on it. Antimos and the shepherds knew well who was behind all this, who had disrupted the wretched rhythm of the monastery. They made Yaakovo suffer like a martyr. They cursed him, mocked him, threw filthy things at him, and incited others to threaten his life. The beginning of September, seeing that Yaakovo endured everything, they couldn't take it any longer and went wild. Without thinking much, they went so far as to plot a crime. They found a young shepherd, it gave him a knife, and ordered him to take care of Yaakovo in secret. Fortunately, the shepherd repented and didn't follow through with it. Yaakovos escaped death while the young shepherd escaped eternal punishment. This failure, it brought a, a temporary respite. Things calmed down a little. This was necessary for the monastery to establish some order. Yaakovos ran in all directions, inside and outside the monastery, and was never seen sitting down to rest. Soon, however, Anthemos reverted to his old self. He contrived various ways to ridicule novice Yaakovos. The poor novice protested, but all he said was, 
I feel sorry for you, Father Antimos. I feel sorry for you. You don't care about the harm you may do to a 32-year-old man. Where is your soul going to end up? But Antimos didn't pay any attention. Even inside the church, he mocked Yakovos, while the latter stayed on to continue the service with old Ephthemios. The monastery was at that time very impoverished. No one visited it, not even to light a candle. The faithful visited only on the feast days of the Transfiguration and of St. David. The rest of the time, the monastery remained impoverished and miserable, both materially and spiritually. Many roof tiles were broken, and most of the roofs were sagging. The fences had fallen over. During the occupation, Germans came to the monastery in order to burn it down in reprisal for being used by the guerrillas. Monk Ephthemios stepped forward and said, Here, kill me, and leave the monastery alone. Now, the Germans admired the devotion and heroism of the monk, and thus the monastery was spared. Each monk grew his own garden vegetables, using a little water that gathered in a cistern. That is, each monk grew his own tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, and other vegetables, keeping some for himself and selling the rest to villagers in the area. Thus, with the little money that they made, they bought clothing, shoes, or provisions for the winter. The monastery only provided them with olive oil, soap, a little wheat, and some legumes. Separated in this way, of course, no communal life could exist. The Cenobitic life was not possible. The previous year, a decision was made for the monastery to convert into a Cenobitic one, but it stayed on paper, especially since Yeranda Nicodemus lived in Limni and came to the monastery only on occasion. Monk and Steward Through Yakovos' presence, the course of things changed. Nicodemus realized quite rightly that a new era was beginning with the new novice. Therefore, he tonsured him a monk after only a short time. Besides, Yakovos' obedience was exemplary. The tonsuring took place on November 30th in the evening. Beginning the very next day, Nicodemus made him steward of the monastery and entrusted him with every responsibility. He gave him the keys to the storehouse, the main gate, the monastery library, everything, because he was convinced of Yakovos' devotion and virtue, but also because he realized that Yakovos was the only person capable of bearing such responsibilities. Seeing all this, Anthemos and his collaborators became furious. They directed all kinds of bad words and insults at Yakovos, as soon as, of course, Nicodemus left for Limni. The abbot, although not very educated, he was a capable man. He presented himself well to the faithful and delivered good sermons at his parish in Limni. However, he did not reside at the monastery to care for it and attract the people. Fortunately, he did love the monastery, and from afar he did whatever he could for its renovation. His greatest contribution, however, was assigning everything to monk Yakovos and having complete trust in him. The new monk Yakovos was impeccable in his duties. The more the others insulted him, the more kindly and humbly he behaved. He talked to them and he gave them whatever the abbot directed, as if they never said a bad word to him. He set the monastery's life in order as much as he could. Ephthemios tried to follow. Makarios was lazy and easily carried over by Anthemos, who always reacted against everything and anything Yakovos did. He was especially enraged by Yakovos' piety, his character, and persistence to do all of the services, even if he did them alone. When, from time to time, the Yeronda came to the monastery, the two wrong-headed monks slandered Yakovos, using every possible means. They lied that he was not giving them the correct amounts and that he behaved arrogantly. Most things, they happened while the Yerondos was away. Antimos' attacks against Yakovos were countless, never ceased. It seemed as though God had given permission to Satan to pester Yakovos in order to show him off as a champion of obedience and humility. Indeed, he was shown off as a champion, but the contest it left him with many scars. Poor Yakovos was inflicted with many infirmities and sores. However, 
These only affected his body. Nothing touched his soul. Nothing harmed his spirit. And this, Satan utterly failed. He was completely destroyed by Yaakovos' obedience and humility. Priest of the Most High God The monastery did not have a priest to serve liturgies regularly. Nicodemus informed the kindly metropolitan of Halkida, Gregory, about the new monk and his virtues, and it was decided that he should be ordained. Yaakovos heard it with longing, but also with much fear. His soul was crying for the priesthood, crying out of desire, but also out of fear. He always wanted to embrace the priesthood and die for it, but now that that time had come, he was seized with fear and panic. On December 17th, he went down to Halkida. The Metropolitan ordained him a deacon the very next day in St. Barbara's Chapel. He called him over the previous evening, explained to him, Come, my child, Yakovos, you have not had much of an education, but you are pious, and that's why I will ordain you. So on the 19th, he ordained him a priest. At the conclusion of the service, Bishop Gregory addressed some words to the few people present. In mysterious words, he spoke to them about the saints of the church. He also spoke about the virtues of the new priest who was standing there the entire time with his head down. Moreover, he said the following prophetic words to Yaakovos. And you, my child, you will be sanctified. Keep up the struggle with God's help and the church will declare you a saint. It seemed that these awesome words went over everybody's head. No one seemed to realize what old Bishop Gregory was saying, but he knew what he was talking about. He knew what the Holy Spirit had put into his mouth to say. The new priest did the dismissal prayers and distributed the Andideron. The first to receive was his sister Anastasia, just as their mother had foretold on her deathbed. Afterwards, the Metropolitan asked Yakovos to do the blessing of the water service in his house and in his sister's house. Now, Yakovos, he hesitated, he was embarrassed, but he was obedient and blessed the water for his bishop. That same day, he departed for the monastery of his repentance, despite its miserable state. He was never to desert it. After his return to the monastery, he served liturgy almost daily. He did all the services, vespers, compline, midnight hours, matins, divine liturgy, usually alone or accompanied by kindly monk Ephemios. On Sundays, at the bishop's directive, he had to serve liturgy in the small villages of Damnia, Pelahoria, Kalamuria, Drymonas. All of this was good and God-pleasing, but it was also an assault against Satan. When the latter saw frequent liturgies being served in the monastery, he went wild. Anthemos and his friends worked harder. The more Yaakov strove to tame them, the wilder they became. The new priest found himself encircled by a thousand temptations in the middle of the winter. He did not even have a decent cell to shelter him from the rain and the snow. His cell was the worst of all, even though he was the steward and priest of the monastery. There were holes in the floor, and just below it, the goat stable. He only slept a little, but even that was dangerous. When it snowed a lot for the first time, he woke from his short sleep and found his back covered. It was windy and snow came in through a crevasse. Out of asceticism, he didn't always light a fire. He didn't have proper winter shoes either. Lieutenant Major Zoe's wife had sent him some old military boots, but he wore them out from continuous use. Father Yakovos replaced the soles with rubber from old car tires. On Sunday mornings, the situation was unbearable. Before dawn, whether it in the rain, frost, or knee-deep snow, he had to take his mule, Haido, and go serve liturgy in some nearby village. In the monastery, he wore whatever rags he found, but he had to look decent when he made visits. His decent clothes, however, were lightweight. He did not have 
any good thick clothes to put on, so he shivered all over and was constantly ill. Well, Zoisa's wife learned about it and sent him her husband's old military mantle, which was dyed black and turned into a kind of rasso for him. So he had a little protection. He could more or less endure all this. It was the other temptations that made things more difficult. New Ascetic Struggles in the beginning of 1953, after the snow had thawed, he went to look for the hermitage of St. David. He found it with indescribable joy. Deep within his heart, he desired to imitate St. David, at least to the degree he was able to, of course. Father Yakovos thought to himself, Say, the saint lived for so many years in this little cave in solitude and among the wild animals, and I don't even visit. Still, I'll find peace from temptations in the monastery, and I expect to make progress in obedience and humility. Well, from beginning from the first months of 1953, he increased his asceticism. The weaker the will of the flesh grew through his asceticism, the easier it became for him to progress in obedience and humility. He also noticed that the more he acquired these virtues, the more his mind and heart opened to God. Father Yakovos had never read any of the profound niptic works of the Church Fathers. He didn't even know the Philokalia. He did, however, pay very close attention to what was written in, in the liturgical books. As the years went by, he understood more without having to study ancient Greek. He drank from the streams of the Perlactic per Key, the Triodion, and the Pentecosterion. He especially liked the latter. The triumphal joy of the resurrectional hymns penetrated deep into his heart. There were times that he felt like flying. His heart overflowed so much with joy that he felt so light, ready to soar up above. Up until that time he fell asleep, he often repeated, My heart feels like a garden. Father, I feel glad. Do you see, Father, now that you've gone to confession? how much joy, how much gladness you have. I always feel like that. The coming of Great Lent found him doing many more chores and monastery duties. No one else worked. No one else cared about a thing. He had to be everywhere, in the garden with the animals, at the cistern, for cleaning, for firewood, everything. In addition, he did all of the church services. Only kindly Ephemios followed him. In addition, while the Yerondo was away, Yakovos had to attend any visitors that happened to come by. Nevertheless, all this work didn't hinder him at all from his asceticism. He fasted strictly for three days, abstaining completely from every kind of food, even water, and then continued with eating only dry foods. He soaked lentils and broad beans and ate them with a little bread and water. This was his food. At night he had other struggles, a different kind of asceticism. After Compline, he worked for several hours and then went to his cell. It was, in fact, an arena where Satan wrestled with the man of God. The young refugee's only weapon was his humility. Yakovos fought against Satan and defeated him because he loved God very much. In his cell, there was a wooden bed on top of which he had placed a patchwork quilt, but he did not sleep on it. He had read about ascetics sleeping on the ground, and he imitated them. In the evenings, a candle always burned in his cell. He placed the candle in front of him, in the center of his cell, put on his stole, knelt, and began to read. He usually read supplicatory canons always those of the Theotokos, St. David, and the Saint of the Day, and others when he could. Then he read from the Psalter. He read it throughout the night, every night. He also made prostrations night and day. He always exceeded 1,000, sometimes even more than 3,000, depending on the day, the time, the temptations. During the night, in the candlelight, he lived the most ecstatic and sweetest experiences a human being can ever live. The demons fought him fiercely. They tried everything to draw his mind and heart away from the Lord. Sometimes they succeeded. They often came into the cell and disturbed it with shouts, noises, and wild faces. 
Terrified, Yakovos raised the wooden cross in front of him, and by God's grace, the demons left. However, the athlete did receive his reward. There were nights when, while he kept vigil and entreated God to free him from bad thoughts and fill him with his love, he felt a refreshing and sweet breeze inside of him, which calmed him and brought him indescribable peace. He was thoroughly imbued by a delight that only God can give. It was something from the blessed heavenly kingdom. When he experienced these things, he was 33, the Lord's age. The blessed elder spoke very little about such experiences, but at times he did reveal something about them to others. The Poverty of the Monastery In March, after the snow thawed, he had to prepare the garden. The older monks could not get used to the Cenobitic life. They each had their own garden and cooked for themselves. Father Yakovos only cooked a few times, since he ate very little anyhow and didn't know much about cooking either. His only food was some greens and legumes. He systematically avoided tasty food. He never ate butter, sweets, pasta, puddings, desserts, and the like. One time during a fasting period in his last years, he was brought some oats to eat. As he had a stomach ache and had to take medication for his other infirmities, but he didn't want to eat it, excusing himself, saying, Did our saints eat such nice things? Rarely on a Sunday did he eat chicken soup. If pressed, he might put a tiny bit of meat in his mouth, out of consideration for the others who were eating with him. In the garden, which he prepared with care and love, he planted tomatoes, eggplant, okra, peppers, as well as onions and potatoes. These were not just for his own use. He sold them very cheap at half price to the villagers and the shepherds and gave the little money he received to Yerunda the Nakodamas every last penny. Yerunda was puzzled about how Yakovos could bring him money while he didn't have adequate clothes and shoes to wear or spare money to buy other necessities. At night or while Father Yakovos was away, some villagers went to steal his tomatoes, his onions, his okra, and his other vegetables. He occasionally caught them, but instead of punish, punishing or accusing them, he only asked them to leave a little for him and not to take it all. Yerunda Nakodamus used the money for the monastery's needs. During the occupation and the civil war, the monastery was stripped of everything. Not only did it lack such things as bed coverings and basic furniture, but even utensils. When a visitor came, they had to search around the cells to find a chair or even a fork. In such a plight did the blessed elder find the monastery. So it was not strange at all that Nicodemus, as Yerunda an elder, commanded that Yakovos not give out anything from the monastery's belongings, not the smallest thing, neither to a foreigner nor to a relative. All the more so because in the past Father Yakovos' brother-in-law, his sister Anastasia's husband, was employed at the monastery for a time and was a good worker. Nicodemus feared that Yakovos might give out some of the monastery's olive oil and stressed to him, The olive oil is for the saints, for their oil lamps, the candiles, not for Mr. So-and-so. Yakovos obeyed this command of the Yerunda very strictly. He had to acquire perfect obedience, but at times obeying this command it caused him great pain. St. David's Hermitage Yakovos had already discovered St. David's Hermitage. He yearned to live there ascetically, but no other monk could take care of the monastery. If he were to leave, it would certainly fall apart. One morning in the summer of 1953, he set out once more for the hermitage. He went out from the southern gate of the monastery and turned right. He followed the path along the water trench that comes down from the monastery's cistern, on the eastern side of the wooded peak of Mount Zeros, known as Cavalleries. This path is very beautiful, both in summer and in the winter. Before reaching the cistern, he turned right and went up through a dense forest of plains, pines, and fir trees, until he came to the big chestnut tree. Without pausing to take a breath, he turned onto the main road and continued up toward the narrow ridge where a wooden cross stands today. He stood on the ridge and gazed back at the monastery. 
The view of the mountains and the sea across from them was beautiful, very beautiful. He had no time, though. He continued on downhill, passed over the gully, and left the main road for a path on the left that goes towards Litavadaki. Excuse me. This was a fairly wide and mild area where there were some fields that belonged to the monastery. He continued further up to the right, and in a short while reached the little sheet. Now he could not help but pause from the impression it made on him. The, quote, little sheet is a precipitous cliff, 150 to 180 meters high, directly across from the hermitage, about 200 meters lower. He felt like climbing it. Tradition has that St. David used to go to the top of the cliff, spread out a small sheet that his mother had given him, kneel on it, and pray for his birthplace, Locris. The view from there is truly captivating. Directly forward and below are wooded hillsides, thickets, and mountain peaks. Then the eye makes its way down to the dark blue waters of the Evokios Gulf. After taking in the endless flatness of the sea, the eye rises up to the land of Locris, over to the villages of Arquitza and Livavantes, St. David's homeland. Excuse the mispronunciations. Father Yakovos remained there only for a few minutes, aware of the temptation of turning romantic from the beauty of the place and neglecting his asceticism. He went down quickly and took the path to the hermitage. A strange rock was there, actually two rocks, one that had fallen on top of the other, leaving a large cleft in between with some open space to the northwest. It was inside this cleft where St. David had made his hermitage. Father Yakovos, he fell on his knees, lit a candle, and prayed for a long time. However, he had to be back for Vespers. So he crossed himself, asked for the saint's help, and returned almost a two-mile walk. In the monastery, everything was progressing. Unfortunately, everything the good things through Father Yakovos's prayer and personal labors, but also the problems caused by the non-monastic monks. In the fall, the temptations and attacks from the devil grew stronger. Satan was enraged by the humility and steadfastness of Yakovos. The demonic monster was determined to devour the holy monster of humility, Yakovos. Poor Yakovos overcame insurmountable difficulties. As if it were not enough for the other monks to insult and slander him in the presence of others, they also slandered him in the presence of Abbot Nicodemus whenever he visited the monastery. The Yerunda trusted Yakovos but was often misled and chastised him severely. Anthemos and Makarios accused Yakovos insidiously, but he did not want to explain himself in detail every time how things really were. So he immediately asked for forgiveness, even though he was not to blame at all. In order to overcome temptations and also to honor St. David, he decided to go pray in his hermitage at night, at least whenever it was not raining or snowing. He decided to set out after Vespers, after the other monks had retired to their cells. He was in charge of the keys. No one was going to get in or out. He took his small staff, locked the gates of the monastery, and exited from the southern gate. He did not have a lantern torch, as he used to call it. Too much poverty. He followed along the path that follows the ditch, trying to make it to the chestnut tree. It was a moonless night and difficult to find the path. He fell down and got up many times. He had a very difficult time. He finally made it to the main road, which was easier, but when he got turned to the right on the second path, he got lost. He got tangled up in some bushes and was pierced and scratched. He was lost in the gorge. As he used to say, he was timid by nature. Now in the dark of the night, he was very scared. He prayed, My God, light my path so I can make it home to the hermitage. He himself recounted these nightly adventures and continued, The good God answered my request. From the many stars in the heavens, he gave me one too. The star went in front of me and it lit my way. I followed it. This is how I made it to the hermitage. I prayed there, and when I took the way back, the star was in front of me again, lighting my way up to the monastery gate. 
The fathers were asleep and didn't see it. His nightly trip was tormenting, but there was also something grace-filled about it. The star didn't always appear to guide him. It appeared only when it was absolutely necessary, that is, when he was lost in the forest and gullies and could not find the path. It was difficult to walk through that area in those days since the forest was much denser than it is now and the paths were hardly trodden. But even today, if one attempts to go to the hermitage at night, he is not going to find it. Father Yakovos approached the hermitage in fear. How could he enter the desolate cave and stay there, alone, throughout the night? Therefore, before going in, he asked one more favor from St. David. St. David, if you want to, come and pray with me, but do come as someone familiar, so that I won't be frightened. As he entered the cave, he felt Yeranda Nicodemus next to him. He lit two candles. They knelt down and read supplicatory canons. They knelt down and read more supplicatory canons. They also read the whole Psalter, prayed with the Comboschini and the prayer rope, and at dawn they got up. He felt Nicodemus going out first and disappearing. It was St. David who had accompanied him in the form of Nicodemus so that he would not be frightened. Yakovos made it back to the monastery in time for the morning service. He threw some water on his face and rang the bell. The service lasted till late morning. He also served liturgy three or four days during the week as well. The non-monastic monks got up at that time for breakfast, whereas he immediately got to work, taking care of many monastery chores without taking any time to rest. In addition, when he had to battle against many and difficult temptations, he ate absolutely nothing, living on Holy Communion and on Diderot, following exactly what St. David, his model and protector, did for many years. He only ate a simple meal on Saturday at noon, but not always, and on Sundays. Only God knows how he endured fasting so strictly while doing so much manual labor. But he surely knew and rewarded him well. You see, he wanted his Yakovos to be a first-class athlete. Even more than that, he wanted him to be a champion. This is why he allowed Satan to tempt his beloved Yakovos so much, while at the same time giving him great strength to resist. In other words, he gave him much love for God. Yakovos continued to visit the hermitage except when it was raining or snowing. When there was moonlight, he could find the path. Otherwise, the star which God had given him came down and guided him. Everything was going well, but the devil opposed it very much. One night in the hermitage, demons appeared to him in the form of a thousand scorpions. Yakovos was sitting cross-legged on the ground, reading devoutly with a lit candle in front of him. After the supplicatory canons, he, he took up the psalter. That night his prayer was coming out very different. He then started the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He felt internal refreshment and joy. At that very moment, the attack came. The cave filled with thousands of scorpions. They were in front of him, behind him, everywhere he looked. He looked up and saw more of them hanging down from the cliff like clusters of grapes. Yakovos was frightened, and he froze, but only for a few moments. They are demons, he thought. Immediately he felt a strange power surging up in him, and he commanded them, That's enough. Stay where you are. Don't move any closer. He picked up a small stone and marked a circle around himself. He went on fearlessly, continuing to pray until dawn. Not one scorpion crossed inside that circle. Now he was even commanding the demons. This was a sign that the kingdom of God had come within him, to a limited extent, of course, but the great miracle had happened. God gave him the power, that is, he had given him the grace, divine power, the energies of God to use on different occasions and in different capacities. This is what happens with the saints. 
divine experiences at the hermitage. He worked to the point of exhaustion every day, digging, sweeping, chopping wood with the big axe, washing. He had to do everything himself. There was no one to take pity on him, no one to help him. Moreover, the abbot wanted everything in perfect order when he came to the monastery. Despite everything, Yakovos was not discouraged. He worked as a superman, fasted as an angel, and obeyed like a vile servant. At night, even though he was half dead from fatigue, he locked up the monastery and took the path to the hermitage. He ascended with much toil, as though it were Golgotha. One time in the fall of 1954, as he was going up, a horrible black dog attacked him. It was fierce and vicious. There was moonlight, and he could clearly see it. By its fierceness, he immediately understood that it was a demon. It had taken that form to prevent him from praying. He took out his wooden cross and held it out to the dog. It vanished immediately. Further up, he heard loud noises around him, horribly howling and other such noises, all Satan's tricks. He arrived at the hermitage and began to read supplicatory canons. Time passed. The first candle was consumed. He lit a second one, and later another. He read the entire Psalter, and he started the Jesus prayer with the prayer rope. But he could not go on. There, on his knees, he fell asleep for a while. In his sleep, he saw St. David in the form of Nicodemus, who told him kindly and discreetly, Relax a little. You're tired. Rest for a while. He opened his eyes and saw someone going out of the hermitage. He was back at the monastery before dawn, filled with joy that his saint had supported him. He was very happy that St. David was not angry with him for falling asleep, even if it was only for a short while. The saint, what a great heart he has, he thought. How much greater then must our Lord's heart be? Who am I to dare ask for mercy anyhow? I am vile. I pollute the air. I grieve both the saint and my Lord. What can I possibly say on the day of judgment? What account shall I give? The elder said such things until the time he fell asleep. This man who commanded Satan and made demands from St. David and St. John the Russian by asking them to perform this or that good work used to say such things. It was Sunday morning. He opened the monastery gate and went in. The monks were sleeping. He rang the bell and served matins. Before sunrise, he was ready to go to the village to serve liturgy. He saddled the mule, put the service books in his woven bag, carefully folded his vestments, and set off. After liturgy, he also went to another village to perform a marriage service. When he finished and was about to take the way back to the monastery, a brawny shepherd met him and said, Let's go together, Father. Father Yakovos refused, as he did not see any reason for the young man to go out of his way. But he insisted, and so Father Yakovos gave in. On the way, they talked about several things. When they came to the gully, a little higher than the monastery, the young man stopped and said, Well, go on alone now, Father. Father Yakovos insisted on knowing the reason. Did the young man want to confess, or a priest, something? Neither. The young man only wanted to pr protect Father Yakovos. As he explained, he knew that some shepherds and villagers had planned to attack him, attack him, the monk who did not let them rule the monastery, the monk who, by serving liturgy every day, made the other monks furious. Their plan was to do this as he approached the gully where no one would see or hear them. With St. David's holy head. Not only did he revere St. David, he was extremely devoted to him and had complete confidence in him. When he was alone in the church, or thought he was alone, he took the holy relic of the saint's head, placed it on the ground, knelt or prostrated before it, and implored the saint with tears to give him humility and obedience. He also entreated him for the monastery, for the other monks, and for everyone who asked the saint's help. From time to time, when requested, Father Yakovos took St. David's holy relic and toured the villages of northern Evia, 
People streamed to venerate the saint. They also offered money, very little but very useful to the monastery. Father Yakovos kept absolutely nothing for himself. There were times when he had nothing more than a small potato to eat for the whole day. Sometimes, especially during winter, he ran out of bread. The only thing he could do was wait in case someone came from Limni to bring some. He didn't worry for himself. It was just another opportunity for him to fast more, but that he might be without something for those who visited the monastery in need. He put on his patched up shoes and the only decent rasso he had placed the holy head in a woven bag and went around the villages. He didn't even have an umbrella. They were too expensive then. A second rasso? Not even in his dreams. A good pair of shoes? Where could they be found? In 1955, in the beginning of spring, he set out on foot for two villages on a tour with St. David's Holy Relic. A five-hour walk. He knew the villages well since he had worked there as a layman with his father. Just as he was about to arrive, the weather turned bad. He had to outpace the storm that was approaching quickly, but he couldn't. The holy relic was in danger of getting wet. It would be a sacrilege. Also, how could he stand in front of the villagers dripping wet while they venerated it? He would definitely have to go to a house, take off his rasso and andiri, and be seen by the people. Something he considered shameful and degrading. The first drops came. The clouds were approaching from the south. He accelerated his pace as much as he could, holding the holy relic tightly in his arms. He spoke to it the way he knew. The rain got stronger, but he did not get wet at all. He walked quickly, hunched over the holy relic in his arms. It was a terrible downpour, as if the floodgates of heaven had opened, but not one drop fell within a meter around him. Truly, one meter in front, behind, to the right, and to the left. Both he and the holy relic arrived at the village and the church completely dry. The next day by afternoon he wanted to leave, but was held up by people who wanted to venerate the saint. On his way back he took a shortcut to save time, passing Damnia and heading upward. He arrived at the gully, or so he thought, somewhere below the monastery. It was pitch dark. He couldn't find the path and didn't know where he was going. As he held the holy relic tightly in his arms and said something to it, a small light appeared in front of him that led him back to the right path and up to the holy monastery. He often experienced such miraculous signs on his tours with St. David's head. One time the saint opened the monastery gate for him to show him his approval. It was evening when he was on his way back with the holy relic. As he approached the gate, monk Ephthymios opened it for him before he knocked. Father Yakovos bowed to him and went to the church to leave the holy relic. He then went up to Ephthymios' cell, but the latter was puzzled. He didn't even know that Father Yakovos was back, and of course he had not opened the gate. It was St. David who had opened it in the form of Ephthymios. It was very usual for the saint to appear in the form of another monk, and after all, Father Yakovos had asked it so that he wouldn't be frightened. He also took St. David's head to the saint's hometown, Livenantes. He went down to the seaside village of Roviz. He stood at one side behind some cliffs and away from the houses to avoid the shepherds and the farmers. As soon as he saw the boat arriving from Levanantes, he quickly went to the small pier and got on board. That year the area suffered from a long drought. The villagers in the boat who knew Father Yakovos pleaded for rain. Father Yakovos listened to them and then sat down in a corner. As the boat approached Levanantes, Father Yakovos held the woven bag with the holy head in his arms and said these very words to St. David. Quote, Old man, your fellow villagers are here because of the drought. Now when we arrive, I ask you to thunder. Don't embarrass me. They will ridicule you, and they will ridicule me too. As soon as they made it to the shore, it started to thunder. Thirty years later, Father Yakovus said, 
I, my brother, say such things into the saint's ears, and he connects a direct line with our Christ. That simple explanation contains, in fact, the theological wisdom of a thousand and one theologians. God alone has miraculous power, divine grace, and uncreated energies. However, he bestows it upon very elect human beings, his saints, who by loving him exceedingly and by cleansing themselves by means of every kind of ascetic labor, obtained the gift of boldness before God. That is, the saints have been given the privilege to ask God something from God, who obeys and fulfills their request. Satan's Attacks Satan tried every trick and temptation to lead Yaakovos astray, but always failed. Yaakovos constantly repeated, For your sake, my beloved Saint David, I will endure everything. He knew very well that Satan was behind it all, trying to chase him out of the monastery. He struggled to remain patient and humble, no matter what happened. He knew that patience and humility would save him, and not only that, he even felt that these virtues would give him a reputation one day. He used to say this in his last days as well. So Satan was left with no other option but to use a method that he employed quite often. He sent some demon underlings to harm Yaakovos physically. In October 1954, Abbot Nicodemus came to the monastery for two days. He gave his instructions saw what Yaakovos was accomplishing and departed in the morning after liturgy. Yaakovos immediately got to work. He cleaned the church thoroughly, since, as he said, Christ and St. David lived there. Then, sometime before 11 in the morning, he went up to the despotikon, uh, the, the good cell above the kitchen where Nicodemus slept whenever he visited the monastery. He entered the cell and began sweeping. He was very tired and also had strong back pain. As he passed by the bed, he thought of lying down to rest his back a little. Indeed, he did lie down. But as soon as he did, he saw, being fully awake, a horrible, fierce-looking demon with Mongolian features coming in through the door. Within an instant, he was attacked. Several other demons also entered after him. Yakovos he understood what was happening, but it was too late. He tried to make the sign of the cross, but the fierce, brawny demon struck him hard on the arm. He tried again, but was hit even more forcefully. In his agony, he attempted to call upon the Most Holy Theotokos, but as soon as the demons heard Panagia Theotokos, they punched him on the chin. They beat him and mocked him, all the while for his inability to react. They said menacingly, We were the ones who on that occasion did that. We were the ones who on that other occasion did that. We were the ones who grabbed you by the throat the other time and you couldn't read the gospel. They insulted and taunted him while beating him more on the arms, in the mouth, jaw, and chest. At some moment after re receiving a strong blow to his arm, he freed his hand and touched his forehead. He found just enough time to shout, Panagia Teotoke, and that was it. The demons vanished immediately. He was wounded all over, not able to move or even cry for help. He remained there for some time until rolling off the bed onto the ground. He crawled for a long time with great effort. He reached the stairs and tumbled down. When the other monks saw him, they were frightened and confused, not knowing what had happened, seeing him covered with bruises. Ephthemios helped him greatly by applying poultices and ointments. And Father Yakovos suffered for six whole months before he healed, and not completely. Up to the day he fell asleep, his jaws pained him. Pain whenever the weather changed, or whenever it was humid. Satan followed upon the same tactics several other times. A similar vicious attack took place in 1958. He was in the old museum where the cells of monks Paul and Ephraim are now. 
He was attacked first by a wild and horrible-looking, a giant black demon, and then by smaller ones. They pounded him on the face and arms so that he wouldn't make the sign of the cross or call upon the mother of God. They called him skin and bone and vowed never to leave him in peace. Two monks in the kitchen heard some of the noises and shouts, but they had no idea what was going on upstairs. Once again, Yakovos crawled out of the room and fainted. He laid there for a long time, half dead, before the other monks found him by accident. When he came to, he complained to them, You didn't come to help me. Didn't you hear anything? The demons almost finished me off. Father Yakovos received more poultices and therapeutic treatments. His bruises remained for months. A Great Test That same year, 1958, he suffered another great test. His beloved sister, Anastasia, who was poor and frail, had fallen ill and passed away. They had taken her from her village to Athens on a mule, and she never made it back, not even after she had died. Her death caused Father Yakovos immense pain and grief, as he was her natural brother. However, he transformed this painful event into a spiritual kiln, as it were, wherein he was strengthened spiritually. Despite his great love and having the abbot's permission, he imposed on himself that he would not visit her during her last days in the hospital or to go to her burial. He loved his sister very much, and it was on account of this love that he wanted the monastic virtue of renunciation of the world and relatives to dominate in him completely. As a monk, this occasion was a critical test to be completed, completely detached from his beloved family. He did desire the salvation of their souls very much and prayed constantly for this. He felt immense relief and consolation when God revealed to him that his sister Anastasia was resting joyfully in the abode of St. John the Russian. All this is wondrously described in reply the elder sent to his, his friend, Father Theodore Theodosiu, son of Father Demetrios, who used to come and serve liturgy in the village of Farakala and got to know little Yakovos. Because the content of the letter is characteristic of the way the elder thought and lived, and since it describes the revelations that he saw, we quote it in its entirety. Quote, Holy Monastery of the Elder, March 10th, 1958. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? My venerable and much beloved Father Theodore, I bow down before you and kiss your right hand with much devoutness and reverence. I received your holy letter and I thank you warmly for your consoling words, which soothed my grieving soul. I thank you for your prayers for my sister, and I too, my reverend father, send up entreaties for the ever-memorable Papa Dimitris, whom I had loved so much ever since I was a child. Father Theodore, as a human being, I grieved for my sister, but the blessed news is that humble Tassia was made worthy to find delight in the beloved abode of St. John the Russian. Father, it was revealed to me in a vision that my sister is in the heavenly abode of St. John the Russian. Father, I tremble all over writing this to you. She encountered no difficulty on the way up, nor in front of the judgment seat. God the Lord lives. St. David and St. John the Russian escorted her. I no longer grieve. She asked me not to weep any more, but instead to be glad that she was made worthy to enter the heavenly mansions. The Holy Fathers send their respects. May the grace of St. David always overshadow and strengthen you. My respects to Presbytera and, and Dimitraki, and especially to the Eurondisa. Father Theodore, the Christian, leaves the futility of the present life behind and enters into the heavenly harbor where no waves can trouble him and no shipwreck can occur. There are no enemies and persecutions there. No sorrows, pains, or afflictions can get in. He associates with friendly and exceptional people, enjoys beholding the face of the Savior closely, and lives among them in his eternal homeland 
in the most glorious house of his father. As human beings, to be sure, we become sad when one of our beloved departs from us. The Lord also wept for Lazarus. But I will be patient for the love of my Lord and of St. David. Please forgive my illiterate writing, but I know how much my revered father Theodore loves me and that he will not misunderstand me. I have tired you out, Father, but the faith is alive and everything is holy. With much love, devoutness, and reverence, I kiss your holy head with a holy kiss. Signed, the humble servant of the Lord, Jacobus. The Command of the Archangels In 1961, Abbot Nicodemus and priest monk Yakovos decided to build a chapel in honor of the holy archangels Michael and Gabriel. The abbot chose the spot, marked it off with pegs, and departed for Libni. The same night, a tall, blonde, handsome officer with a golden sword appeared to Father Yakovos and said to him, Father, I'm Archangel Michael. I don't want my church to be built where you place the markers. Put them where I show you. He picked up the markers and took them further. In the morning, Father Yakovos found the pegs moved. They were planning to build the chapel with mud and straw since it was all they could do. The following night, two officers with golden swords appeared to Father Yakovos and told him, We are Archangels Michael and Gabriel. Tell your abbot that we don't want our house built with mud and straw, but with sand, lime, and wood, and we want tiles on the roof. Such materials, though, were nowhere to be found up there on the mountain. No one had any money, and even if they did, there was no good road to transport them. When Father Yakovos asked the archangels about this, they answered him, Don't worry, Father, we'll take care of these things. It will rain at night, and the stream will bring down a lot of sand. The rest of the materials will be provided by pious Christians. Everything did turn out as was foretold with the wondrous assistance. I served together with saints and angels. In 1962, Elder Yakovos was visited by Father Theodore Theodosuyu. Excuse me. They knew each other since their adolescent years, and Father Yakovos could talk with him openly. He spoke to him about some of his afflictions, especially about Satan's attacks, and also about some of his holy experiences. He revealed to him what troubled him. How can I speak about these things, Father? Some say that I am not well mentally, that I am losing my mind. The other day two demons visited me, and one of them said to the other, Rip his hands off so he stops crossing himself. Not to mention the things that I see around the saint's head in the sanctuary. St. David is alive. They're surely going to say that something's wrong with me. And he went on relating, sometimes plainly and sometimes in minced words, the apparitions and interventions of St. David. At one point he even said, I'm distressed. Father Theodore, I suffer. I will leave this place. It's only for the saint that I stay. I came here as a refugee. I brought him nothing except my heart. Look at my condition. Blessed Elder Yakovos made this complaint about his condition, but from the beginning of the 1960s, two things had grown evident on his face, on his spiritual progress, which radiated, and the weakening of his bodily organism. These two, in fact, developed together at the same time. At night, he no longer wrestled with the demons, but with the saints and with God. Not that the attacks had ceased completely, but he had such an ardent love and devotion for God and the saints that he was filled, inundated with it completely. There was absolutely no room in his noose, in his mind and heart for temptation to set in. This love warmed and absorbed him so much that he forgot about his bodily weakness and his tremendous fatigue. He had been transformed into a completely spiritual being. He conversed with the saints. Angels flew around him. Gladness filled his whole being. There in the cell of that chosen vessel was a part of 
the blessed reign and kingdom of heaven that is in the heart and mind of Father Yakovos. One time a monk pressed him to reveal something about these experiences. In addition to the minced words and the allusions that he used on occasion, he said with humble joy, Tonight, my child, I served together with saints and angels in sanctuaries that cannot be described. His face was beaming. The monk asked naively, How can this be? The blessed elder said, Hey, beloved father, don't ask. These things they belong to the spiritual realm. However, the monk insisted, and the elder yielded on one condition. Beloved father, don't reveal anything. When I pass away, say, Hey, once some elder told me that he served liturgy at night, that he lived and served daily liturgy with the Holy Trinity. Do you see, father, what blessedness we monks have, and especially the hero monks, with all this, one can understand why he was not afraid of death. On the contrary, he waited for it every moment. Some were puzzled to hear him chanting the funeral service while he was doing some other work. To familiarize himself with death, he also used to, to lie on the ground, cross his hands, and recite the funeral service. Moreover, in order to help someone spiritually, he occasionally said, Come close, I have a little song to sing to you, and then proceeded to chant a hymn from the funeral service. Experiences During the Divine Liturgy Concerning his spiritual experiences in church during divine liturgy, they were wondrous. Many times while commemorating names, he perceived the spiritual condition of the deceased he was commemorating. One time he was seen through the half-closed door of the sanctuary standing before the altar without touching the ground. On that occasion he had forgotten to commemorate his mother and she appeared to him complaining, My Yakovaki, everyone got his gift today from you except me. The same happened to him with Bishop Macarius of Cyprus. After he finished the offertory and turned to move toward the holy altar, he saw him standing to the right with his palms cupped as when a priest is about to receive the Lord's body. He was meticulous in his commemorations and prayers for the departed. He commemorated a great multitude of persons, even monk Anthemios who had opposed him so much. He once asked God to reveal to him where Anthemos had gone after his death. And one night he saw him in a squalid, dark cellar, deeply distressed. He greeted him, and Anthemos told him, Here I am. When you commemorate me, a ray passes through, and I can see a little. He conducted everything simply and orderly. Many times during the Cherubic hymn, the blessed liturgist was not alone in the altar. Angels were present, glorifying God, gladdening the atmosphere, and helping the priest. He felt their wings touching him, and he could see their youthful faces. One time when he went out for the great entrance, a nun saw him moving in the air when he re-entered the sanctuary without touching the ground. She was amazed and crossed herself as she had not seen such a miracle before. At the end of the service, when the nun went to take his blessing, he told her ingeniously, Today the liturgy was different. She took courage and opened up, describing to him how she saw him during the great entrance. But the elder stopped her, saying that she should not reveal anything to anyone. Once, when he was explaining the deacon's duties to a new deacon to make him careful in his duties, he spoke to him about his experiences and visions with deep devoteness. Ah, Father, if you could see what is going on during the Cherubic hymn, when the priest reads the prayer, you would all run away. Angels go up and down invisibly, and many times I feel their wings hitting my shoulders. During the Divine Liturgy, and especially during the Cherubic Hymn and the Anaphora, he shined, radiating purity, blessedness, and majesty. Yes, this exhausted priest monk, who from 1960 on had always lived and worked with one infirmity or another, was able to move very stately, yet not provocatively. 
he exhibited a royal solemnity. It was apparent to everyone that his grandeur of his was due to the immeasurable reverence he had for the mystery of the divine Eucharist. Moreover, it was imposed on him naturally by the presence of official bystanders in the sanctuary, that is, angels, archangels, and saints. As he said many times, angels and archangels, my child, carry the Lord's body. Soon, all of this caused a radiance to emanate from Father Yakovus, at first slightly, but steadily. Wherever he went to serve divine liturgy in the small nearby villages, or when he toured with St. David's holy head, the villagers were unconsciously impressed. He transmitted something to them and inspired them with his particular way, even though he gave no sermons. His joyous face overflowing with pure love, his bright forehead, his eyes that embraced his fellow human being, and the caressing stateliness of his voice, all of these things made the people wonder. One had to be made out of stone or be completely callous in order not to feel that there was something different about this monk, and that different thing was nothing other than the divine, since he radiated love and brought peace around him. Indeed, when you sat by him, you felt peaceful, unconsciously, whether he spoke to you or not. He transmitted calmness, serenity, internal peace, a gift possessed only by the people of God, his chosen vessels, those who love him and serve him with devotion. Blessed Yaakov served God with absolute devotion. He served him fervently in the highest form of a service as a priest. There is nothing higher, nothing holier, nothing sweeter, and at the same time nothing more dreadful than the divine liturgy. Even if he got up with a fever or a cardiac arrhythmia, chest constriction, terrible phlebitis, he still served liturgy. In his last years especially, when he constantly lived with heart disease, and since 1986 with a pacemaker, he got up very early and took a long time before going to church in order to gain some strength. He pleaded with his St. David, not for his cure, but for his help to be able to stand on his feet and serve liturgy. Yes, all that he wanted was to serve liturgy. Once liturgy was over, let happen whatever God wills. Only let him serve liturgy. To such an extent, the Blessed One desired serving divine liturgy, several times exhausted from his infirmities and the fact that he heard confessions until three in the morning. He said, Today I won't be able to make it. I won't hold out, and these good people came from so far away for liturgy. One time some saints appeared to him and told him, Yaakovos, aren't you going to serve liturgy today? We came from so far away. He started the service, and as he went on, he felt better. Divine liturgy, he didn't even feel sick. By the end, as he used to say, he felt like he was flying, that he was so light. He always wore inexpensive vestments. He never had or wanted an expensive set. It was only in his last years that he had good vestments, gifts from his spiritual children, but even from these he only used one set whenever it was a feast day or when there were many people. The Great Almsgiver The pilgrims in those days were very fortunate. Father Yakovos could spend more time with them and converse with them comfortably because they were few. From 1960, the good Bishop Gregory of Halkida had started to send many young people, students of theology and others, to the Holy Monastery in the summer months. All who came to know the abundant love of Father Yakovos made him their spiritual father and embraced him with reverence and unconditional love. This was what the good Bishop Gregory also wanted since he knew or suspected what spiritual gifts the uneducated Father Yakovos possessed. At any rate, he was the one who said to Father Yakovos' ordination that one day the church would declare him a saint. There were some who did not share the feelings of the old bishop. They were upset to see the people, young and old, villagers, scientists, and professionals, honor and revere Father Yakovos. On the other hand, the graced monk did not, want, did not become proud. He was so 
meticulous about the monastic virtues of humility and obedience that he himself declared with a holy boast, I have never disobeyed a single order of Abbot Nicodemus, nor have I ever thought to do so. He could say the same thing about the virtue of poverty, but that was easy for him, a small thing in his eyes, so he didn't even speak about it. Instead, he was after the higher form of poverty, the virtue of almsgiving. He departed this life and closed his eyes in extreme poverty. Although he received a lot of money in his latter years, he kept nothing for himself. Since 1960, the monastery had a little money. He was given a stipend as a priest, but he kept nothing himself. It was then that his famous almsgiving started. Hundreds of people at first, and later thousands, were benefited with large sums of money, even regular money orders. Before becoming abbot in 1975, he of course always asked permission from Nicodemus to give something from the monastery. After becoming abbot in 1975, he received a lot of money from donations and distributed millions of drachmas to the poor, especially to the sick. He was only deceived two or three times by rascals and gave them money. He was not troubled, however. Very soon he received even more money for his poor and sick people. The Multiplication of the Prosphora and the Pasta In August of 1963, 75 men from Livavantes, St. David's hometown, volunteered to work on the monastery's water tank. Many people from Livandonates had vowed to contribute money or work for the monastery of their fellow citizen. Father Yakovos was the general supervisor of the works, but he also saw to it that meals and accommodations were provided for those good people. He used up everything he could find in the storehouse. Food supply was finally depleted, and he didn't have any money to buy more. He searched all the shelves, but found only five pounds of orzo. As for bread, he only had half of a prosphora. Father Ephemios contributed another half loaf. But of course, this was nothing for almost 100 people who were working and, and all day long. Father Yakovos was distressed. He did not know what to do. He was filled with despair and almost cried because he would have to let all those people go hungry. Suddenly, however, he took the big pot down, threw the orzo in, took the bread and the pot, and went to the church. He stood before St. David's icon and said, My beloved saint, these men work for your holy monastery. They came back from work, tired and hungry. I don't have anything else to give them to eat except these five pounds of orzo, a little olive oil, half of a prosphora, and this half loaf pointing at the items, all the while, for St. David. I ask you to bless them so that they may eat and be filled. He cooked that pot and dished out the orzo continuously without running out. Everyone was filled and there was also half a pot left over. Yes, half a pot. Many people witnessed this. Father Kiro, present-day abbot in Yerunda, being one of them. Many years later, while recounting St. David's miracles, Father Yakovo said concerning this, this particular one, My brother, this was a repetition of the miracle of the 5,000. He lets his sister's orphans go hungry. Almsgiving in the years following the war was not so easy. Prior to 1975, he didn't receive enough donations, and he wasn't allowed to give alms without permission. Every time he was unable to give alms, he was deeply distressed. His countenance that was always bright and encouraging turned heartbreakingly gloomy. He suffered tremendously. On August 6th, 1965, he experienced the most painful sorrow of his life. His sister, Anastasia, whom he loved and for whom he cared for so much, left behind two children, David and Maria. They lived in Farakala, in great poverty. Being so young, they could forget that they didn't have food, clothes, or shoes, but 
how could they forget the warmth and affection of their mother? Their father had remarried. When the little children learned from the neighbors that they were going to the feast of St. David, they became very happy. They knew that their good uncle was a monk there and also wanted to go without realizing the great distance, a six-hour walk at least. They had no food to take along, nor shoes to wear, only a deep longing in their tender hearts to, to see their uncle with the hope that they would find some resemblance of their mother in their saintly uncle. The neighbors set out early in the afternoon on August 5th. The two little siblings followed them. The, the trip was very difficult, passing through crags, forests, and ravines. The two children got tired, hungry, their feet ached, but they kept going since they were eager to see their uncle. They eventually arrived. Their uncle was in charge of everything, and they were not able to see him. No one took care of the children at night. They sat down in a corner, closed their eyes, and tired as they were, fell asleep without eating anything. In the morning they were awakened by the noise of the pilgrims. They didn't quite enter into the church. They didn't have good clothes on, and were also barefoot. The liturgy finished before noon. They waited for their uncle, who came out at last. They approached him and kissed his hand. His heart fluttered as soon as he saw them, but his countenance soon darkened from deep sorrow. He looked as if he were dead. He took courage, lifted up his hands, and caressed the little heads of the poor barefoot children of his sister. He didn't have a single drachma to give them, not even any andiron from the service. He was not supposed to give anything away from the holy monastery. The heart of the sensitive ascetic who helped many and lived only for the love melted away. His bright face turned pale. He was defeated. The abbot had strictly ordered him not to give anything from the monastery to a relative. Since he was a true monk, he had to keep the holy virtue of obedience. The only thing he could not keep was two tears. He caressed the little one's heads with his trembling hand and said, Farewell, my children. The children were sorely disappointed. Had they been stricken by lightning, they would not have been so hurt. They lowered their heads. Their world had been shattered. They moved on. Everyone was having something to eat and getting ready to return. The orphaned nephew and niece of the saintly uncle had not even put a piece of andiron in their mouth. They followed the villagers for the trip back since they didn't know the way. After they passed the ravine, a young monk at that time, Father Kileros, the present abbot of the monastery, happened to see them. He spoke to them, saw their condition, and understood the situation. He found some andiron for them to eat, just enough to give them some strength. Someone had to give some money. He gave twenty drachmas to David and five to Maria. The children returned heartbroken, back to their impoverished condition in Farakla. How could they understand the poverty at that time and the obedience of their uncle? They had to grow up and get to know him well as adults in order to convince themselves that it was not from indifference. Regarding the Blessed Elder himself, he especially never forgot his excruciating torment on that day. Having his sister's little orphans in front of him and not being able to help them. Twenty or so years later, he repeated time and time again to his niece Maria, the hungry little orphan girl of 1965, Ah, my Maria, if you only knew how I suffered much then. Part 4. The Suffering Monk the hard work, the long services, the daily vigil in his cell, and extremely strict fasting exhausted his organism. Actually, this should have occurred much earlier. He would not stop his asceticism for anything. His goal was to keep his spiritual powers free from the influence of the passions, temptations, and materialism, so that his path to God might be unhindered and sanctified by him. However, his body could take no more. His back was troubling him since 1956. He was also suffering from leg pain, but he didn't say anything because he could still bear it. However, the pain in his back was unbearable. How could it have been otherwise? 
since 22 out of 24 hours every day, he didn't take a rest. He only rested for a couple of hours when he was in great pain and didn't have to serve liturgy. Otherwise, he didn't sleep at all, not even in his latter years when he had a pacemaker. A brother might approach him and say, You're tired, Geronda, rest a little, only to hear, Go, Father, I will stay here. Tonight is going to be a long night. I'm not tired. In the morning, he was always found on his knees with his stole, his epitrachili on, still praying. After his all-night vigil, he went to church without speaking to anyone, nor did he want anyone to speak to him. He was in another world. He needed medical attention for his back. A doctor came and gave him 80 injections, but the problem persisted. He literally dragged himself to his work and the services. One afternoon, he couldn't make it, and he lay down on the wooden bed. St. David appeared to him in the form of Father Spiridon, a guest from the Holy Mountain. He helped him stand up, told him, lean your back against my old back. He helped him do it, and then the saint turned his hands backwards and grasped Father Jacobus's back, which cracked. That was it. The pain went away. The saint asked Father Jacobus, who am I? Father Spiridon, he replied. No, the saint said. You know me very well. You just don't want to say my name. You live in my house. The door opened and he saw the saint leaving and going down the stairs. In 1962, God took pity on Father Jacobos and sent a good monk to the monastery, Father Kirill. He stayed by the sick ascetic whose afflictions were endless and helped him as much as he could. In 1964, he suffered from his tonsils. He was in extreme pain and also suffered from his kidneys. Many times he was seized with unbearable pain during divine liturgy and turned pale, but never left a liturgy unfinished. It didn't matter how much he suffered. He always completed it. In 1967, he encountered more suffering. Inguinal hernia, appendicitis with peritonitis and prostrate problems. He suffered much and didn't know what the problem was. Still, he didn't want to go to the hospital. He began to turn pale, curl up, and writhe in pain. One time, Father Kilros found him in this desperate state. He could hardly move, only crawl. He was having a severe crisis. He was taken unconscious to the Halkita Hospital. They suspected it was a simple case of appendicitis. Only after much persuasion by doctors and priests did Father Yakovos consent to be operated on. His difficulty was that he didn't want to take off his clothes. The doctors would see his body, and he considered that extremely degrading. I will make a spectacle of myself, Father. No one ever saw me. Indeed, he was so pure and guarded himself from even looking at a human body. He himself never even touched his own body. As Yeranda Nikorma said, who knew these things well. He didn't even look at babies when he was baptizing. He later acknowledged it with a certain holy candidness. I never saw how the genitals of the children are. So they had to lie to him, saying that they would not remove his clothes and that they would only make a hole in his andiri. Only then did he agree. Operation took place on October 4th, 1967. He waited to go into the operating room. Present were Archimandrites, Polycarp, Nicodemus, Basil, and one other person. Among Father Yakovos' many prayers, he said the following as he later related. My beloved St. David, if you want me to return to your monastery, come and heal me. You must be here in 15 minutes. If you do come, please pass by St. John and bring him too. He's on your way. Just take a right turn and you will find him there. Within a few minutes, Father Yakovos related solemnly. St. David arrived. 
sweaty, in fact, as he was asked to come very quickly. He arrived with St. John the Russian. They stood by the door, greeted him, and said, I'm St. David, and this pointing at him is St. John the Confessor, stressing the latter word. Didn't you ask for us? Here we are. Don't worry, you'll be all right. Father Yakovos immediately noticed that the clergyman present didn't even greet the two saints and protested. Fathers, you don't stand up, you don't greet. But they didn't understand, and Nicodemus made this clear. Yakovos has lost it. He was taken into the operating room, given anesthetic. His rasso and diri and undergarment were removed. Before the anesthetic took effect, he saw the door open and the two saints enter. Surgeon Dr. Caloheris opened him up and was flabbergasted. It was not simple appendicitis. It was life-threatening. Normally one would have been dead. The surgeon had to act quickly. The multiple operation was successful, and after a short stay, the ascetic was able to return to his cell. To everyone who visited him, he expressed, What a good surgeon Dr. Kaloheris is. He also prayed for the doctor's well-being. However, St. John the Russian lost his patience and appeared to him one night rather upset, saying, Yakovos, why do you keep praising the doctor? I got you well. I had the order to operate on you. The doctor would not have been successful on his own. After a number of days, Dr. Carlo Harris visited Father Yakovus at the Holy Monastery and confessed, I felt my hand being guided by someone else and sensed that I wasn't the only one performing the operation. The Mother of God appears to him. The manual and spiritual work he did, day and night, caused extensive phlebitis. The pain from it was so great that he could no longer walk. In 1974, he was taken to Nimitz Hospital for surgery. He accepted as he understood that the ordeals of his operations to be allowed by God for a special reason, saying, God has allowed me to be hospitalized so many times so that I can become humble. This time, he was in the operating room for more than six hours. Dr. Cordelis operated on many veins. While recuperating in the hospital room, the Mother of God appeared to him and encouraged him. He related the following to a spiritual child of his about it. Yesterday, my child, a lady, came into this room for a moment. She was dressed like a nurse and was holding a small child in her arms. How are you doing, Father? she asked me. How can I be doing, ma'am? I am sick, and I am distressed about being away from my monastery. In the meantime, my child, I wondered, how are nurses at this hospital allowed to have their kids with them? Then she smiled and said to me, don't be afraid, you'll get well. I asked her, who are you, my lady? She smiled again, but did not say anything more to me. I turned to the patient next to me and asked him if he knew who the lady was. He replied, wondering, what lady are you talking about? I turned back and no one was there. I then realized, my child, that it was our most holy lady, Theotokos. These things are God's doings. He returned to the monastery but could not do much manual work. He heard confessions for many hours a day on his knees, and this is how he heard most confessions for the rest of his life. Since Father Yakovos also served as the parish priest of the three little villages in the area, he had to go back and forth on Sundays and on other occasions, going by animal in the cold, snow, frost, and heat. Several times his mule, Hado, gave him a lot of trouble, becoming nervous and kicking a lot. One time, a cold winter day, the animal was startled in the forest and through Father Yakovos. He was badly hurt. And to make things worse, he lost a pair of thick woolen gloves that Zoisa's wife had sent him for such days. He was exhausted from asceticism, which made him very susceptible to the cold. His hands, they often became numb. 
and he had great difficulty serving the Divine Liturgy. Many times he traveled to the villages without the mule. One day as he was returning from a village laden with heavy items, a taxi passed by about two kilometers from the monastery. The passenger knew Father Yakovos and asked the taxi driver to stop and pick him up. The driver answered, Don't worry about monks. They manage just fine. They drove on, but when they arrived at the monastery and knocked at the gate, Father Yakovos came to open it. Both the taxi driver and the passenger were stunned. The former asked for forgiveness. Such things were very common. On one, another occasion, a mother went to the holy monastery with her sick baby's clothes for Father Yakovos to read prayers over them. Just before the intersection to St. David's Hermitage, her taxi got stuck in the mud and could not continue. The passengers got out to walk the rest of the way. At that moment, Father Yakovos passed by on his mule, heading for a village about six or seven kilometers away in order to give Holy Communion to a dying man. The mother asked to speak with him, but he show, showed her the holy gifts, told her to cross herself, go to the monastery, and that he would be there later. After 10 or 15 minutes, the mother and the taxi driver arrived at the monastery. They went into the church, venerated the icons, and to their amazement, saw Father Yakovos exiting the sanctuary. Father Yakovos, didn't we just see you a little while ago on the road? Yes, my child. Weren't you headed to a village to give communion to a man who was about to die? Yes, my child. Then how did you go and come back so quickly? My child, these things are God's doings. The above incident was related by the taxi driver in front of the bishop. Regarding God's doings, such as this, he never examined them. He accepted them as they came. Same for asceticism and fasting. These things were completely normal to him. He accepted them wholeheartedly without giving many explanations. Concerning fasting, he only said that it was the first command given to man by God. One time when Metropolitan Nicholas issued an encyclical to the faithful, reducing the amount of fasting during Great Lent, Father Yakovos was grieved, did not hide his displeasure. Such actions made him say, the bishops keep the rudder on the shelf. On another occasion, he was greatly saddened after a bishop ordained someone to the priesthood without his consent, as he had an impotent, an impediment, excuse me, a certain moral sin or condition prohibiting a lay person from becoming a priest in the Orthodox Church. Boldness with the Saints Keeping his monastic rule to perfection and working with unrivaled asceticism, Father Yakovos acquired from God the gift of boldness before the saints, especially toward St. David, but also toward St. John the Russian. He conversed with them simply and straightforwardly, asking them for one thing or another without hesitation or wavering. At times he even got angry and threatened St. David. Once in 1972, a villager cut down several of the monastery's few olive trees in order to use them for firewood. Father Yakovos became very distressed, moreover because he would have to go to the police, the court, and so on, since he had been put in charge of the monastery by the abbot. He was greatly upset. Without thinking at all, he went down to the church, stood in front of St. David's holy icon, and said, As for me, my beloved saint, I left my property behind and I came here to serve you out of love. You know how much I love you and honor you. The fields belong to you, but you don't seem to care. And anyone who feels like it goes and cuts down trees. I can't be involved with the police and things like this now. You have until evening to bring me the person who cut down your olive trees. Otherwise, Old man, I will lock you up in the reliquary. I won't sense you, and I won't light your oil lamp. Indeed, St. David conformed. That evening, just before Vespers, a villager entered the church. Father Yakovos understood that he was the man, but did not say anything. 
After Vespers concluded, the guilty-stricken villager confessed his guilt and restitution followed. Three years later, something similar happened. While the brothers were preparing for Vespers, they discovered that the candle stand had been opened. The money was missing. Father Yakovos went in front of St. David's icon very upset and demanded, If you don't show me who took the money before Vespers begins, I am not going to sense or do Vespers. After a short while, St. David produced the thief. He was in tears. Falling on his knees, he asked for forgiveness. St. David not only listened to Father Yakovos, but also had compassion on him, as can be seen from what happened to Abbot Nicodemus one time he visited the monastery. He, the abbot found Father Yakovos serving liturgy and asked him how he was doing. Father Yakovos replied, How can I be, Yerunda? I am sick, not well at all. The abbot didn't seem to care and said with indifference, You're always sick. What else is new? The next morning, Nicodemus woke up with swollen feet. He realized why. And as soon as he saw Father Yakovos in the yard, he said to him, half complaining and half repenting, Eh, hey, Father Yakovos, it was just a slip. Did you have to take it out on me? He is made abbot, especially since 1970. The radiance of priest monk Yakovos grew in proportion to his afflictions. There was no end to his afflictions, but also no limits to his radiance. He had become known not only in the surrounding area, but in all of Evia. Many knew about him in Attica and Athens, and they went to see him, listen to him, and make their confession to him. Despite all this, when in 1972 a new abbot was needed for the monastery, he wasn't considered suitable by the Metropolitan of Halkida. Three years passed. The great ascetic was obedient in everything to the new abbot, priest monk Christodoulos, a young man at that time, and now abbot at the great Kutlumusio Monastery on Mount Athos. Yakovos had so many virtues and had been given so many gifts by God that he had no difficulty submitting to the young elder. On the contrary, he loved him very much. Besides, he knew him from when he was a child and used to be his confessor. After these three years passed, a new abbot was again needed. The new metropolitan, Chrysostom, looked to Father Yakovos, who was hesitant and unwilling. He finally yielded, and on June 25, 1975, he was made abbot. The renovation of the monastery, begun under Nicodemus through Yakovos's efforts, was now progressing by leaps and bounds. He took care not only of the monastery, but of the whole surrounding region as well. For instance, the terrible years of 1978 and 1979, when extensive forest fires plagued Greece. He went outside the monastery at midnight, sometimes alone and sometimes with the monks, and prayed continually for the country to be delivered from the fires. Concerning the monastic buildings, he wanted them to be built well, but simple and monastic. Most of all, though, he was concerned about the internal life of the Cenobium. There were just three monks. Despite his radiance, despite the miracles he performed, he did not have any new young monks join the monastery. Many young candidates came to receive advice and to go to confession, but they became monks elsewhere. A young abbot who came at that time to meet and consult him asked, how is it, Yeronda, that you don't have more monks with so many candidates passing through? The elder replied without difficulty. It seems, Father, that I know only the introductory things and not the deeper things. He had to wait until 1987 to see a new monk. This was not due to the fact that he didn't know the, quote, deeper things. A gifted elder and a god-seer priest monk, to many monks from various monasteries came for advice, undoubtedly knows the deeper things. Well, the reason, or rather the reasons, are to be found elsewhere. It is very difficult to examine Father Yakovos's discretion and God's judgment on this matter. There may have only been a few monks, but the services were done regularly and the monastic virtues were evident, even on their faces. Satan reacted to this in his own way. Once, while the gate was closed 
at midnight, a wretched, ugly old woman with a ring in her nose appeared in the yard of the monastery. The elder told her, Come here and venerate. Where are you from? You're welcome to stay here one night to rest. The old woman replied, What are you talking about? I couldn't stay here even for a half hour. You have liturgy here every day. You pray. I'm going to the monastery over there to trouble them for a week, and then I'll find somewhere else to go. Are you perhaps the devil? said the elder and pointed a wooden cross directly at her. Satan, who had taken the form of an old woman, disappeared immediately, but he wasn't frustrated. The next day, just as the elder was getting ready to start his long prayer inside his cell, and was putting incense in the censer, a skeleton appeared in front of him. And the elder took down the holy icon of the Theotokos and pointed it at him. The demon disappeared, but he repeated these tricks many times. One time he took the form of a horrible billy goat that dashed straight at the elder's face. Satan also used to act in another more effective way. He incited people to encroach on the few fields belonging to the holy monastery or harm them in some other way. The elder lost his courage. Satan realized it and appeared to him saying, It's me who's doing these things to you just to drive you mad. I won't leave you in peace. Tomorrow, in fact, you'll get it worse. Indeed, the next morning, he received a summons. The elder despaired. His niece, Maria, found him in this bad condition. Her attempt to console him was in vain. The elder headed to the church. Maria was puzzled. She followed him and stopped at the candle stand. The elder went straight to St. David's icon on the iconostasis, and Maria heard him say, Why are you idle, my St. David? You sit there in your icon, leaving everything to Yaakovos. Well, Yaakovos is through. He can't do it anymore. Come down now and take care of things. The elder said more in the same stern tone, but Maria was frightened and she went out. I am but dust and ashes. After mid-May 1977, he became very ill again. He had patience, but the evils continued. He feared that his end was near and wrote a small note to the brothers of the monastery. The note is simple, but reveals the deep holiness of the penniless monk. To quote the letter, Letterhead, Holy Monastery of St. David the Elder, May 23, 1977. Holy Fathers, Father Kilaros and Father Seraphim, through your prayers. Holy Fathers, take care of the monastery of our Holy Father David. All things in the monastery, the museum, and everything else belongs to Holy Elder David. Everything in the Holy Elder's cell, where I have been staying since 1952, books, money, etc., belongs to Holy Elder David. I never desired anything. It was only because of my illness and my necessities that I kept these things. I never thought to covet something and make it my own, knowing that I am but dust and ashes. Be careful in everything and have love among you, because love covers a multitude of sins. And for our love, our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. If we have love among us, then we are God's children. If I, an earthly man, have grieved you, forgive me, and may God be with you. Signed, I greet you with a holy kiss, the least among priest monks, Father Yaakovos. He converses with St. David and St. John the Russian. In 1977, Father Ioannis Vernezos from the town of Neoprokopi, Evia, where the shrine of St. John the Russian is located, asked Father Yaakovos to pray because the fields were suffering from the drought and he couldn't find any water. Father Yaakovos promised to him the following. I'm going to entreat St. David so you will find water. I'll tell him to go there with Divine John. He brought forth water for his monastery by striking the ground with his staff. He will do the same for our good priest. Indeed, water was found. 
The priest called Father Yakovos to thank him, but before he had a chance to say anything, Father Yakovos told him, Father, after praying fervently, St. David bowed his head, lowered his eyes, and signaled to me that you will certainly find water. Now go. It is strange that regarding other saints, with St. John the Russian in particular, he didn't feel the same closeness as he did with St. David. Whenever he asked for both St. David and St. John to come help, he gave the impression that St. John arrived quicker because he was much younger than St. David. He did not get demanding with St. John as he did on occasions with St. David. He was ashamed even to serve at St. John's shrine at Prokopi. He was repeatedly asked, Father Yakovos, come over and serve liturgy at St. John's. But he always replied, Am I, the earthly one, worthy to appear before John the Divine? In addition, every time he mentioned St. John's name, whom he often called Divine John and Confessor, his voice had became solemn, majestic, as if he were there in person addressing him as a king. Not only did he entreat St. John to help the faithful with their needs, he also saw him alive, going out of his reliquary to go help them. In 1986, Father Yakovos told a group of pilgrims what St. John is like outside his reliquary. I asked him in a low voice, and I was sitting next to him, Have you personally seen him outside? The elder ignored it because there were others listening. I asked him again twice in a low voice so that the others wouldn't hear. Then, in a disarming manner, without changing his tone, he replied, In the morning he's right there, going back to his reliquary. There are times, that is, when the saint is not in his reliquary. This miracle, that of St. John going out from his reliquary at times, has been attested by others as well, including the priest in charge of his shrine. St. John found the blessed elder worthy to dialogue with, but more than that, to see him alive in full figure. One time when the elder was returning from some medical examinations, he passed by St. John's shrine, as always, to venerate him. He knelt in front of his reliquary, and after a while was told by St. John, as the elder himself related, quote, Do you think that I bless everyone who comes here? Look at the woman who just venerated me along with her children. I didn't bless her. Why not? The elder asked. Because she curses her children. I can see it in your faces that you are clean. By the end of the 1970s, his bodily strength to his great dismay grew all the more weaker. He was saddened that he couldn't do much manual labor anymore and that he was unable to pray 23 hours a day. He did work, though, at least 20 hours a day, spiritually for the most part. One of his so-called contractors was the Archimandrite Paul, who traveled all over Evia and beyond. He sent everyone who had difficult problems to Father Yakovos. The elder received them with love beyond measure. Just by looking someone in the eye, he could discern those who were there with good intentions from those who went to him out of curiosity. He once spoke openly to a group of spiritual people about it. My children, I am full of joy. I can see from your faces that you are clean. Always be like this. A priest once asked me, What do you see in me, Father Yakovos? My children, he was dark, very dark. I smiled and didn't tell the priest what I saw in him. He didn't make poignant remarks either to lay people or to clergy. He had great discretion. This can also be seen from the following incident. One time, a priest who used to visit the elder frequently asked him, Yeronda, do I make you sad because I trim my hair? The elder replied, no, although, of course, he preferred that the tradition be kept with this as well. Some time later, that priest arrived at the monastery with his hair untrimmed. The elder found an opportunity, told him privately, Father, you looked good before as well, but now you look more venerable, like Melchizedek. He was kind and affable to everyone and tried to encourage and build everyone up spiritually. To the pure and well-intentioned, however, he opened up differently. This was especially evident with the young people 
for whom he overflowed with joy and gladness. They couldn't detect how, and without realizing it, they were caught up into this joy and gladness. Many times this gladness became manifest in another way. When well-intentioned pilgrims visited and Father Yakovos took them to the church for a supplicatory service to St. David or to bless them with his holy relic, a divine fragrance emanated from St. David's reliquary. This also happened when faculty and students from the University of Athens Theological School visited the monastery in 1983. Inevitably, when the time came for a pilgrim to depart from the monastery, he felt like he was leaving behind the person who truly loved him more than anyone else in the world. Indeed, it was painful to depart from Father Yakovos. The elder saw the pilgrims to the gate, while the latter departed with courage, consolation, faith, and most of all, with the hope of returning. For many, a visit to Father Yakovos was a milestone for their new beginning in life. A priest monk once said that departing from Father Yakovos was like departing from paradise. It was quite natural for people to feel this way. After all, the elder's face reflected the divinity, that is, dwelling inside the elder's heart, his mind, his noose, were God's divine energies and that were manifest on his face. Through the light, peace, gladness, and love that radiated from that face, God was being revealed and glorified. This explains why a pilgrim felt like he had a taste of paradise, a, a little something from the kingdom and reign of God. He kept it hidden to shun glory. Some first-time visitors to the monastery received a shock. Although they had never met Father Yakovos, he called them by their names or mentioned the difficulties they encountered on their way to the monastery. Nevertheless, he was very careful with this great gift of clairvoyance. Although he knew the intimate secrets of a person talking to him, he did not reveal what he knew. He kept this gift hidden, deep, within himself. A short time after his repose, Father Porfirios, another great and blessed elder, said he, Father Yakovos, had the very great gift of clairvoyance. However, he diligently kept it hidden to shun glory. He's one of the greatest saints of our century. This diligence of Father Yakovos to hide his gift of clairvoyance was not without discretion. In 1979, a group of high school teachers went to see him without notice. They all had problems and went to the elder to find a solution. After they sat down for the traditional treat, the elder began to talk to them about various things. Throughout the course of what he said, he gave specific advice that solved their respective problems. The teachers were speechless. Father Yakovos he solved their problems in this way because none of them would talk about their problems in front of the others. He spoke similarly when appropriate to those who went to him for confession. If the person was a beginner, not advanced spiritually, shy, hesitant, or uneducated, he knelt down with him and tactfully told the person confessing what his temptations, his sins, his falls, his thoughts were, and with love and a gentle strictness gave them the appropriate spiritual medicines. People, even monastics, say it time and time again, I didn't have to say anything in my confession. The elder said everything. I just nodded each time. Even though the elder did not have a high higher education or a knowledge of psychology or teaching methods. He could easily adapt to anyone at their level, whether in conversation or confession. When talking with Father Yakovos, everyone from farmers or employees at a business to university professors and judges felt as though he were conversing with someone from the same walk of life. It was not by chance that so many university professors and high-ranking judges went to receive his advice or go to confession. The same holds true for numerous priests, including confessors themselves. Even bishops and patriarchs bowed and confessed to the unlearned Father Yakovos. Everyone departed relieved, comforted, and with renewed courage for their spiritual struggle. Father Yakovos wanted people to receive Holy Communion so much 
that as soon as he discerned true repentance, he did not impose difficult penances. Of course, this is not to say that he overlooked the fundamentals. On one occasion, for instance, he directed a young woman not to receive Holy Communion. She went to some bishop, though, and received his permission. When she went forward to receive Holy Communion, however, she experienced something strange. She could not take it into her mouth. This happened twice. The young woman became frightened, was sorry for what she did, and went back to Father Yakovos to confess it. Something similar happened. Father Yakovos related with a journalist who attempted to receive Holy Communion without proper preparation. Quote, when I was about to give him Holy Communion, I hesitated, and behold, a golden flash passed in front of the holy spoon and above my head toward the holy altar. This flash, also witnessed by a virtuous monk, meant, as Father Yakovos later explained, that the Holy Spirit did not permit the body and blood of our Lord to enter into the, an impure man. Moreover, the darkness of his face revealed to him that he had some involvement with witchcraft. Keeper rather than a censor of rules. Every time that he was asked to give his consent as a spiritual father for a candidate to become a priest, he had difficulty. Even if the candidates were his spiritual children and were not weighed down by impediments, he hesitated and explained to the candidate how fearful the mystery of the priesthood is. He postponed giving his consent and met with the candidate repeatedly, explaining, You, my child, you know these things. Excuse me for saying so. It's not easy. It's about becoming priest of the Most High. How can I explain it? He spoke in this way and delayed the matter in order for the candidate to realize the holiness of the mystery and for himself also to overcome the awe that he felt. The elder was very strict with himself, while to others he was lenient. He even got to the point of allowing olive oil on Wednesdays and Fridays for the visitors and other such exceptions, explaining, The people are tired. They went through so much trouble to come here and venerate the saint. It doesn't matter. Let them have a little oil. He never allowed such a thing for himself, however. In fact, when the elder sat down for supper, it only appeared as if he were eating. When he realized that someone was watching him, he would pick up a tiny piece of food, put it in his mouth. The food on his plate lessened only after he gave some to the person sitting next to him. He asked his guests to eat well and was very well pleased when they did. Many times he urged them sweetly, Eat! Don't grieve the Lord. As far as the practices of fasting, temperance, and going to church regularly, he stressed these things. He advised the people to go to church and to live a life of prayer. He gave a rule or requirement for someone to get well that might perhaps sound naive. Quote, Fast from everything for three days, pray a lot, be continent, and open three churches, i.e. request that three liturgies be served. Great theological wisdom is hidden within these words. They require deep faith in God and in the intercession of the saints, so that only a person who has such a faith could decide to go through with the strict asceticism and all the trouble and expense involved. He recommended the opening of the church because he knew well the sanctifying and absolving power of the Holy Eucharist. Incidentally, if he found out that a priest took too much money for liturgies or for a celebration of 40 liturgies, he became extremely sad and related to the faithful, be careful where you give your money. Concerning priests who visited the monastery with their spiritual children, he honored and praised them in front of the others in order to increase their esteem among the faithful. He even tried to kiss their hand, even the younger ones. In fact, since many priests were his spiritual children, he had to devise numerous ways in which to kiss their hands. Concerning the monks, he advised them mildly and introduced them to the spirit of monasticism with love and support. 
when they happened to neglect their duties or relax their spiritual struggle, he didn't rebuke them sternly. Instead, he kept them at a formal distance without looking at them directly. As for the monks, they knew well that he was full of love and compassion. As soon as they saw him in the yard or in the church, they ran to receive his blessing. To them, a word or even a look of his was a little something from paradise. So whenever he turned formal, no longer caressing them with his look, they felt it deeply. That little something from paradise that he deprived them of was in fact the reason they had come to the monastery. This was enough to make them come to their senses, repent, and renew their spiritual struggle with intensity. Whenever the elder wanted to be more specific, he spoke with supposed indifference. Fathers, when I was young, I used to go around all the chapels of the monastery, clean them and have them ready for their feast day. I sacrificed some of my own resting time. The monks understood from this that going beyond the call of duty is necessary whenever a need arises. At St. John the Russians, he did not like leaving the monastery at all. First, because being outside of the monastery was for him like being outside of paradise, like expelled Adam. And second, because he felt that he should care for his paradise constantly and never abandon it. When he realized that a monk was thinking of visiting some holy place or monastery, he might say to him either during a meal or in private, I knew my father's a good monk who would not leave his monastery for any reason, and that monk became a saint. Was some monk thinking of asking for a blessing to visit Mount Athos? The elder knew it and would say, I, myself, fathers, also wanted to visit Mount Athos, but how could I? It's Mount Athos here, too. The elder was well aware that Mount Athos was not as noisy as St. David's Monastery with all its pilgrims, its men, its women, but he still said the same things. Many priests, his spiritual children, often invited them to their parish or monastery, but he constantly refused, saying, What do you want to have for me for? I'm just a corpse. I'll pollute the air that you breathe. The only exception he made was to visit the shrine of St. John the Russian. It was on the way to Halkita, where he had to go from time to time anyhow, for priestly or medical reasons. So he would invariably stop over to venerate St. John. One day at noon, he was heading back from Halkita. He passed by St. John's church. He entered it reverently, lit a large candle, and proceeded to the left side of the nave. He approached the reliquary with devoutness and joy and knelt before it. He prayed there for some time. Some people who were in line behind him to venerate the, the saint fretted at the delay. The elder arose, kissed the holy relic, and moved to the other side of the reliquary so that he would not be in the way. He stood there joyfully, looking at the saint's head. He noticed, however, that the holy relic shifted around and took different positions, depending on who was venerating it. Father Yakovos wondered and started to pay closer attention, and this was indeed the case. He then ventured to ask the saint, quote, My beloved saint, why do you permit some to touch you with their lips, some you stretch out your hand to, some you turn your head to, others you smile at, and others you reject by turning your head away. He received the immediate reply. Yaakovos, not everyone who approaches does so to venerate me. Some are devout, others come with their hands crossed behind their backs, while others come just out of curiosity. Father Yaakovos was made worthy of this sign several other times as well. That is, he saw the holy relic take a welcoming or rejecting position, depending on the disposition of the person who approached. In fact, every time the elder visited the shrine, he always received a divine sign from St. John. 
One time in 1990, he passed by to venerate the saint on his way back from Athens, where he had gone for medical exams. People were in line, waiting to venerate the saint. Father Yakovos knelt before the reliquary and prayed there for some time. Well, some women, they grew impatient with the delay, but suddenly stepped back from fear, saying, The bones are squeaking. The bones of the saint are squeaking. Father Yakovos heard this, stood up and said very naturally, My good Christians, the saint is alive. He just changed side. Don't be afraid. He also had great love for the priest in charge of the shrine. In fact, he didn't hesitate to make his confession to him, even though he was young. Hearing Father Yakovos' confession was a shocking experience for any confessor priest. This particular priest, a spiritual child of the elder, would not agree to hear his confession for anything. He was seized with fear at the mere thought of confessing his spiritual father, a holy ascetic who himself confessed thousands of people and counseled other ascetics of great virtue. His excuse was that he had no experience and didn't know what to say to an ascetic. The elder insisted and explicitly asked him to be obedient. Only in this way did the priest finally consent. They both knelt in front of the icon of St. David on the Iconostasis, and there began an outpouring of humility that could set the whole world trembling. The church was flooded from the opening of the heart and mind of the holy ascetic, who was at the same time an abbot with many responsibilities and a spiritual guide to thousands of faithful, laymen, monastics, priests, bishops, archbishops, patriarchs. The elder's confession was consciously addressed first to the Lord, then to St. David, and lastly to the priest. It was like a dialogue with St. David, with the priest serving as a witness. The two holy men conversed. That's what it felt like for the priest. The holy man in confession turning to the Lord, saying that in one specific case, he acted as St. David had told him, and in another case, that he acted as St. David had indicated to him, and so on. He had St. David to help and to share his accountability to God. At the conclusion of his confession, he said, You see, Holy Elder, I mentioned everything here in front of our good priest. Well, our good priest had nothing to say. He could not dare say anything, anyhow, to the holy man. At that point, the elder fell on the ground and literally touched the shoes of the priest with his forehead and awaited the forgiveness prayer. The priest was at a loss. He did not know whether he should, whether it was even necessary to read the forgiveness prayer, but the elder waited there on the ground. Without realizing how, he only read the concluding part of the prayer and rushed to lift his ascetic spiritual father off the ground. Regular Hospital Visits The early 1980s passed with difficulty at the monastery. The elders' poor health, an increase in pilgrims, and various distractions and temptations. The elders' reputation had grown, a good and wondrous sign, but it reduced the amount of time he was able to spend hearing confessions and responding to the letters that he received. After almost five years passed by, everything became more difficult, while at the same time more wondrous. The elder's ascetic ascent became steeper, but his gifts also grew more remarkable. His legs had become swollen and turned blue. Phlebitis really meant business. In addition, he had heart and respiratory problems. Cardiac insufficiency, coronary artery problems, too many things together for medical science to cure. By necessity, he started making hospital visits to, in Athens. Before and after each hospital visit, he stayed for a while at the house of Maria, his niece. Both Maria and her husband, Theodore, had great respect for the Yeronda. They were, in fact, very grateful to him. A number of years prior, Maria had a very difficult delivery. She and her baby nearly died, but to the amazement of the doctors, 
She survived through the elder's prayers. No one had mentioned anything to the elder, but he knew it nevertheless. He had prayed for 48 hours, nonstop. A monk saw him going up the mountain, carrying a cross, and asked, What was it all about? I am going up there, my child, to be closer to him and entreat him on behalf of our Maria. The next day he took a taxi and went to Athens to read a prayer over her. That was it. Maria and the baby were saved. A similar thing happened with Theodore, who was a, a boatswain. On August 15, 1979, Father Yakovo said, If only Theodore makes it today, he is in great danger. I'll do the supplicatory service. Indeed, Theodore was in danger. The ship he was on sailed against some reefs in the Red Sea. Although he was only the boatswain, he took the ship under his command and started giving instructions to the crew. Under normal circumstances, he could not have handled such a situation, but all the instructions he gave turned out to be right. He said he felt as though he were guided by some other power. Thus, both he and the crew escaped danger. While at his niece's house, he lived like a bodiless angel. He made no noise whatsoever, didn't bother anyone, and asked nothing from anyone, not even for a glass of water that he needed for his medication. He liked a cup of coffee in the morning, but accepted one only after Maria kept insisting and thanked her until noon for it. He showed deep gratitude even for the smallest of things offered to him. Theodore kept a historic and miracle-working icon in the house. His grandfather was inside the monastery of Arcadia in Crete. At the time, it was besieged by the Turks in November of 1866. He held the icon up and walked out together with his large family. The icon somehow dazzled the Turks, who didn't see them, and thus they were able to escape. Father Yakovos prayed on his knees in front of that a holy icon for endless hours. Maria asked the elder to come into the kitchen where she was working so that he wouldn't be by himself. The elder was ashamed to. One time he accepted and went. He found a small wooden stool, put it in the corner, and sat there bashfully like an ob obedient, timid little refugee. He used the stool that was there since he considered sitting on a chair a luxury and not proper for a monk. He did have something like a chair in his cell, but he never sat on it. Now, however, he was at somebody else's house, and whenever he was a guest, he had to sit down properly. If it were a sofa, he sat on its edge. Sometime after the elder's departure, a lady visited Maria's family and asked, Where did the elder used to sit? They showed her, and she seated herself there. Sometime later, she smelled fragrance and ventured to reveal what she felt. Maria and Theodore smiled and explained to her what it was all about. Moreover, they said that when the elder spoke to them, wondrous fragrance often came from his mouth. He tried to find ways to get very close to him so that we could smell that fragrance better, but he realized it and bashfully pulled back, pretending he didn't know what they were doing. Similar thing also happened with his clothes. No matter how long he wore his undershirt, it never became soiled. Not only that, it even it gave off a sweet smell. Nevertheless, in order not to receive glory, as Blessed Elder Porphyrios pointed out, he would say to the monks who asked to wash his clothes, I have washed them, Father, they're clean. In fact, for asceticism, he remained at times partly and at other times fully unwashed, but nevertheless, he was spotlessly clean. He loved the children very much. In his eyes, they were little angels. He sometimes asked Maria with tenderness in contrast to his usually imposing voice, Maria, don't scold the little children. I can't bear it. One Monday morning, little Constantine was crying a lot. He didn't want to go to school one bit. The teacher demonstrated the Calam Matanio in class. He was supposed to have learned it over the weekend, but he hadn't since his mother didn't know it either. The elder 
heard the whining and saw all the resistance the little one put up and said to the niece, Really, Maria, you don't know how to dance? So, without any difficulty, he took the child by the hand, and Maria as well. He sang the folk song, Kira Vangilo, and patiently taught them the dance. That day, after sending the kids off to school, Maria went to the hospital with the elder. On the bus, while the elder was sitting and looking out of the window, he saw a young couple on the sidewalk fondling and kissing each other. Look, Maria, what love the brother and sister have for each other. Come on, uncle, they're a couple. Oh, oh, is, is that so? How much shamelessness in our days. Looking at the world through the bus window, the Yeronda also marveled at how all the young people dressed without elegance everyone in jeans and a sport jacket. He once said to a group of young people who visited the monastery, My children, I wonder, do you all buy your clothes from the same factory? Do you ever iron your clothes? Although he was very austere and otherworldly, ascetic, he nevertheless had refined taste. He wanted people to dress neatly with elegance and decorum. They arrived at the hospital after the examination cardiologist Dr. Krimastinos, who later became minister of Greece's Department of Health, shook his head with disappointment. The elder he needed a pacemaker soon. Besides, his overall condition was very poor. For the Yakovos, he didn't worry about his serious illness or the fact that he had to suffer even more. What saddened him was that he had to leave the monastery a couple more times, only one or more, two more times, he thought, but of course, it had to be more than that. On his way back from the hospital, he didn't stay at his niece's house, but went directly to the monastery. The only stop he made was, was at Prokopi to venerate his co-worker, the divine, St. John the Russian. He used to send him over together with St. David to help wherever there was a great need. He could never pass from Prokopi without stopping to venerate this gallant and incessant fighter of evil. When he arrived at the monastery, he was very tired. The jerky ride on the bad road to the monastery caused him pain in the heart, not to mention that just riding in a car made him nauseous. He passed the church to venerate the icons and then went up to his cell. He had hardly taken his rasso off when someone knocked on the door. The parents of a graceful five-year-old child had come to ask for Father Yakovos' help. Their child was not speaking. They had taken him for tests in Russia and America, but nothing resulted from them. Father Yakovos listened to them and without surprise or worry said, My children, this is a very simple thing. We'll go downstairs, go to the church, you will pray, I will pray too, and the child will speak. So it happened. They prayed. Father Yakovos, he made the sign of the Holy Cross over the child with St. David's holy head. And the child went out in the yard to play with some other kids. In no more than 10 minutes, he started talking as if nothing had happened. He returned to his cell and allowed himself only a little rest. He did so, in fact, for a particular reason. He was alarmed by the doctor who advised him that if he didn't take care of himself, his condition would worsen and he would not make it much longer. That evening he decided to visit St. David's Hermitage one last time, the cave where for years St. David went to pray. Father Yakovos had stopped visiting it lately. A shepherd happened to see him on his way back some time before dawn. People were gossiping about it and the monks also heard about it. He didn't want to scandalize the vill villagers or let his great asceticism become known to the monks. So he chose to stop visiting the hermitage, the place where he lived the most wondrous and divine experiences of his whole life. This time he had a flashlight. It was not like in the past when a star from God illuminated his path. He arrived at the place, but before taking the path downhill to the cave, he looked unconsciously to the right toward the huge cliff of St. David's little sheet on top. He couldn't go there anymore. 
He recalled it nostalgically, the moonlit nights when he was up there praying alone in company with the stars and St. David. This time, he could only go to the hermitage, and even that was more than what he was allowed. He wasn't supposed to be taking such long walks, let alone walks on such rugged paths. If something were to happen to him, he would be difficult to find. He thought that this visit to the hermitage was perhaps his very last one, and indeed it was. He went into the cave and prayed unhindered. Neither demons nor heartaches disrupted him. He was filled with the peace of God. Soon a refreshing internal breeze came that sweetened every cell of his body. He was filled entirely with divine grace. He was breathing while at the same time flying high, conversing with St. David in the company of winged angels with youthful faces who glorified the triune God with him. Entering into the midst of the saints of God, they accepted him in their company, and he beheld the glory of God with them. What things he experienced that night, whether in the body or out of the body, he did not know, nor could he explain. They were not to reveal what they saw. He had to be back at the monastery by morning. He arrived in time for Orthos and then served divine liturgy. That morning, though, it was different. He read the scriptural readings, recited the prayers, and intoned the deacon's petitions. But it was as if everything came from somewhere else, from someone else. Someone great and sweet was inside him, speaking from his heart, filling him with a blessed joy. By the time of the tribe hymn, he was no longer sure if he was still using material hands and lips. Two of the attending faithful became frightened during the great entrance. They saw him carrying the holy gifts and walking toward the sanctuary, but his feet were half a meter off the ground. When it was time to receive Holy Communion, and as the faithful approached, a possessed woman who had been laying down for a while with her face flat on the ground cried out, Shameless hussy! How dare you also go there, up there with the little angels? Yesterday you slept with your brother-in-law. How dare you? Then everybody in the church saw a young woman dressed in all black rush out of the church, just as Father Yakovos was about to give her Holy Communion. At the end of the Divine Liturgy, after the Holy Communion Thanksgiving prayers, Father Yakovos came out from the sanctuary and saw two familiar people waiting for him. What a liturgy today, he told them. It was very beautiful. But they asked him about what they had seen during the great entrance. He understood right away, told them not to tell anyone anywhere. However, they did mention it to a couple of people at that time and later to many others. Father Yakovos went to the guest room and had a cup of coffee. Many visitors had arrived who wanted to hear a word from his lips or at least see his joyous, serene face. In fact, many people visited the monastery just to see his face on that holy head propped up by a skeleton that was barely discernible under his andiri and raso, that spotlessly clean raso. I saw pilgrims and visitors who didn't want to ask anything from him in order to not put the slightest burden on him. They even held back asking for his prayers. They only wanted to see him. It was enough. They also wanted to hear his voice, but only if it would not tire him. That voice of his, however, wasn't really his. No one accepted that the voice they heard chanting or offering counsels was that of the poor ascetic. It had to belong to someone else because it came from another source. It was a gift from God. Father Yakovos was conscious that his voice was a gift, and so was the demon who dared tempt him about it. How did such a thing happen, and what was the elder's reaction? It was Holy Thursday, 1989, and the elder wanted to chant a troparion, one of the magnificent odes for that day. He chanted it like an angel. Neither of the chanters nor any of the people attending had ever heard or better experienced such chanting. Shortly after the middle of the hymn, 
the elder abruptly stopped. The chanter completed the hymn. The next morning, the chanter asked the elder why he had stopped. The elder explained that the demon was tempting him for chanting so beautifully. Even if I read it well, I read for my Lord. The demon did not leave him alone even on Holy Saturday night. He was completely exhausted from arrhythmia and heart constrictions. Father Kirill was away celebrating the resurrection liturgy in two small villages. I saw Father Yakovos perspiring and turning pale. Would he be able to finish the resurrectional liturgy? It seemed physically Im impossible. His hands were shaking and his feet could hardly support him, it was obvious. But Father Yakovo showed a wondrous devotion throughout the service. He was determined to fight nature, and he won. When it was time for Holy Communion, he could barely hold the chalice. Some people brought up a chair. Fortunately, Father Kirill had just returned and continued the service. Father Yakovos turned around and fell on the chair, half dead, but after gathering some strength, he got up and completed the service. Not only that, despite his suffering, he went on to read St. John Chrysostom's Paschal homily. Without it, Pascha was not quite complete for the elder. Indeed, he managed to read it through. His recitation, his triumphal voice, sounded as if it came down from heaven and filled you with feelings of victory for the resurrection, even with the resurrected Christ himself. Half an hour later at the Paschal breakfast, a lady who knew about reading properly told him privately, Father Yakovos, you read St. John Chrysostom's homily very well. Yes, I know, the elder said. Satan also tempted me about it, but I told him, even if I read it well, I read it for the Lord. The money bag was always full. Back to 1986. His almsgiving activity spread far and wide. Under the front of his bed, he always kept a small bag, a golden and miraculous bag, where he deposited any money offerings he received. He took 10 or 20,000 drachmas from it regularly, made a wad from it, and attached a piece of paper to it with the recipient's name. Many times when there was a great need or when a young person needed to go abroad for an operation, he gave them one, two, or even 5,000 drachmas. On several occasions, he took certain patients under his own care and sent them large sums of money regularly. His bag never emptied, as he himself affirmed. I give away five, they bring me back 50. I have never found the bag empty. Almsgiving was a joy for Father Yakovos, but even more, he felt grateful to the recipient. He gave a warm welcome to everyone he helped. If he happened to receive a small gift, a token of deep gratitude from the person he had helped, he talked about it and gave thanks time and again. In fact, the elder was grateful and thankful to just about everyone. You received his thanks just for visiting the monastery. If any clergyman or layman happened to bring groups of young people to the monastery, Father Yakovos gave them special thanks and treated them as his own benefactors. The presence of guests at the monastery gave glory to God and honored his saints, and for this Father Yakovos would do anything. It was the only consolation he received from the pilgrims. Even his great toil over the restoration and the expansion of the monastery buildings was mainly because he wanted to have a place where pilgrims could rest until it was time for services. Other than this, he wanted no luxuries. Not only his cell, but the entire monastery should be simple. In 1989, people suggested that he build a suitable place to welcome visitors. The monastery lacked one, and all guests from deacons to patriarchs, officers, and government ministers were received by the elder in a narrow, frugal room, which also served as the monastery's refectory. Another room upstairs with a few good chairs was not adequate either. Father Yakovos did not like the idea of a hall. When he was pressed about it, he spoke somewhat sternly, quote, Listen, I desire neither rooms, nor glory, nor buildings, nor honors. I only desire paradise. 
St. David, who spent his life in caves and deserts, did not have any of these. And what did he achieve? Through simplicity and humility, he gained paradise. Have you seen in any saint's biography that they built this or that meeting room or this or that building and won paradise because of it? No. It was because they made sacrifices. They prayed, fasted, slept on the ground. These kinds of things. They had virtues, and through these they achieved their goal. As for me, I only want a tiny place in paradise, just a corner there. That's all I want, end of quote. He could anyway, anyhow, always find money for the monastery if he wanted. The small bag was always there, always full. My poor people, he'd say, they come to me and I give them what I can and the bag never empties. I return only to find it full to the top. In order not to forget people, Father Yakovos, he kept a list of names, cases that he deemed help was necessary. Since the amount of money needed was very great, he gives hints to well-to-do visitors in general ways. Like, God doesn't provide all the money for our use alone. The amazing thing was that the most of the time the bag filled up without the elder having to put something in it himself. The elder, though, was not just seeing the bag fill up. He knew very well that for the bag to keep filling up automatically, he had to keep giving from it all the time. One time, he called for a monk and handed him a large sum of money for him to give to a patient who had undergone multiple operations abroad. The monk reminded the elder that it was just the other day that they had sent money to that patient and that it was rather early for additional assistance. The elder replied, What we've sent is already used up. I know well what I am telling you. The bag is full again. What shall I do with it? I give away five and they bring me back 50. See how he figured me out? His fame, of course, also reached those who were less sophisticated. He himself related very vividly in the local idiom what three old village women questioned him about since they had heard that he was so-called enlightened and could, quote, prophesy. Why don't you tell me, Papa, really now, how many children have I had, how many of them have died, and how many are still alive? The elder, of course, replied that only God knows these things. The second woman, rather disappointed, told the first one in front of the elder, My friend, maybe he's not the one who, who gets enlightened. The third woman went on and asked him, Me, Papa, what do you see in me? The elder replied with that fine humor of his, Well, let me tell you, you're a saint. We should take you and place you in a shrine right next to the bishop's throne so that people can venerate you. The old woman enthused, My friend, see how with me he figured me out? It was only natural for visitors at the monastery to tell Father Yakovos how good he was and similar things. He protested and insisted that he had offered nothing to Christ, that he was a wretch, a screwball, a good-for-nothing. To make fun of himself, he related a conversation that two old women once had at the church where he used to go and serve liturgy in the past. My friend, how come you all say that Yakovos is good? He's bad, not good. Really, the other day we saw him in the altar making coffee. You see, that's what kind Yakovos is. The women mistakenly took his boiling hot water for use in Holy Communion for making coffee. Quickly, Yerunda, go to London right now. The year 1986 passed with many miracles, but also with much fatigue for the elder. Many afflicted and seriously ill people found refuge in Father Yakovos's prayers. He kept a daily, quote, hotline, open with St. David and St. John the Russian. Not one day, not even an hour passed without him receiving a plea for someone in need of healing or consolation. He consoled and encouraged everyone, and many 
became well after he immediately dispatched one or both of the saints to help the patient, that is, to intercede with God, to heal the person. The source of healing power is definitely God, but people usually go to the saints, the members of the triumphant church who have been given the gift of boldness before God, who has bestowed upon them the privilege of petitioning him on behalf of the members of the militant church, and very often he answers. The blessed elder Yaakovos was well aware of this divinely established order. He knew that a saint of the church, that is a person having received the gift of boldness before God, was not just anyone who lived his earthly life in virtue and holiness or stood up for the Orthodox faith or even perhaps was given by God the gift to work miracles. It is God who judges and determines which ones will remain comforters for the church, even after they repose. Only after the church sees that a holy person continues to console with miracles and work signs even after his or her death, only then is she assured that God has proclaimed that holy person a saint, that he wants that person to serve as a saint on behalf of the faithful. To such a person, the faithful can and must address their petitions. Father Yaakovos placed the saints as mediators to God, and the miracles followed one after another. There is no point in writing down every miracle that God performed through his prayers. It must be mentioned, though, that in every single case, he resorted to intense prayer. He read a supplicatory canons, prayed with the prayer rope, and fasted more strictly. In this manner, several patients who suffered from cancer and other incurable diseases were cured. Those who lost items of great value found them. Disturbed families regained their peace. Possessed people were freed. Eminent car accidents and shipwrecks were avoided. It is impossible to make a list of each and every miracle, since such things occurred daily and the elder did not keep records. When asked by pilgrims to relate some miracles, he related one or more of the more recent ones. To be sure, he ascribed all miracles, every single one, to St. David, his co-worker and mediator before God. Several people who knew the elder well had the following experience. Following Father Yaakovos' advice, they asked St. David for help, and he appeared to them in the form of Father Yaakovos, either in a dream or in an apparition to console them. This happened many times to Greeks from Australia and America. We know this is true from letters addressed to the elder, as well as from rare references he made to them. This particular sign also happened to the elder himself. On several occasions, St. David appeared to him in the form of of the good monk Ephthymios, opening the monastery gate for him, and at other times. In fact, this peculiar sign kept occurring in the monastery even after Father Yaakovos' repose. From 1988 on, the pious monk Seraphim, who joined the monastery at an old age after his wife's death, continues to see St. David frequently, always in the form of Elder Yaakovos. The first such occurrence was when Father Seraphim was feeling tired and listless. He had prayed that St. David appeared to him to give him courage. He was sitting at the stairs in a church for a while and he saw Father Yaakovos pass in front of him solemnly. He got up to follow him, but his figure disappeared. At that time, Father Yaakovos was in his cell. On other occasions, while Father Seraphim was lighting the oil lamps, he saw the elder venerating the icons and went to receive his blessing, but the elder disappeared. The first time this happened, Father Seraphim inquired, received the reply, In answer to your prayer, St. David appeared to you, though in the form of Father Yaakovos. The blessed elder knew so well that God listens to St. David and felt such a familiarity with the saint that at times he turned quite demanding, even shockingly pushy. For instance, one evening he received a call from London, England. A family was about to break up. Perhaps it had already done so. Father Yakovos was greatly upset, as he deeply believed in the sanctity of marriage and family life. 
He lit the small candelia and knelt down to read, as always, not just one supplicatory canon, but several. Afterwards, he went down to the church to entreat St. David. He entered into the church, but didn't notice the young novice, who was mopping the floor. He went to the reliquary with St. David's holy head and stood before it. The novice monk heard him say, Hurry, elder, I beg you, go to London right now. It's an emergency. Don't delay. They're perishing. It's not right. The novice monk did not know what it was all about. He became frightened and stood there in a corner, speechless. Father Yakovos closed the reliquary and proceeded to leave, but he saw a shadow and spotted the novice. Are you here? Ah, my child. Old age. When man grows old, you see, he doesn't even know what he is saying. Don't pay any attention. Senile mumbling. Five years and eight days with a pacemaker. His heart had lost all strength. Heart seizures followed one after another. Many times he came very close to dying on the spot. He prayed for others and they became well, but his co-workers, St. David and St. John the Russian, did not help him in his own time of need. The elder knew about these things from Apostle Paul's case. He too had asked God to relieve his infirmity, but received the reply, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Likewise, Father Yaakovos wanted to stay in God's grace. It was enough for him. With God's grace, he didn't mind at all if his infirmities were to end only with the end of his life. To be sure, that was God's decision. Therefore, no one ever heard Father Yaakovos pleading with God to deliver him completely from his infirmities. On the other hand, in the lives of the saints that he read, he saw many cases where the saints healed others by entreating God while they themselves suffered immeasurably from one or more infirmity that eventually led to their death. Father Yaakovos followed on the same path as those holy persons. It was made clear to him that he had to have a peacemaker, a pacemaker. The elder did not want it. He pleaded with St. David, but received no reply. Maybe I didn't serve you right those 30 years after all, he said sadly. When the day came for the operation and he was about to depart for the hospital, the elder turned to St. David and said, Sit by yourself now and sing alone. He was taken to the General State Hospital in Athens. Dr. Krimastinos's group prepared him for the operation. He was given anesthetic, but it was not completely effective. So he experienced a lot of pain. At one point, Dr. Krimastinos asked him, Does it hurt, Yeron? Uh, it sure does. Then why don't you say so? Christ was also in pain on the cross, but he didn't utter a word. Not even at such a time as this did he stop thinking and living as an ascetic, who must suffer all things without complaint. Some people in the hospital offered to pay for the expenses of his operation, but he did not accept, since the matter had already been settled. Metropolitan George of Nikea, the Piraeus region, who was also undergoing treatment in the same hospital, was one of those who offered to help. I remember the elder telling me that this good bishop would not get well, and that's how it turned out, despite the doctor's hopes. After he recovered a little from the operation, he immediately left for the monastery. He was very enthused about making that trip, which turned out to be tormenting because of the pacemaker. He arrived at Prokopi at St. John the Russian's church. He went to the reliquary, knelt before it, and told the saint everything. He thanked him for all that he had suffered and asked him to plead with the Lord to forgive earthly Yaakovos, not even a thought about asking to be delivered from illness. Divine John, as he used to refer to the saint, responded by changing side. Other people also saw this and were frightened, but the elder calmed them down. Don't be scared, he's only changing sides. He continued on. 
The road from the village of Rovis onward is full of potholes, making car rides very jerky, especially dangerous for heart patients. The driver had to stop every so often for the elder to gather some strength for the remainder of that torturous ride. According to the doctors, the elder had to stay in peace and quiet with no disturbance, neither physical nor emotional. But the elder ignored all this so that he could get back to his paradise. Since November of 1986, everyone, including the elder, knew that the end was near. He could not possibly hold out much longer, given his other problems as well as that there was anything but helpful for his heart conditions. He also had very poor circulation in his legs. His feet were constantly blue. He maintained his strict fasting despite all the difficulties, and the winter only added to his problems. The monastery visitors kept increasing. Everyone wanted to see him, and most wanted to go to confession as well. Confession, a sacred task for a spiritual father, but also an exhausting one, continued to the early morning hours, one, two, or three in the morning. He never refused to hear anyone's confession. The monks of the monastery, by doctor's orders and out of love for the elder, tried to take him away from the people or somehow limit the number of people coming for confession. The good monk, Father Seraphim, assumed the role of chief policeman, followed by Father Hilarion and the other monks as well, everyone in his own way. The elder became angry and protested. They are hurt people, poor people in pain. You aren't a spiritual father and you don't understand. Manual labor was completely out of the question, but he was supposed to go for a walk regularly. However, with all the prayer and the confessions, he didn't even have time for that. My heart, my child, is a garden. My heart, my child, is a garden. He used to say to his monks and to the people he loved, it was sort of funny to hear such things from someone who could hardly walk or even breathe. Of course, he meant that his close contact with the saints and the divine energies made him feel like his heart is a garden. But it was also from his love of nature, from the orchards, the forests, the animals, and the little birds. As soon as the snow thawed in March of 1987, he took his first walk outdoors. Walking was good for his feet and heart, but he also needed some recreation. He had a view of the forest from the small window of his cell, but that was not enough. So he went down the stairs and passed by the church to venerate the icons. Then he went out from the south gate of the monastery, turned left, and went to St. Polycarp's chapel. He had built that chapel in memory of Lieutenant Colonel Polycarp Zoes, whom he had held as his benefactor. Indeed, all the years prior to his tonsure and after as well, he found help and support only from the Zoes couple. Further down from the chapel, there is a brook. Spring had set in. Everything was a delight to see and hear. The elder walked down the path, surrounded by the beauty of God's creation. A forest of pines and firs straight across, thick plane trees along the brook to the left. He continued westward, passed by the monastery's ironworks, and came to the ditch which started from the monastery's old cistern. The, quote, paradise was just across. Along the ditch, there was a weedy path with large and small trees on both sides, many of which were planted by the elder himself in the earlier years. A huge oak at first, then cypress trees, olive trees, small oaks, briars, mastic shrubs, home oaks, plane trees, laurels, accompanied by all sorts of other plants, each sprouting and budding in its own beautiful way. The elder moved on, elated. Nightingales contributed to the joy with their harmonious concert. The elder was moved. He lifted up his eyes to the plain trees and said out, of, out loud without realizing it, My beloved little birds, you also give glory to God. It's only us who don't glorify him. Halfway along the walk, the elder stopped to rest. The poor one could not even walk 200 meters. He sat on the ditch's bank, bent down his head toward his knees, and prepared himself. He was glorifying God together with the birds, but he gradually turned away from the nature around him and concentrated his mind, 
within his heart. A huge plane tree with a big hollow stood a few meters away to the left. The elder approached it, looked behind him, but didn't see anyone. He carefully grasped the trunk, got inside. He faced east, knelt down, and started his prayer. Gone were the flowers, gone were the trees and the little birds. He quickly got in touch with St. David, St. John the Russian, and St. Perskevi. He strove to keep them in his heart by praying their supplicatory canons, which he knew by heart. As time went on, he changed states. The Holy Spirit came and fluttered inside him. He went outside of time, outside of space. This, in fact, used to happen quite often, its effects being very difficult to explain, that exit. The elder used to take this walk in the past as well, stopping to pray by the tree hollow many times. This time, however, because of the pacemaker, the monks became worried and sent a brother to search for him. The monk followed the path, came to the tree hollow, went over to the new cistern and called for the elder, but he was nowhere to be found. Nevertheless, just when the elder had completed his prayer, he appeared in front of the astonished monk. This same thing also happened on many other occasions. The walk ended at the tree hollow. A little further down from that plain tree, the brook runs narrow and two large stones provide a foothold for crossing over. Another large cistern exists there, built by other monks in the past, and a forest of chestnut trees, plain and pine trees, begins. In his latter years, this walk was the elder's only recreation, his only so-called break. Several times, God offered him unspeakable divine visions and manifestations in that humble tree hollow. But bad weather, illness, and endless confessions prevented the Yeranda from taking that walk often, as he sometimes said complainingly himself, Ah, fathers, ten days now, and I have not been able to go out, even a little. In order to encourage the monks who worked out in the garden or elsewhere, he told them he envied that they worked outdoors, surrounded by the beauty of nature, while at the same time advising them to occupy their minds, their noose with noetic prayer. Up until the last month of his life, he kept company with the monks working in the garden, in the foul run, at the ironworks, and in the kitchen. When arriving at the garden, he sometimes attempted to grub around some plant. Ah, fathers, you work, and God will repay you, whereas I'm not worth my salt. Woe to you, the wretched Yakovos. If he saw a monk who seemed tired, he would take him aside, supposedly to sit down and talk with him. When the monk had relaxed, he would say, I'm all talk, my child. I had better go now and let you work. On several occasions, monks who happened to be passing by or looking out a window saw the elder pass at a distance from the place where the rest of the monks were working, pause for a moment, bless them in secret, and continue on his way. There is also a forest and a brook with much water north of the monastery, but since the main road to the monastery in the nearby village of Drymonas passed through there, one cannot find absolute quietude. There's no Hezekiah there for prayer. He casts out demons. Early on, from the time the demons physically attacked him to the point of leaving him senseless, he started receiving another gift, that of casting out demons from possessed people. It is an age-old terrible practice of Satan to enter into human beings and turn them into his obedient agents. During the 1980s, in particular, many possessed people were brought to the monastery for Father Yakovos to read exorcisms and make the sign of the Holy Cross over them with St. David's holy head. On September 13, 1987, a demon began harassing a 22-year-old young man. His condition worsened day by day. In October, his mother and brother brought him to the monastery and asked Father Yakovos to read exorcisms over him. Just before entering the church, the demon reacted. It began to swear, hurl obscenities, gesticulate, and utter threats. Inside the church, the reaction was even more wild. Father Yakovos opened the reliquary, took out St. David's holy head, 
and began to read exorcisms. At that time, the mother, who was standing behind watching, cried aloud, My God, what are my eyes seeing? May my child get well. After the exorcism was read, the young man was freed of the demon, calmed down. Upon exiting the church, his mother told a monk that what she saw when she cried out. She said she saw Father Yakovos raised about half a meter off the ground, trampling on a black dwarf that had horns and a tail. Besides the possessed, many mentally ill or so-called mentally ill people with different degrees of schizophrenia were also brought to the Holy Monastery. Most of the time, it is extremely difficult to distinguish whether the unfortunate person suffers from schizophrenia clinically or is indeed possessed by a demon. Father Yakovos had the gift of discernment and, depending on the case, would say, this one has to go to the doctor. The person was a psychotic or this one, my child, has a demon and needed an exorcism. Since the exorcisms were done in the presence of several people, many took notes of the words exchanged between Father Yakovos and the possessed. The demons speaking through the possessed swore badly, and on many occasions, since they were demons, revealed things that are beyond the realm of human knowledge. One possessed woman named Panayota greatly resisted going to Father Yakovos. She even threatened to go to him at night and put out his eyes to make him blind. The next morning, Father Yakovos asked her what her name was, and she re replied, Beliar. The elder said to Paniotti, You, Beliar, and your father are both liars. Your father's name is Beelzebub, isn't it? Yes, that's his name, and he beats me daily to cause harm. Right now, the elder commanded, I want you to come out of Paniotta. Okay, okay, here I go, puny, wretched old man. Away to the mountains. The elder went on, No, not to the mountains, but rather into somebody else. The woman complained persistently. The elder placed St. David's head over her. You're breaking my horns. I'm fighting you 65 years now, and I can't throw you into some sin that will lead you to hell. If it weren't for that elder, referring to St. David, I would have annihilated you by now. Then the demon changed tactics and shouted to the elder, You are a saint. Hey, you've got a saint right here and you don't realize it. But the elder immediately replied, You are saying this to tempt me, but in vain. I am only dust and ashes. I am humble. This humility of yours, you bastard, is burning me. Get lost, you wretch. Another possessed young woman was brought to the monastery by her parents, but she would not enter the church. When the elder brought out St. David's holy head to her, she cried out, Shut up, wretched old man. I don't want to hear you. May you die soon. I'm master of the universe, you know. Look at Athens. I hold it in my hand. I've accomplished everything I wanted. I've shorn the priests. I've been fighting your monastery for many years now, but the Great One is guarding you here. If only I could trap you once. Look at your feet. Your feet are rotten. Fall into despondency. Say that you are a saint, so I can take you to hell. I am not a saint, the elder replied. But the Lord said, Become holy. So I am doing what I can to obey this command. I am only an earthly human being. Billy Goat, what can I do to you? You're humble and have Christ inside you. Otherwise, I would have annihilated you. So many sicknesses and you still persist. Another possessed man revealed things and boasted, I have 8,000 sorcerers under my authority. The elder asked him how he enters into human beings, and he said, I enter like smoke into those who don't have faith. I enter just like that, like smoke. 
On another occasion, the elder had just finished reading exorcisms to a woman brought to the monastery by her husband. She seemed to have calmed down, and the elder extended his hand to her, but she said angrily, Can a demon ever touch the priest's hand by which he serves liturgy? Once two young brothers brought their possessed mother to the monastery. Initially, her behavior was calm and said mockingly, Puny Yakovos, Father Yakovos, you're a saint. The people honor you as a saint. Yerunda repeated in a raised voice, I am only an earthly, sinful man. After a while, she turned aggressive and tried to inflict wounds all over the elder's face with her nails. But he stopped her with St. David's holy head. Another possessed man trembled at the elder's prayers and cried out, Shut up, shut up, Yakovo, shut up, puny one. Like smoke I get into a man, like smoke I get out. I'm scared stiff of the cross. I flee from everyone who makes the sign of the cross. Wherever God's grace departs from, we enter. In every case, without exception, the Yerunda read the exorcism prayers with St. David's holy head with him. This also served as a safeguard for the people. No one could say that it was Elder Yakovos who expelled the demons, since he, was, he always pointed to St. David as the only cause. A very dramatic thing for anyone present was when the possessed person actually changed forms. Scared and despairing from Father Yakovos' prayers, they suddenly took the form of a wild black dog, or a fierce wolf, or a coniferous vulture. Other times, they barked and roared like wild beasts, terrifying everyone. Everyone who had been freed from Satan's possession returned to the monastery to give thanks and make a pilgrimage, but giving, or rather receiving thanks, is not always so simple. On one occasion, the elder he did not accept money for his bag from the mother of a child whom he had freed from a demon. The monks were bewildered, but the elder discerned that the expelled demon had entered into the money. Quote, I expelled the demon from your child. Do you now want to put it into me? He said to the woman. The gift of casting out demons from fellow human beings constitutes a triumph of great importance. It is an irrefutable proof that Satan's reign over the world, man and nature, is only temporary and can be overcome. Each case of a demon being expelled from someone who is possessed through the prayers of a holy person indicates on the one hand that Satan's dominion is being abolished and on the other reveals that the holy person experiences the kingdom and reign of heaven and ushers the power of that kingdom and reign into this world. Therefore, the kingdom of God both exists and can be realized daily, if only in part. Death was constantly near. From 1988 on, death constantly lurked around the corner. Every day of his life was threatened by embolism, thrombosis, and other health complications. He was fully aware of his situation, but he made no concessions. Prayer and confession remained the number one priority on his list. He reached a point even in his condition where he did not sleep at all the night before serving divine liturgy. Instead, he kept vigil, prayed. This is why in the morning he did not want anyone to talk to him. He still had the sweetness of ineffable experiences in his heart. Even when he did not serve liturgy, he often went to the church in silence without looking at or taking notice of anyone. He stood at the abbot's place, facing the icon of the Lord and of St. John the Forerunner, but his mind and heart were evidently wandering somewhere else, beholding something else. His face was not creased with expression, but shined, brighter and stronger than usual. Witnessing moments like these, no one dared to disturb him. Everyone was transfixed by his expression. When it was time to chant Axion Astin, he chanted it with his pure, divine voice, and on hearing how he expressed the hymn, one could say for certain that he was beholding 
the Theotokos, the mother of God, in front of him. Several other times during the Orthos service, he left his place, walked up to the icon of St. John the Forerunner, bowed before it, and then went to stand by St. David's reliquary. After making more bows, he reverently moved to the door. He was beholding St. David getting in and out and was going forth to greet him. He then went to the candle stand, supposedly to search the drawers for something or to light a candle, naively thinking this would stop the brothers from wondering, and then returned to his place. In 1990, he once said to a monk about such encounters that he experienced in church, quote, if I reveal what I see and what the saint tells me in here, many books would have to be written. These things cannot be written down. If I were to tell you, you would all leave. After liturgy, he had his cup of coffee. He blessed the monks for their assigned duties and returned to his cell. Sometimes he looked worried or wondered aloud or asked whether a specific person had arrived. The monks were puzzled because they weren't expecting anyone. Sure enough, that person did indeed show up, even if later than he expected. One day, a Supreme Court judge was on his way to the monastery and had not told the elder that he would be visiting. He was running late. Father Yakovos went down to the church and told a brother, Please, Father, go find our visitors. Perhaps something happened to them and they need help. Sure enough, they had encountered a hazard on the way, but St. David averted the evil and they arrived safely at the monastery. He also expected a priest to visit that same afternoon who needed his guidance about a particular problem. The elder waited for him at the monastery gate, and when the priest arrived, the elder told him how to resolve his problem without hearing him say what the problem was. The elder could even read the most secret thoughts of people, and he said to many of them, Do what you are thinking, or what you have in mind. Don't do it. Despite being confined to his cell and not being able to walk around easily, he still knew everything that was happening in the monastery. One day something happened that made the elder a little upset, and he said, What am I doing around here, Father? I see everything. Your idle curiosity, your telephone calls, your conversations with the pilgrims. I can see it all from my cell. His heart troubles were with him continuously, but he didn't mind. When someone asked him, Hey, how are you, Yaranda? He routinely replied, Fine, but sometimes added, Well, I feel some pain in the chest. I also perspire a lot, but it's nothing much, you know. All of us will eventually depart from this ephemeral world, from one illness or another. Then we will appear before the righteous judge in heaven. My problem is that I have done nothing for the Lord, and I will stand defenseless before him. Well, not exactly. Apparently God had a different opinion, as the gifts he bestowed upon the elder bear witness. Sometimes a divine fragrance would be emitted from him during confession. Several people experience this and have given testimony. When important people of the world visited the monastery, Father Yakovos, he said to the monks, See, see how many people St. David attracts to his monastery, how he is honored by the people? When he spoke to such visitors, Father Yakovos reproached himself. Do you know what I say to myself when people kneel in front of me for confession? Who are you, you uneducated, puny little Yakovos, who are nothing before such important persons, university professors, Supreme Court judges, court judges, who come and kneel before you? His self-reproach intensified when talking to clergymen who were his spiritual children. Ah, wretched Yakovos, you're only a screwball, and people take you for someone important. Rush to that monastery to give thanks. The miraculous healings brought about by the elder kept increasing. One woman who suffered for many years from an incurable disease was told by the elder at the end of her confession, Don't worry, my child. By tomorrow, everything will be okay. By morning, her illness had simply vanished. A young presbyter who had four children was healed in the same way. 
in another case a 13-year-old boy who had a tumor on his tongue. The other made the sign of the Holy Cross over him with St. David's holy head, and the boy was made well. Many childless couples were able to conceive after asking for the elders' prayers and visited the monastery afterwards with their babies to give thanks. The elder asked them also to pray and to keep up their spiritual struggle. The elder told a childless couple who were school teachers from Halkita to fast, pray a lot, and have extra liturgies celebrated on Saturdays. Next time, he said, you will come to visit our monastery with a baby. Sure enough, they did visit with their baby. Another couple was told by the elder, have that half-built chapel completed and you'll have a baby. They also had a baby. The miraculous help he gave to the suffering faithful and the divine signs were innumerable. People were often seen entering the monastery in tears or falling on their knees before Father Yakovos. This was how they expressed their deep gratitude for their healing. One day a man showed up at the monastery in a hospital gown. Everyone was perplexed, but the man appeared to be deeply moved. While waiting for Father Yakovos to come down, he explained, what happened to him, to a visiting priest. He had a serious problem with his leg. They said it would have to be cut off, cleaned inside, and then joined back together again. The patient went to the hospital to have his leg cut as planned. The doctor in charge asked to take a last look at his leg, and he was astonished. He could not believe his eyes. He remained speechless for some time, and then became angry with the patient because he thought he went to have the operation done somewhere else. He immediately asked the patient sternly, but also with wonder who had performed the operation. Bewildered, the patient replied, I haven't been to anyone else. I came here to have the operation done by you. The doctor took a second look, only to affirm that the operation had been performed, and moreover, that The excision and the joining appeared to be the work of a top surgeon of those days whose name he mentioned. The patient, a middle-aged man, was perplexed. The doctor asked him, Did you perhaps visit a holy monastery before coming here? Yes, the patient replied. Then don't wait another minute. Hurry up and take a taxi to that monastery to give thanks. So the man, still in his hospital gown, took a taxi and went to the monastery to thank Father Yakovus, who had prayed for him to get well without having to have an operation. Whenever the elder was bedridden in his cell from his heart condition or when he was away, Father Kirill, he read the prayers to patients and made the sign of the cross over them with St. David's holy head. An army officer was cured of lung cancer in this way in 1982. He was not even a candidate for surgery, an untreatable case of lung cancer. Father Kiros made the sign of the cross over him with St. David's holy head and the officer. He felt something coming out of him. He was cured of the lung cancer instantly. Lefteris won't die. In the beginning of 1989, Father Yakovos became very distressed that people he knew and loved had become ill. He received a phone call from Pokopi. Father John, the priest in charge of St. John the Russian's shrine, had just returned from America where he had undergone heart surgery. Against all odds, the difficult operation was successful. St. John had also been present there and directed the surgical efforts. The doctor in charge acknowledged that some power was indeed guiding his hand. Despite his ailments and the bad weather, Father Yakovos went to visit Father John at his home. Not only that, but when he arrived, he also asked his forgiveness. Pardon pardon me for troubling you. I had just visited Divine John's servant. Everyone present thought that an incorporeal, weightless angel had just entered into the home. His figure emitted a serene light. Father Yakovos asked to see where his veins had been removed. He then knelt, threw himself to the ground rather, and embraced the legs of the priest, who was shocked by this movement and this insistence. The blessed Father Yakovos, now in his latter years, 
still had great respect for priests, even greater now, in fact, than he did when he was a little child, when he thought that priests were indeed somehow angelic and had no material needs. Fifteen days later, bad news arrived from Halkida, a beloved spiritual child of his, left there, a theologian and a, a, a salty, a chanter, suffered from a terrible blood disease which developed into leukemia and septicemia. The doctors considered him hopeless and gave up on him. Some friends brought news of the sad situation in the monastery. Lathers is going to die yet on the... Father Yakovos left everyone and went to church. He prayed a supplicatory service intensely, returned, saying, Lathers won't die. He will survive. Actually, in two and a half months from now, he will come to the monastery and chant. Indeed, Lathers responded to treatment well and what the elder foretold had happened. His suffering was not over, however. His condition eventually worsened, and doctors indicated that his only chance for survival would be to have a bone marrow transplant. The operation was to take place at a special facility in Paris, France. Before leaving for Paris, some time after Pascha of 1990, the Fittus went to the monastery and discussed his situation with the elder in his cell. The elder was distressed. He fell on his knees before the crucifix and prayed for a long time. Lefteris could not hear what he was saying. Eventually the elder arose, relieved, and said in a steady voice, My child Lefteris, there will be no transplant. In a ringing voice he actually repeated this three times. Lefteris explained though that everything had been prepared and the donor was waiting. No, my child, I advise you not to go at all. But since doctors have been created also by God, go anyhow, but know that there will be no transplant. In Paris, they conducted new tests, but the results showed that his condition had changed. Since the previous findings were no longer valid, there was no longer any reason to proceed with the operation. Yesterday, my dear child, I saw I was in heaven. The elder was also made worthy to receive other kinds of gifts. He was given a small taste of paradise, of its beauty, and internal blessedness. This happened for the first time sometime around 1989. After reading St. Seraphim of Serov's life, he asked God to help him understand the meaning of the Lord's words, In my Father's house there are many mansions. God answered, as the elder later related to a spiritual child of his, speaking with ineffable joy. Yesterday, my dear child, I saw I was in heaven in a beautiful garden. There were violets of various colors and many other flowers. I was floating in the air above the ground. A monk in a rasso next to me showed me some fine houses and said, Go, Yakovos. But how could I? There was no path and I would harm those exquisite flowers. A second monk in Arasso said to me, Don't worry, this kind cannot be harmed. Go. So I walked forward, and indeed the flowers were not harmed. As he shared these things, kneeling down in his cell and with his hands crossed, the elder's voice was different, that pilgrim related. His face, with that unforgettable, gladsome smile, was completely serene his spirit rejoicing in the glorification of God. The elder was given many such experiences, especially at the end of his life. For the sake of experiencing more, he disdained every human pleasure and comfort, even the most natural and least harmful ones. Once out of gratitude, someone brought him a mat and placed it in front of the crucifix in his cell. The elder spent many hours making prostrations, and his knees did become sore, but as soon as the elder saw it, he was very upset, put it out of his cell, saying, I am a monk, 40 years without a mat. You want me to have one now? You'll become patriarch. He avoided all material pleasures and fervently sought spiritual joy instead. And God provided him with it through holy experiences during the night, but also through pilgrims. One of them was Metropolitan Bartholomew of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. 
On February 10, 1989, he visited the monastery and he served divine liturgy. The elder was particularly pleased and prophesied to him with certainty while Patriarch Demetrios was still in good health. You'll become Patriarch. You'll shepherd Christ's church. I pray that you visit St. David's monastery as Patriarch. The elder offered him an icon and also gave him a, a sprig of basil for Patriarch Demetrios with the request to pray for our monastery. Two years later, humble Demetrios reposed and a new patriarch needed to be elected. In October of 1991, the elder was informed by a visiting priest that the Turkish government was considering removing the names of the synodical metropolitans from the list of candidates. The elder went down to the church, prayed to St. David, went back to the priest and said, Father, I prayed to St. David. St. David, I told him, you have fulfilled all of my requests so far. Now, I don't know how, but just go to Turkey, meddle with the Turks and their papers, and see to it that Father Bartholomew is elected patriarch. When he learned sometime later that Bartholomew was indeed elected patriarch, he got up, shining with joy, made the sign of the cross, and repeated three times, Glory to you, O God. He sees the saints. In 1961, he rejoiced that St. Nectarios was declared holy. St. Nectarios of Agina was always comforting the ascetical elder in many ways. On November 9, 1989, St. Nectarios' feast day, the elder served liturgy in the chapel of the monastery dedicated to the saint. That morning, he knelt before the Lord's icon until the time of blessed is the kingdom. That liturgy was different for everyone present. They all experienced something glorious beholding Father Yaakovo celebrating the liturgy. Later, Father Yaakovos explained why, saying, Toward the end of the doxology, he was still on his knees in front of the Lord's icon. I saw my children allow me to say, Saint Nectarios. He was joyous and was chanting, Agisotheos, along with us. You understand now how I continued the service. In a similar way, the elder, he also used to see Saint David. One Sunday, as he chanted his his Megalinarion, he saw him in the form of a monk standing beside the crucifix and giving his blessing. The elder used to see saints quite often. Somehow this was his sustenance. Material food hardly mattered to him. He ate less and less of it, living like an angel. In fact, on one occasion, he was even seen in the form of an angel. A newly tonsured monk was outside the kitchen on a Christmas Eve. He looked over and toward the elder's cell and saw him walking toward St. Harlambos' chapel. The elder paused for a while before turning to the chapel door. At that point, his form he suddenly changed into that of an angel, shining brightly and brilliantly in glory. After a while, the elder descended the chapel stairs in a normal way. Physical Suffering and Dispassion He passed 1989 and 1990 in agony. His heart problems worsened, and going to Athens every three months for medical exams was an ordeal for him. While in the hospital, he received many visitors, exhausting for him, given his condition, but he just couldn't turn people away. From his bed, he listened to their afflictions, prayed for their healing, and even helped financially those who were in need. He kept an envelope under his pillow that held donations from visitors. Many people who went to thank him at the hospital had become well or had overcome some other difficulty through his prayers. The doctors did not know what course of action to take in his case. Nothing worked properly in his body. But the elder was alive nevertheless, surviving even in an adverse environment, in the cold, snow, and the humidity of the mountains of Evia. Dr. Kermastinos had to admit, the good God keeps the elder alive. His heart wasn't his only problem. There was hardly any circulation in his legs. They had become two black and blue foreign objects that he had to drag along. Despite his condition, the elder was not sad at all. In fact, he cautioned everyone about depression. 
He knew it was the most painful illness in the world at that time. St. David revealed this to the elder. Quote, the greatest illness of our time is depression. The elder's joyous disposition, despite living with terrible and incurable diseases, was a manifestation to all that he had conquered in the world and its depression. The elder used to say without theologizing, My heart is like a garden. Although only he, St. David, and God knew how he could feel this way. He had reached such a height of spiritual dispassion that he became distressed at the misfortunes of others, but not for his own. It is indicative that in the middle of harsh winter, when he especially suffered, he was overheard saying to a little bird, How sorry I feel for you being out in the cold. I at least have socks and blankets and heat too. If only I could gather all of you little birds in a room where you could stay warm and I would also feed you. But, you see, you're afraid of me. Later, when he saw the bird tucking its head under its wing, he said, But God has taken care of you too. He's given you feathers. Consoling with Miracles and Verses Father Yakovos had made an acquaintance with a priest he met from Sparta, Father Chrysostomos. On New Year's Eve 1990, Father Chrysostomos' little nephew, Kostaki, developed a horrible disease with a survival rate of 1 in 10,000, a hemorrhaging condition. His parents passed New Year's wailing sorrowfully. In such a state, Father Chrysostomos found them, who in tears turned to the elder. The elder likewise turned to St. David and said, Come down, old man. Go to Father Chrysostomos' nephew. Quick! and take St. John with you. Sometime later, the doctors performed their third examination of the child, and they were stunned. Little Kostaki was completely healed. And Father Chrysostomos was loved by the Yeronda, so much, in fact, that he became the reason for the elder to exhibit an unexpected talent. It is well known that the, time that the elder was able to write with elegance, as seen in many of his letters. That this elegance shows a level of sophistication beyond that of someone with an elementary school education is also beyond dispute. But the ability to easily compose verses for every occasion requires great talent, which under other circumstances could have made him a phenomenon. Whenever Father Chrysostomo left the monastery worried or distressed, the elder recited various verses to console him. Some of them were completely original, while others were based in part on what he had heard from his parents who used to sing in Levisi and later in Farakala as a way to relieve their suffering. Here are a few. Quote, My young son Chrysostomos went off behind the hill. May the trees shade his way, for he is my pride and joy, bishop's piece of blessed bread on a silver tray. All trees resemble each other, some brine in all oceans and bays. But one human being from another differs in vast many ways. Many are my afflictions, I find no rest. Tis like the snow on Mount Pelion's crest. Before fair weather can thaw it away, winter comes, more snow to lay. Quote. I searched for the same or similar verses in a compilation of Levisium poems, published in the past, but I could not find a direct correlation, which means that the elder could versify, if he wished, rather comfortably. Confined, but with abundant divine grace. The elder's health condition worsened throughout 1990. He could hardly move without some problem. He had to stay in his cell almost all the time. The worst part about it, for an ascetic like him, who in the past used to get only about two hours of rest a day, was that he had to lay down. He kept saying the Jesus prayer, of course, but he felt very uncomfortable. So as soon as he gathered a little strength, he got up, put on his epitrachili, knelt, and started to chant or read supplicatory canons. His prayer was simple. Holding the prayer up in his left hand, he leaned with his right elbow against the wooden cupboard, and with his head slightly inclined to the right, he prayed for endless hours. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. At times, the monk who attended to him heard him 
strained to say the prayer with extreme effort, as if his heart were being ripped out. Other times the prayer came out peacefully, unforced and comfortably. At such times the monk stood by the half-open door timidly and enjoyed looking at the elder. His eyes and forehead were serene and joyous, his rich white beard shining lustrously. The elder sensed the monk and said, Don't pay attention, my child. I made a simple request. The monk had actually come to tell the elder something. Various people called or went to the monastery in person to ask for Father Jacobus' prayers, and the monk notified the elder. For each particular case, cancer patients, childless couples, mentally ill, the seriously ill, people who had lost all hope, and others, the elder raised his hands high and said, Remember, O Lord, your servant, the one who is seriously sick in London. You know his name. The monk did not understand and one day dared to ask the, the elder, Yerinda, is that the way you pray? My child, it's not many words, but a pure and simple heart that God looks for. The number of requests he received for prayers were so many that it would have been practically impossible for the elder to devote enough time to each and every case, even if he tried. Out of the numerous letters he received concerning many different problems and illnesses, he replied and prayed personally for some while assigning the rest to St. David. Yeranda, you know what the people are asking for. You also know their names. Here, I have them all gathered for you. See that everything is taken care of. He only saw a limited number of people for a limited amount of time. After meeting with the elder spiritually advanced visitors, departed the monastery with a feeling that they were leaving behind some sort of paradise. That's how much of a delight it was to be in the elder's presence, even if only for a short time, and it was felt even in his absence. A heavenly fragrance. Newly tonsured monk Nicodemus lived under the elder's wing. Every monk must without a doubt put complete trust in his elder and be absolutely obedient to him. This was certainly the case with the monks of Elder Yakovos, but even the perfect can find encouragement and be consoled from specific signs. Monk Nicodemus was fortunate to experience a flurry of such signs over three consecutive days. It was a Sunday afternoon, June 17, 1990. As he was arranging food items in the storage room, the door unexpectedly opened and the elder appeared. The monk prostrated before the elder, and as he went to take his blessing, an ineffable fragrance filled the room. The monk turned around to try to see where it came from, but the elder disappeared. This was the first time monk Nicodemus experienced such a thing, and... It left him completely perplexed. In the evening of that same day, the elder approached the table shortly after the monks had sat down. At one point, Nicodemus smelled a strong fragrance that lasted quite a long time, and he spontaneously asks, Fathers, do you happen to smell a beautiful fragrance? Everyone looked at him perplexed and said, No. He unconsciously glanced at the elder and saw him lowering his eyes, as if he had done something blameworthy. The following day, Monday that is, they prayed compline as usual at the elder's cell. At the conclusion of the service, Nicodemus bowed in his turn to receive the elder's blessing. The elder's hand gave off a sweet fragrance. Nicodemus asked the other monks whether they had smelled something, but they had not. Upon this third occurrence, Nicodemus became alarmed that perhaps this was a satanic deception. He wanted to ask the elder about it, but didn't know how. The next morning, Nicodemus asked the elder's permission to take and wash for him a piece of oilcloth that the elder was using for putting his feet on when receiving treatment for his feet or when having an examination. The elder did not want to have it washed since it was clean, but since the monk insisted, he yielded. On his way to the monastery fountain, Nicodemus reflected, on this piece of oil cloth have rested my elders' sore feet that have suffered so much. Immediately, as he finished his thought, he was hit by a strong fragrance like a strong winter wind upon his face, though not cold. 
He was so moved this time that he was almost brought to tears. He went back to the elder's cell and revealed to him what he had been experiencing over the last three days. Is this from God, Yerunda? Yerunda, you're a saint. He did not quite finish his phrase since the elder stopped him and with his eyes lowered. He told him, Seriously, my child, for our part, we just make our sign of the cross. Whatever God wills, my child. Father, St. David is alive. Summer of 1990 passed with the usual sufferings. The monks had to be more strict with their policing to make sure the distance was kept between the elder and the people since they encircled him as soon as they caught sight of him. August arrived with the joy of the great feast of the Transfiguration of the Lord, a feast given special reverence to the monastery. Many people came for the feast, even more than on November 1st, St. David's feast day. Every time the elder saw people arriving at the monastery to worship the Lord or honor his saint, he was especially happy. Quite a crowd had already gathered by noon on August 5th, and even more people arrived in the afternoon. The elder came out of his cell, stood for a moment at the door, and looked at the crowd. There was nowhere to stand in the yard. Even the balconies were full. At that time, filled with joy, the elder exclaimed spontaneously, My beloved St. David, do come and give your blessing. Then he slowly came down and went to Vespers. The service was majestic with a procession and the Artoclesia service that followed. The Artoclesia took place outside in front of the church, and for the duration of the service, the elder's eyes were fixed on the balcony across from the church. He stood there as though enraptured, his, his face shone strangely. When the service was over and they went back into the church, and he was so moved that he cried out, Fathers, St. David is alive. He is present right now and is blessing the crowds. I feel like using a microphone to announce it so that everyone will know, but humility, I don't speak. However, a few seconds later, a greater surge of enthusiasm moved him, and he continued, If I speak, all those preachers and theologians out there will learn a lesson by someone uneducated. He was quick to clarify what he meant so that a young deacon who heard him would not be scandalized. I don't say these things out of egotism or conceit, but out of zeal because I experience St. David within. Whenever I call on him, he comes, as it happened just now on this very occasion. Upon seeing the crowd streaming into the monastery this afternoon, I said, Come, St. David, and give your blessing. He said, Come, and the saint did just that. What greater thing could our ascetic want? What more important experience could he have asked for in this fleeting life? As he always used to say to encourage and support people during difficult times in life, we are just passing through. Our time will surely come. Receive my soul and present it to Christ. Fall seceded summer and the elder's suffering increased more and more. God and St. David did not deliver him. They only provided him patience to endure. Was all this a play of irony? I mean, the blessed elder seeing the saints and helping others get well or finding solutions to their problems through his own prayers in fact while he himself never getting over his own terrible infirmities which at times brought him close to the point of death no it was not ironic of course god does not just heal everyone who asks to be healed whether he is asked directly or through the saints instead he heals only a few just for his name to be glorified and to strengthen people's faith. Although few may be healed, everyone receives consolation, and in the final tally, everyone has his problem solved. The, quote, problem I am referring to is none other than that which was addressed in the teachings and works of the Lord, the preaching of the apostles, and the theology of the Holy Fathers. The point is this, we are all passing through this life, the various illnesses and afflictions being a part of our schooling in the love of God and in becoming inheritors of his heavenly kingdom. Having fallen from paradise, where he was initially placed by God, man inevitably suffers in one way or another. But 
by striving in this life to be victorious over tribulations and by being instructed in the church, he works his way back to paradise again. This is what happened with Father Yakovos. He was not delivered from his physical infirmities, yet his problem was solved in the church through her saints. This is why he did not worry about whether this or that, that might happen to him as is evident throughout his afflicted saintly life, and in particular through incidents such, such as the following. On the night of September 23, 1990, he suffered a terrible heart seizure, arrhythmia accompanied by excruciating chest constrictions. He could hardly breathe and his condition was dire. He felt that his lungs had collapsed. The brothers were at a loss to help medically, but helped as they could by running to the chapel of St. Harlambos to pray. They also called Dr. H. Kotas. During this time, the elder became numb all over, and his breathing sounded like the death rattle. Somehow, he acquired a little strength and said, I will die tonight. Bring me the holy head and place it over here, over the heart. I can't breathe. It's, it's my last night. Theodore, his niece's husband, who happened to be present, placed St. David's holy head on his chest, and the elder whispered intermittently and with great difficulty, My beloved St. David, I have been serving you forty years now. I came to the monastery when I was thirty, and I have turned seventy here. My beloved St. David, you know how much I have loved you. Whatever I suffered, the illnesses and everything else, I suffered for the sake of your love. Help me, my beloved saint. But if my time has come, well, I have passed seventy whole years on the earth. I only want you to receive my soul, and in your boldness before God, lead it to Christ. I want you to appear before God's throne and tell him, This, Yaakovos, here, this sinner, I beg you to forgive him. Because all these 40 years in the monastery, well, I'm only human and uneducated. I tried to do whatever you enlightened me to. St. David helped his servant, and after about 15 minutes, he found a little respite. The doctor arrived at 1 o'clock in the morning, and the elder was taken to the General State Hospital in Athens. He was placed in intensive care. The doctors had to try hard. He was in an awful condition. During his 15-day stay at the hospital, he suffered one more heart attack, which was followed by lung inflammation. Surviving this was nothing short of a miracle. Miraculously, he related, I got well and came back. Thank you, St. David, but please forgive all my sins and I will live the rest of my life in prayer and patience. The miracles of St. David are innumerable. Many books have to be written. There's neither enough paper nor enough ink. During his stay at the hospital, they kept the elder in the intensive care unit to prevent him from having numerous visits. On the ninth day, however, he had to leave the unit because Mr. Andreas Panadreo, Prime Minister of Greece for several terms, and at that time leader of the opposition, he needed it. Someone consoled Mr. Papadreou. You will be okay. A holy man was on this bed before you. The elder readily accepted to give his blessing to the VIP patient and to make the sign of the cross over him. He was brought into the intensive care room in a wheelchair by his niece's husband. The patient, flanked by two bodyguards, was laying on the bed with an oxygen mask and plug sensors on his body. Icons of the Lord and of the Theotokos were hanging on the wall. The elder entered slowly, gave his blessing, and said, My child, you're being guarded well here. They thought that the elder was annoyed by the presence of his bodyguards, but the elder said, My child, you've got Christ and the Theotokos guarding you in here. He approached the patient, made the sign of the cross over him, and said, Mr. Andreas, you will be fine, don't worry. You will get well. Before you, I was on that bed. In three days, you'll be back home. You will get well so that you may do good for the country. The patient tried to move. Someone helped him take off his oxygen mask. He kissed the elder's right hand and whispered, 
thank you, and also shed a tear. On his way out, the elder assured him, I will do a supplicatory service to the saint I serve, and you will be okay in three days, as I told you. Sure enough, after three or four days, Mr. Papadriou became well and was able to leave. After leaving the hospital, the elder stayed at his niece's house for a few days. Even there, he was surrounded. Many people came to see him, some to be counseled, some to receive his blessing, and others just to see his face. In mid-October, his niece's husband drove him back to the monastery. The elder was so happy to be returning to his paradise. Throughout the trip, he jested, he chanted, and even recited verses to amuse the driver who was driving slowly to keep the jolts to a minimum. When they came to the beautiful Kyreus River Valley in Evia, the elder sung a verse. Rain or drought, Kyreus Creek never runs out. With great difficulty, but also with great joy, he celebrated St. David's feast day on November 1st. On that same day, he worked a miracle. A man who suffered from a valve stricture asked the elder's blessing that day. The elder placed St. David's holy head over the man's heart and foretold him, My child, as the doctors will tell you, you will need an operation. Don't worry, you will be okay. Look at me, I'm living proof. I've had quite a few so far. Indeed, the man did need to have the operation and had to go to London for it. The operation was successful, but after three days, he had pain and a fever. His wife prayed fervently to St. David. That night, she saw the elder in her sleep standing beside her husband's bed with the holy head of St. David. In the morning, the patient was completely well. Upon returning to Greece, they went to the monastery to thank St. David, but before they had a chance to tell the elder what had happened, he greeted them with these words. Do you see now, my child, how St. David did not ignore you? He went to London with you. He was with you in the operating room and was even at your bedside. Before November passed, he also cured someone who, after having kidney surgery, developed an abdominal abscess. The elder read a prayer over him, made the sign of the cross with St. David's holy head, anointed him with oil from St. John the Russian's oil lamp, and said, The grace of God through his saints will help you. The abscess unexplainably turned outward and healed. Despite strong recommendations from the doctors, the patient did not have an operation for it. Through the elder's prayers, he became completely well. That November, the elder turned 70. Physically, he was a complete wreck. Only the bones of his shoulders remained upright, which seemed to be the only support for his light, creaseless rasso. The only part untouched by affliction was his face. It remained clear, radiant, saintly, with an imposing goodness and childlike bashfulness, but above all graced with a reserved smile, angelic and innocent. You couldn't help but notice that smile. Once you did, you felt like you'd give anything to see it again. It was no coincidence. That smile emanated like a beam of light from an effulgent source. The elder's heart and mind, his noose, overflowed with love for Christ and with the joy that Christ bestows. This explains why anyone familiar with at least the basics of the spiritual life could not have enough of the blessed elder and couldn't take his eyes off him. Don't interfere with my asceticism. He passed the winter of 1990-91 to 91 with more suffering all the more aggravated by the cold and humidity on the mountain. The elder had to remain in his cell almost all the time. He could not even go out for the common meal. Whenever he did go out, he had to return shortly thereafter. With his legs and heart in such a condition, he could not endure being out for long. Every so often he was choked by chest constrictions. He also suffered crises day and night, which he overcame with God's help. But it became more and more difficult. He was under medication at that time, which had to be taken with food in order not to harm his stomach. But the elder strongly objected. It ended up damaging his stomach. It bothered him at the slightest irritation. The monks saw everything, but there was nothing they could do. 
The doctors had strongly advised that he should not tire himself out, not hear confessions, not serve divine liturgies, and that he should eat well. For the elder to leave his holy work or reduce his fasting was simply unthinkable for him. He even followed a strict fast during Great Lent that year, which, together with his stomach pain, exhausted him completely. On Holy Monday, the monks took a risk. They brought to him, as he was not able to leave his cell, some bean soup with two drops of olive oil. The elder realized it and became very distressed. He did not eat at all and protested, Please don't interfere with my asceticism. In the days that followed, he ate absolutely nothing. Only on Holy Thursday after liturgy did he have something to eat. He celebrated the Lord's Pascha, the resurrection, with an indescribable internal splendor. He had sweet spiritual experiences that were evident on his gladsome face that radiated heavenly joy, triumphant victory, and deep peace. That face was a mirror of paradise. The coexistence of divine spiritual experience and bodily sufferings continued to the end of the elder's life. There was, in fact, a close competition between the two. The more divine experiences and the more people were healed through his prayers and so on, the more heart crises and temptations. During the night, the elder had more time for mental prayer, at times kneeling and supporting his right elbow against the cupboard, at other times when absolutely necessary while on his bed, getting up at times to kneel in front of the crucifix. With his stole on, he recited silently, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There is no record of him ever speaking about his mental prayer, giving any information or clarification. Perhaps no one pressed him to speak about it, about what happens to those who practice it and what joy those advance in the spiritual life experience. However, even if he did not express it with words, his face spoke volumes. The monks saw the results of the prayer manifest on his face. The tears, the light shed over his face and his beard revealed that most blessed state, the transformation of the noetic prayer into the prayer of the heart. Everyone, more or less, practices some form of internal prayer, but the prayer of the heart is achieved only by those few who labor beyond what is expected. It is these few who enjoy the divine experiences that are born in the region of the heart and overflow throughout their whole being. Before the Lord's judgment seat, things did not improve in the summer. How could they anyhow, with a weakened heart and no circulation in the legs? Nevertheless, he kept on hearing confessions, listening to people and giving counsel and praying for everyone who suffered. He even replied to letters more than ten a day. If he was not able to pray himself from being extremely faint, he turned to St. David, saying, Here are the problems of the people, Yerunda. You know what each letter is about. Don't leave them. Do whatever you can. You're their only hope. By the end of his final summer, something very significant happened to him. Whether it was in a dream or in a vision, he did not indicate. He related that he was in heaven before a majestic king who was sitting on a glorious throne. A little lower beside him stood a secretary holding a large book. He turned to every page in which some good deed of priest monk Yakovos had been recorded. At one point the secretary said, Nothing more about Father Yakovos. Then the king on the throne of glory said, Are you sure? I think there is one more. Turn to page 365. The secretary turned to that page and found out about the small box. The blessed elder thought about what he saw and recalled that while he was still living in Farakla, at the end of the war, he came across a small metal box for military flares, perhaps, and it, it impressed him. It was a very good quality box, but without further thought, he took it right to the church. He wholeheartedly offered it to the priests since they did not have a proper container for incense.
I will depart like a little bird. Fall arrived with one heart crisis after another. Whether he liked it or not, he was taken to the General State Hospital in Athens toward the end of September and was placed in the intensive care unit once more. The doctors did everything they could still do, checked his organs, readjust his pacemaker, strengthen his irreversibly exhausted organism. But there really wasn't much to hope for. The doctor was clear. Nothing really functions. Thrombosis is eminent. Only divine power keeps the elder alive. It just so happened that the intensive care unit was needed once again by Mr. A. Panandrew. The elder was again asked to bless the patient, but since he was in the middle of a fatigue test, he gave his blessing from outside the room. Never mind, he said, I'll make the sign of the cross from out here so he can go home. Indeed, the patient went home. When the elder left the hospital, he stayed over at his niece's house for a few days. On his final day, he was asked to serve the blessing of the water service slowly. They all got up at four o'clock in the morning. The elder looked more angelic than at other times, and an ineffable fragrance filled the room. Everyone's eyes were filled with tears. Upon arriving at the monastery in the beginning of October, the elder got an infection that turned into pneumonia. It was life-threatening. Dr. Koras, who visited the elder on a regular basis and had great reverence for him, begged him to go back to the hospital. But the elder would not yield. I will do anything for you, my child, but this. Don't send me back to the hospital. In fact, he already had an appointment for an exam scheduled on December 4th, but he said, I won't go back. I won't make it until then anyhow. Indeed, he did not. On several other occasions, he foretold his passing away. Those who visited the elder in October or November, saying that they would return in December or for the Feast of the Nativity of Our Lord, received the firm reply, that will be too late. He told a priest from Larissa, you may come, but I won't be around. He told one of his spiritual children three or four days prior, one of these days I will pass away, and do you know how I will go? Hey, look, like that, like a little bird. And he blew over his palm to demonstrate how easily he would deliver his spirit. They take me for a fool and a lunatic. Throughout October, he suffered immensely. His face turned pale and he looked like a corpse. He was strictly forbidden to do any kind of work, certainly no confessions, nor attending church services. But as soon as he gathered a little strength, he did hear confessions and he did attend church services. He was also praying, his primary work, especially when people asked him to. The miraculous healings had reached high numbers and crowds of people were streaming to the monastery. However, there were also ill-wishers among the devout who went after the elder. The elder was well aware and grieved over it. One day he allowed himself to say, Father, they take me for a fool and lunatic. After I pass away, they will know who Yakovos really was. I don't say these things out of egotism or conceit, but for the glory of God. Although he constantly asked for God's mercy and declared time and again, I have done nothing for Christ. Toward the end of his life, he allowed himself on a couple of occasions to talk about the gifts God had given him. Quote, I have acquired obedience and humility. Why not confess it, since it is God who gave them to me? End quote to make sure that he forgot everything that he did, that he heard during confession, he prayed, My God, you've given me many gifts. I entreat you, grant me one more, that of forgetting everything I hear during confession. Father Kirill overheard him say to himself sometime between October 10th and 15th, Lots of people will come to my funeral, quite a crowd, and if I move to bless them, in fact, at his funeral, when his casket was elevated for the people to see, some said they saw the elder standing up and blessing everyone. In these last days of his, he had an anxious feeling that he might pass away before seeing the local bishop. 
metropolitan Chrysostom of Halkida, whom he had not seen for a while. He did eventually go to see him and with deep joy asked for his blessing. The blessed elder had the true and genuine ecclesiastical ethos. He had a deep awareness that the office of bishop is holy and he respected every bishop. He's a bishop, he used to say. He never ceases to be a hierarch. He used the word hierarch often and just by the way he pronounced it, it revealed his deep respect for the office. That's why he was opposed to and condemned all internal ecclesiastical disorders. Concelebrating with saints and angels. In November, the last month of his life, the elder had a good disposition. He was given some respite. That is to say, there were several moments when he did not feel unbearably bad. He was also happy at that time to hear the news that Metropolitan Bartholomew was elected Patriarch of Constantinople. The elder had requested this from St. David. A priest who knew Father Yakovos and who was about to go to Constantinople to attend the enthronement passed by the monastery to see the elder. The elder received him with particular cheerfulness, saying, Will the Patriarch misunderstand if I send him a small gift? He wanted to send him a little money for him to treat the other synodal bishops to a suite or something on the occasion of his election. The patriarch was, in fact, moved by the small gift and repeated the elder's characteristic phrase, pardon me while making a bow. By the end of the first week of November, his respite was over. From then on, every moment was martyrdom. Despite his bodily suffering, he strove to keep vigilant and pray Prayer, unceasing prayer of the heart, was the only thing he asked from God. God might well have allowed all those diseases to afflict the elder, but he also bestowed upon him abundant strength to pray. The elder prayed with fervor, living the joy of the resurrection, experiencing it deeply. Many times he shed tears from joy and gratefulness to God. The monks who passed by his cell at night or in the morning on their way to services they saw him shedding abundant tears, though his overall expression was that of gladness. A young monk was alarmed the first time he saw the elder in this condition, and he asked him, Yerunda, are you okay? Are you in pain? And what could the god-seer answer? How could he explain to the young shoot of the angelic life the gifts God had given him? No, my child, it's just that I was concelebrating together with saints and angels in sanctuaries that human words cannot describe. He could not offer theological explanations, but his very manner demonstrated his direct living contact with God. He never entertained any thoughts about preaching, but he was a living sermon. Anyone who could see spiritually and had an attentive heart could see in him a manifestation of God's presence and divine energies on earth. His words and his counsels were simple and practical, no analyses or elaborations. They were short phrases, often elliptic, even incomplete. But to anyone who got to know him, it was soon apparent that words were, in fact, superfluous. It was enough for one to gaze at the elder for his soul to benefit. Indeed, it was a rare, holy pleasure, a blessing from God. Not that his words were in any way deficient. On the contrary, they possessed divine power and were able to penetrate the hearts of his listeners, providing comfort and illumination. It was quite natural that everyone thirsted to hear every word he said. The grace that filled the elder's soul flowed out as life-giving words that nourish human souls. Ultimately, a word has no power to benefit in itself. It depends on who utters it. As with the words of the Holy Gospel, they had great power precisely because they were spoken by the divine mouth of the Lord. The blessed elder seemed to be aware of this. At times he insisted and gave commands like someone having authority, spiritual authority that is. At the same time, as previously mentioned, he did not think that he was offering any special teaching, only practical advice and words of consolation. 
Additional wisdom is to be found in his words. His, quote, teaching was the recounting of miracles and signs performed, as he said, by St. David and St. John the Russian. Certainly nothing like a lecture. Only after describing how some people had come to change their ways, how some became well through prayer, how the demon possessed were liberated by God's grace working through St. David's holy head, and so forth. Did he offer some special advice according to each case? The last day of his life. On the night of November 20th, 1991, toward the morning of November 21st, the time came for all of his sufferings and this life to end. The blessed elder was well aware of this. It was time for corruption to be replaced by incorruption in the eternal world where blessedness and glory is reserved for those who loved the Lord with all their heart and soul and who suffered for his name's sake. Blessed Elder Yaakovos kept vigil that night. Even at this time, he did not forget those who were suffering. He read the last of his letters and replied to about 15 of them. In the morning, he celebrated the feast of the entrance of the Theotokos into the temple. He prepared himself with prayer and fasting, Of course, he was ordered not to stay up, but he wanted to serve liturgy so much that nothing could prevent him. The service started before dawn. He walked to the church with great effort. Some monks noticed a different look on his face, brimming with gladness and love, smiling angelically. He knelt throughout the service and was able to chant comfortably, and with a glory befitting Pascha, as if he were not sick at all. His heavenly voice filled the church like a choir of angelic hosts. It was evident that this was no ordinary liturgy, although he didn't speak about it. At nine o'clock in the morning after the service had concluded, he went to the kitchen joyfully and had a cup of coffee. People were waiting to go to confession. He got up, walked slowly out of the main gate of the monastery, and headed towards St. Harlambos' chapel, where he usually heard confessions. At ten o'clock, He confessed Herodeacon Gennadios from Marathos. With joy and in all seriousness, he told him, Good that you came. I want you to be present at my funeral. The deacon tried to play down his words, but the elder insisted. He left the church and walked around the monastery with the deacon. He looked everywhere and at every monk, blessing them peacefully, transmitting to them some of the joy that was springing from his angelic face. After making the rounds inside the monastery, he also wanted to walk outside. They exited from the southern gate. He slowly went up to the workshop and blessed the monks who were working there. He continued on, stopping at the little chapels on his way and crossing himself many times. With the help of the deacon, he made it to a place where the whole monastery could be viewed, as if from an airplane. It looked beautiful, orderly, and well taken care of. What a difference from the wreck he had found it in, renovated and full of monks. He could not have enough of taking it all in. There was so much love for this monastery in his eyes. He remained there for a while, looking at it with joy and giving glory to God. His feet could not hold him for too long. Around noon he went back. Being very tired, he rested for a while in his cell. A newly ordained priest went to see him. He had to do a funeral service, but he did not know the exact order in the hymns. The blessed elder patiently explained everything to him. He also chanted him several of the funeral hymns beautifully, becoming increasingly joyous. When the priest said that he had learned the service, the elder insisted that they chant it all over again. His joy was evident. At two o'clock, the priest left and the elder remained alone. At a quarter past three, he was brought a cup of coffee and was told that a spiritual daughter of his was waiting to see him. Although he seldom received visitors in his cell, he said, Bring her here. The child is in need. I have to see her. He put on his epitrachele on his stool, heard her confession, advised her, and encouraged her. Suddenly, at one point, he said to her, Look, my child, it's St. David and St. Yaakovos, the Lord's brother, chant their dismissal hymns. At the same time, the elder started getting somewhat anxious. 
He wanted to see his disciple Hilarion, who had been ordained hero deacon that morning by Bishop Chrysostomos of Halkis. Although no noise could be heard, he said to his spiritual daughter, My child, open the door, the fathers are here. Indeed, the monks were just arriving, and she went to open the door. He attempted to stand up, but immediately started to collapse, uttering, I feel dizzy, feel dizzy. The young woman could not catch him, and he fell to the floor. He was not hurt, but he was breathing with great difficulty. At that point, the fathers arrived. Confusion, fear, cries. Father Kirill fell on his knees behind, behind, beside him and rubbed his hands. Other monks ran to St. Harlambos' chaplain and began to pray in tears. Another monk ran to call a doctor. The pulse of the blessed elder became extremely weak. His face turned reddish, serene, without any agony. His venerable lips gave out a light puff, and that was it. He gave up his spirit like a little bird. At a quarter past four, the blessed elder left this corruptible world of pain for that of the blessed mansions of the triune God. The monks did not want to believe that the elder was gone. They had tried hard to offer him any kind of help amidst much confusion and tears, but everything was over. The funeral. They prepared his holy body for burial right where it was laying. Also present was Hero Deacon Gennadios, whom the elder had asked that morning to be present. The ascetic, who throughout his life was constantly on his feet, praying, serving, throughout his whole life, serving liturgies, working, fighting against the demons, now lay motionless and breathless. His hands, which were continuously giving blessings and alms, were now resting still on his chest. Everyone was weeping for the holy man, yet deep in the hearts of the fathers the comfort which the saints bestow was to be found, not just from knowing that their elder was a holy man, but because they could actually see it now on his holy face. The initial reddish hue disappeared quickly, giving way to a comforting, pale yellow, saintly look. To be sure, no one can describe the wondrous look of a holy man, but everyone there saw it, and that's what counts. His color remained unchanged even to the next day when the funeral took place. Many hours passed, but the holy face of the blessed elder inexplicably retained its brightness. Everyone perceived that he was in some glorious state. Only a couple of calls were made to the outside world. They could be counted on one's fingers, yet each one of those calls generated hundreds and thousands of other phone calls. In a short time, the news about the elder spread like an enormous blaze and wounded thousands of hearts. Everyone conveyed the news to many others. It was a personal invitation. It was as if the elder himself was ringing the bell to call his own people. It was evening, and everyone had to go to work the next morning, not to mention that the monastery was far away out in the mountains, but the shock was great. No matter where people happened to be when they heard the news, even in the middle of the street, they either burst into tears, fell on their knees, or sought something to hold themselves up with. And once the bell had been rung by the elder, an endless number of people went to his holy body. They had to be there, no matter what. They left Jobs, children, and the elderly behind and headed to Evia, driving up and down the mountains to get to the monastery of their elder. Some even arrived that same night and prayed with the monks. On the following morning, all roads leading to the monastery were filled with cars. The police had to be brought in to keep things in order. Eventually, the roads were jammed. Thousands of people left their cars and walked several kilometers on foot to reach the holy monastery, and they all made it. The large yard of the monastery was packed. Balconies were in danger of collapsing. Thousands remained outside, around the monastery. Bishops, priests, and monks filled the church, leaving no room for laymen. Inside and outside the church, there was a great lamentation. Streams of tears were flowing, people sobbing here and there. But in the midst of 
all the grieving, the pale yellow saintly face of the blessed elder offered comfort. You couldn't stop looking at that bright, holy face. The blessed one had more life than the living. He looked all the more joyous and had the beauty of an angel. God, who bestowed on him the gift of this bright, holy look, gave him one more gift. He broke the natural law of rigor mortis for the elder. His saintly hands kept their natural flexibility and temperature. Everyone who venerated them devoutly realized this. In addition, something amazing happened with Bishop Procopius of Cephalonia. The bishop who had been confessed by the elder wanted so much to receive the elder's blessing that he took the elder's right hand and in tears joined the first three fingers together and raised it to his forehead so as to receive the elder's blessing. He placed the hand back on the elder's chest with the two fingers joined together in the form of the blessing gesture. He who had an infinite amount of love for his fellow man had overcome the laws of nature. After many thousands of people passed through to venerate the elder and bid him farewell, a long funeral service commenced. In order for everyone to be able to see the holy body of the saintly man, the casket was placed outside the church. While the hymns were chanted, some of the faithful, not everyone, they saw the elder moving over the crowds in the air and blessing them. Beholding the holy body and hearing the hymns made the people more fully realize how great losing the elder was for them. Even the cold-blooded were carried away with emotion. No one could contain himself. With heavy hearts and with eyes flowing with tears, everyone tried to move closer to the holy body to take one last look at the elder. Two priests, Father Demetrios and Father Paul, spoke very beautifully about the blessed elder, Father Yakovo Salikis. Their words touched everyone's hearts. And then came the great moment. The Bishop of Cephalonia suggested that the casket be elevated higher so that all the faithful could see the Holy Elder. As soon as the casket was elevated and the crowd saw the Holy Body, a deafening cry surged out from countless hearts. Their mouths opened, filling the air with the proclamation, Saint! Saint! While the heavens bent down to receive the unified thunderous testimony. There was no longer a cry of wailing or lamentation for the holy man who had fallen asleep, but a cry of victory, a shout of glory. Everyone shouted, Agios, Agios, Saint, Saint, and it was as if they were saying, The Lord our God is alive and always provides us with his holy people. He lives on. The tomb of St. Yakovo Salikis of Evia is on the southern side of the monastery church. It rests between the church where he served liturgy innumerable times and was made worthy to see many divine signs, and his cell where he labored ascetically beyond what is human. The uneducated and greatly afflicted Yakovos found rest in the bosom of God the Father, but he did not abandon the people, nor did the people abandon him. He watches over the life of the monastery and supports the brotherhood. He concelebrates with them in the divine liturgies. Through visions, through apparitions, he supports and guides them in any problem they have. By way of a vision in which he was seen carrying the abbot's cross to Father Kirill, he indicated his successor. He even indicated his second successor. Everything in the monastery carries on under his guidance. Although pilgrims never ceased streaming to the monastery, they do so much more now after his falling asleep. Everyone has come to realize the divine gifts he possessed, and everyone is convinced about his boldness before God and his saints. Moreover, everyone knows well, either from personal experience or from the accounts of others, that the Blessed Elder continues to have the same boldness especially since his departure. He works more miracles now than when he was on the earth. His appearances are countless. Many call upon him, and the elder is quick to help. The sick are healed, and many 
who have spiritual or material problems find help. He comforts everyone. The decisive criterion for the sainthood of a holy person are the divine signs that are worked following one's repose. In order to avoid any misinterpretation at this point, we will mention here only two such miracles, letting the church in due time calmly and wisely ascertain the great gifts God bestowed or will bestow upon the blessed elder. On the night of April 4th, 1992, the priest in charge of St. John the Russian's shrines saw the blessed elder in a vision. The elder asked that St. John's reliquary be brought to him so that he could venerate it. When it was brought to him, he venerated it with joy and prayed with divine words that filled the hearts of everyone with joy. After a while, the elder thanked him and said, Take the saint back. At that point, the priest and all who were standing there approached to venerate the reliquary before taking it back. But to their amazement, they saw Father Yakovos in it, not St. John. That same morning, the author had gone to the elder's village without notice to gather some more information about the elder. An abbot of a monastery in Manathos, who was wondering whether the elder was a saint or not, saw in a theoria a vision that he was bowing before fragrant relics that were those of Father Yakovos. I mean...